Have you ever wondered how much pain you could endure? It's not such a merry subject to muse upon, but you can be sure, whatever kinds of physical distress you have imagined, someone somewhere on the planet at one point in time had to suffer it. When imagining such gruesome scenarios, we often invoke methods of torture, the grim fiction of Hollywood films depicting ad hoc tooth extraction or the fingernails being ripped from their rightful place. We might also cast our minds back to ancient and medieval history when humans were burnt at the stake, had their limbs ripped off, or their hearts ripped out. Today we will focus not so much on those macabre aspects of human nature, but but on pains any one of us could suffer today. Join us on this excruciating tour of how much we can hurt in this episode of the Infographic Show, the most painful things a human can experience. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. <laughs> First of all, we should talk a little about pain itself. We all deal with it differently, while some studies show men seem to tolerate it better. For a long time it was thought to be the opposite, as women's bodies and minds are equipped to deal with childbirth. The outcome of the studies was also said to be the result of men tolerating more pain because of prescribed social notions of masculinity and not necessarily having a natural endowment to tolerate more pain. How do we even find subjects to test pain limits so we can quantify pain? Subjects at Cornell University did just that in the 1940s in what was called Studies on Pain, a new method for measuring pain threshold. Childbirth was measured against burning, with a pregnant woman being burned as she was giving birth. Tech Media Gizmodo writes, As the heat blistered her hand, the subject helped establish a value of pain intensity encumbered during childbirth. The problem was, in other studies on pain, people just couldn't take the level of pain further and so it couldn't be measured. There have been various scales to measure pain, but none are conclusive. For instance, some people might pass out quicker than others due to excessive pain. This happens when the stress on the body affects the blood flow to the brain. You pass out, and your body gives you a well-deserved break. While you are out, your brain starts releasing serotonin and endorphins so you'll wake up in a better state. Going into shock is quite common, so if you've ever been unfortunate enough to see anyone lose a limb or limbs, you might not see them screaming. The brain has its own painkiller system when you are in dire need of it. While we cannot measure the most painful experience, we do tend to agree on what are the worst kinds of pain. Perhaps being burned is one thing we all fear, especially the specter of being engulfed in flames. There are different types or grades of burns, and perhaps some good news is that the worse the burn, the lesser pain you might have due to damage to your nerve endings. So fourth degree burns that have basically barbecued you and sent you into shock may not be as painful as third or even second degree burns. Most pain victims will tell you the worst part is the treatment. One of the worst realizations is that the pain only gets worse when the fire is out, said one man on a Reddit thread discussing burns. Another agreed, the really excruciating part is the treatment. Some Insect stings, in fact, are supposed to hurt as much as burns. Of all the stings out there, the bullet ant delivers the worst of the worst. Dr. Justin O. Schmidt, who created the Insect Sting Pain Index, put the bullet ant at the top, stating that being stung feels like fire walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch rusty nail in your heel. A Brazilian tribal initiation asks tribe members to put their hand into a bullet ant glove. See for yourself online how one gutsy westerner deals with it, which is not very well. What looks even worse is a cluster headache. Women who have experienced childbirth have said they are the worst pain imaginable. They happen on one side of the head and can last up to three hours. Many television shows have illustrated the absolute agony people can go through, filming sufferers screaming and rolling around on the floor. According to the Migraine Trust, they only affect about one or two out of every 1,000 people, but the bad news is that they are thought to be incurable. Victims won't die or even suffer anything other than the pain itself. Writing on one treatment forum, a sufferer of these headaches said heroin, morphine, or oxycontin didn't help him at all. Some progress has been made using alternative and mostly illegal treatments, such as silent psilocybin mushrooms, and LSD. According to the Daily Beast, LSD's discoverer Albert Hoffman was actually looking for a way to treat headaches and migraines. Britain's National Health Service has done us all a favor and put together a list of what it says are the world's worst conditions in terms of pain. You might be surprised to hear that above cluster headaches or cancer, a heart attack, gout, the NHS puts shingles. Shingles occurs when the virus that caused the itchy nightmare of chickenpox reactivates. Like a Hollywood horror movie sequel, when it comes back again, it's worse than before. A more common painful condition is kidney stones. A Reddit thread asked people to state what the most painful thing they had ever experienced was, and quite a few people said kidney stones. The stones form when calcium and other substances in your urine build up. They can be as big as a ping pong ball, and if they break up, it can cause intense pain as you try to pass them through the urinary tract. If it's too big, it can be blasted into smaller pieces using shockwave therapy. It's probably better you don't get to that stage, so drink lots of water every day. You might be too fit or young for kidney stones, but that won't prevent bone breaks. We've all seen sportsmen with flapping limbs looking more stunned than 
in pain. But what is the most painful bone to break? A broken fibula might only hurt for a few days, but a broken rib could cause weeks of nagging pain and sleepless nights. According to American football players and forums detailing the pain of broken bones, the second worst break you can have is a ruptured Achilles. Former Oakland football star Ronald Curry described the pain as instantly excruciating, with the months to follow significantly worse. The winner on the worst break list, though, was the femur, the biggest bone in the body. Stubbing your toe on a rusty nail could also be disastrous. There's a good reason we keep our tetanus vaccinations up to date. The CDC reports that hardly anyone dies of tetanus due to the shots we have, but sporadic cases do happen from time to time. It starts with lockjaw, and then soon your whole body is suffering from spasms and locking up. According to the WHO, hundreds of cases happen each year around the world. If not treated early, tetanus will kill between 10 and 20% of its victims. And what doesn't kill you might not necessarily make you stronger. Many people on pain forums state that tooth abscesses are the worst, although one condition apparently tops it. This is called trigeminal neuralgia, a disease that affects around 1 in every 15 to 20,000 people and has been dubbed the suicide disease as that's what it will make you want to do. People have said it's like lightning striking you in the face, describing the shock attacks when the skull's largest nerve is distressed. A 63-year-old woman from Wales said in an interview it's the worst pain known to man, stating that neither treatment nor pain drugs have done anything to help her with this lifelong disease. My head goes back and I can hear screaming, she said, adding, it's only later that I realized that it was me that was screaming out in pain. The Trigeminal Neuralgia Association in the UK called it the most painful condition in the world. In 2013, the Daily Mail reported that 27% of sufferers kill themselves. While a few of the pains above are said to be worse than childbirth, it comes very high on the pain scale. Thankfully, not as high as the suicide disease as a lot of children would be motherless. In one interview, a 49-year-old woman said the final push is not the worst part. The labor bit, she said, is like something squeezing the crap out of your guts on a timer for what seems like eternity until you're delirious with exhaustion. Others have described it as similar to pooping a watermelon or bowling ball. The worst thing is, it's probably the most common and natural of intense pains. Back by popular demand, another show on unbearable pain. The one thing we all fear if we are not practicing masochists. In fact, it's one of humanity's common connections. Pain transcends culture. And while our viewers often disagree in the comments, pain in some ways brings all of us together. We decided to do a part two of the show, not only because it was so popular the first time around, but also after reading your comments, we realized many of you think some other pains deserve to have been on that list. How many times did we see the words Lego, testicle, or toe? Hundreds of times, maybe even thousands. So we thought we should give this another go, and add some new painful possibilities to scare you. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, Most Painful Things a Human Can Experience, Part 2. As we said in the first show, we can't accurately measure pain, because, for the most part, the hurt is in the mind and body of the sufferer. Nonetheless, science has tried to measure pain, sometimes employing brutal methods. These days we use pain scales that start with minimal or mild, and end with severe or even unbearable. Unbearable can mean just that for some people, and they have taken their own lives to end the suffering. This is usually a result of what we call chronic or habitually reoccurring pain, not just a one-off, like someone poking a pin into your pupil. Pain forums are full of people discussing such unbearable pains, and testimony of the sufferers is the best place to figure out what hurts most, especially if many people tell the same story. But we'll start with perhaps something much lighter, only because you talked about it so much. This is the story of standing on Lego, or more specifically, a Lego brick. Does it really hurt that much? Firstly, stepping on anything sharp, hard, or pointed, with the sensitive area of the foot, can hurt a lot. Have you ever stood on an upturned plug, or a glass miniature of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Okay, that's a long shot. You'll yelp like a dog having the door slammed shut on its tail. The reason standing on a Lego brick hurts so much is because the underside of the foot has about 200,000 sensory receptors, and that tough piece of Lego doesn't give way at all. You could compare this to stubbing your toe, which can make you hop around for a minute, howling curse words you never thought you were capable of saying. As one scientist writes on Medium, your hands and your feet are the parts of your body that interact with the world, and so they are full of nerve endings that provide sensory feedback to our central nervous system. According to him, it is our feet that are the most sensitive because they will tell our brain when we are walking into hazardous areas. Only standing on Lego or stubbing your toe isn't like slowly walking towards dangerously hot ground, it's a massive whack to these nerves all in one go. But he goes further in the explanation. Firstly, when you hit any area that is not protected by fatty tissue, it hurts like a mother beep, but he also says that because in the past it was your feet that would get cut or scratched easily, and sometimes become mortally infected, we evolved in a way that made them so sensitive. We need our pain to guide us through life. 
Remember that people with congenital analgesia, or insensitivity to pain, navigate every day on a tightrope and are forever getting injured. So yes, these shocks of pain hurt a hell of a lot. But can you imagine if that pain was sustained? What if a Lego accident or the feeling of hitting your toe into a step or even cracking your knee on the corner of a hardwood table lasted for an hour? What about a day or even a few weeks? What if that pain just came back for 20 minutes every afternoon of your life? It's chronic pain that really makes people suffer, the kind of pain you wouldn't laugh at as you would after throwing that piece of Lego from the highest window. There are plenty of people on back pain forums discussing what they call unbearable pain. So much pain that they can't move even after taking strong pain medications. One person writes that when it first happened to him, it was so immense that I felt my blood pressure being affected. I was almost going to get unconscious. On the website Spine Health, a woman says she feels like she is constantly being tortured, writing, I do think about suicide. There are many reasons you might have back pain. You might have slipped a disc, have a pinched nerve, or you might even have cancer. What about cancer? Surely that hurts. Well, we are told that the most painful cancer is that of the head, the neck, the bones, brain, lungs, and pancreas. It can be severe and debilitating. It's said that the crippling headaches people with brain cancer suffer from cannot be made less painful with drugs in around 50% of people. One woman on a forum writes about her lung cancer, saying, I have taken tramadol, steroids, and diazepam, and have tried to use my heated wheat pack, but nothing is touching it. So we know that lasting pain might not be the worst in terms of extremeness, but it surely causes the most grief. One of the worst things about cancer, of course, is that statistically, many of us one day will have it. Gout is also common, which is a kind of inflammatory arthritis. This can affect those sensitive joints in the feet, ankles, and knees, and can get much worse over time. The pain can last for days, then go away, but then come back again, and again, for the rest of your life. The CDC has one adjective to describe gout pain, and that is intense. It happens when uric acid crystals form in the joints, causing them to swell. For the most part, it is caused by unhealthy living, so lay off the booze, beer is the worst, sugary drinks, and keep your weight down. You might also just be susceptible to gout, though. Instances of gout have shot up over the last 30 years, and the USA leads the way in terms of annual years of healthy life lost per 100,000 people. The Arthritis Foundation tells us 4% of Americans suffer from gout. The Guardian wrote in 2014 that 1.6 million people in the UK were suffering from it, adding it is excruciatingly painful and for the most part, avoidable. One person on a gout forum writes, This is the most severe, agonizing pain I have ever had to deal with. Even the slight movement of my leg a centimeter or two in the wrong direction results in severe pain. Sticking with the this could happen to you theme, sorry about that, we introduce toothache. What, you may be thinking? Because we've all had toothaches from childhood to adulthood, and it's not that bad. But some of you know very well that not all toothaches are made equal. The ones that hurt the most, called severe and unbearable, often require emergency treatment, lest the sufferer go out of their mind. Forums are full of these people screaming for help, telling you no drugs, not even opiate-based painkillers, have even the smallest impact on the pain. And don't even think about sleeping, not even after days. As one person writes, it's hell on earth. And plenty of women on forums describe it as far worse than childbirth. These kinds of toothaches are often infections in the pulp of the tooth. We call this pulpitis, although there are different strains of this. A dental site tells us activated enzymes causing the breakdown of proteins create pus, leading to severe pain in pulpitis acuta purulenta. If left, the infection grows until putrefactive gases start to spill into the nerve tissue, but unlike other parts of your body, the teeth can't swell, and so that is why people call the pain extreme, or in the words of motherboard, the most unbearable pain. The nerves in there are all hooked up directly to the brain, leaving no room for pain amelioration. But the thing is, it doesn't let up, and what feels like your head being shocked by electricity may get to a level leaving you on the floor squealing like a banshee. You might also get an abscess. Your options are root canal or extraction because it won't go away. Anyone who has experienced this kind of pain for more than one day will tell you they felt like ending it, or in less of your cases, knocking the tooth out themselves. A quick Google search reveals that many people have killed themselves over toothaches. One man in the UK wrote this as his parting words, I just can't stand the pain any longer, sorry, Alan. So these are some terrible pains. You might be wondering if something like having your eyes pulled out hurts more. It's hard to say, because the shock and the body's response will react so quickly. A woman in the US gouged out both of her eyeballs in 2018 while in church, apparently to sacrifice her eyes to God. She's now blind, and we assume no longer in physical pain. 
It seems that the body comes to the rescue with all sorts of traumatic pain, releasing its own natural opiates and other chemicals to reduce the pain. It seems with chronic pain, though, the brain doesn't have enough magic. As one doctor says, when we stub our toe, the message is sent through the spinal cord to the brain and we hurt. But the brain then reacts to this abnormality by helping us out with pain relief. Unfortunately, for chronic pain, there's no answer. And as the National Center for Biotechnology Information writes, treatments for chronic pain are woefully inadequate. So, to all of you suffering from chronic pain, we hope you get better. For the rest of you, don't think too much and enjoy the glorious pain-free moment of each day. Just when you thought we couldn't get more mileage out of human suffering, we're back with yet another episode proving that existence is pain. We've covered the most painful cancers, stings, and medical conditions that leave people in horrible agony. And we've got more to add to our list of most painful things a human can experience. Warning, our final entry includes very graphic imagery. Frozen shoulder. Everyone's likely gotten the cold shoulder at least once in their life, but frozen shoulder will cause you more than some low-level social pain. Common amongst people who are recovering from medical conditions or procedures that restrict arm movement, frozen shoulder begins slowly and then quickly ramps up to full-blown agony which can last for years. Your shoulder and all its associated ligaments, tendons, and bones are all wrapped up in a gift wrapping of connective tissue. When you don't use your arm for long stretches of time though, that tissue can begin to thicken, slowly but steadily reducing the range of motion of your arm. If unchecked, frozen shoulder will eventually all but immobilize you, and trying to move your arm will result in great amounts of pain as you fight against the tissue that's keeping your various bits and pieces tightly restrained. Docs aren't sure why frozen shoulder develops exactly, but it's known to strike those with diabetes or who have their limbs immobilized for long periods of time. The bad news about frozen shoulder is that the treatment is even more agonizing than the condition, as the only way to cure it is to routinely exercise your arm with stretches and exercises meant to restore mobility. You're literally having to stretch your overly tightened tissues into normal mobility, causing severe agony. The next item on our list is a killer that can strike almost anyone at any time. Heart attack. If you've ever been wealthy enough to go to the emergency room to seek treatment, then you've likely been asked if you're experiencing any chest pains. And that's because doctors are on the lookout for a heart attack, one of the most painful things you can experience. Caused by a blockage of blood flow, a heart attack is the heart literally fighting for its life. Blockages are most common amongst individuals who are overweight and are caused by things such as fat and cholesterol. As blood flow becomes restricted, the heart muscles are weakened, and some of them might even be killed outright. In that case, you're in very serious trouble. Heart attacks usually begin with extreme pain in the chest, which can either come after a buildup of pressure and discomfort or strike completely out of nowhere. The good news is that the pain only lasts a few minutes because you'll be dead shortly after without immediate medical attention. If you ever experience sudden tightness or discomfort, let alone full-blown pain in your chest, call an emergency room right away and try not to have a second heart attack when you realize how deep in debt you'll soon be. Our next painful condition is hereditary, and if you don't suffer from it personally, there's a chance you could be passing on the misery to your kids. Sickle cell disease. We might as well stick to the theme of your body turning against you. Sickle cell disease is a blood disorder that's inherited through your parents' genes and results in red blood cells being grossly deformed. Instead of the nice round shapes you'd expect red blood cells to be, sickle cells are so named because the red blood cells become hard and form into a sickle shape. This makes it extremely difficult for the body to get the oxygen it desperately needs as the sickle cells are unable to transport oxygen efficiently. Other than constant exhaustion, the pain comes when the sickle cells die off in mass and form blockages in your arteries. Sickle cells are like James Dean, they live very fast and die extremely young. This can cause blockages that interrupt blood flow leading to some serious internal pain that narcotics aren't going to do much to help you manage. Eventually, the blockage can lead to stroke and death, making sickle cell a deadly and painful disorder to have. Sickle cell disease is most common amongst people with ancestors from sub-Saharan Africa, making it endemic to the black community, though the cause is poorly understood. Our next painful experience is something everyone will experience, if you live long enough. Arthritis. Frozen shoulder sounds pretty terrible and painful, but what if all your joints were being attacked at once? Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease where the body begins to friendly fire all over the place and attack the body's joints. First, the immune system attacks the membrane that encloses all the joint's moving parts, causing it to become inflamed and swollen. Over time, the immune system eats through the membrane to attack the cartilage and bone inside the actual joint itself. Without that protective layer of cartilage in the joint, your bones rub together as you move, leading to some pretty terrible pain. 
Regular arthritis sets in with age. Though family history, exercise, and weight can all have negative impacts on your odds to get arthritis, exercising regularly and keeping your weight in check can help limit the effects of arthritis, with extra pounds putting even more pressure on your joints and more quickly eroding the cartilage within. Currently, there is no cure for arthritis, and the best medicine can do is help lessen the pain and improve the quality of life. The next most painful thing you can experience is all too common and can strike anyone at any time. Sciatica The good news about sciatica is that it typically goes away over time. The bad news is it can be so painful it's completely debilitating. The sciatica nerve travels along your spine, then branches out from your lower back to travel down each leg. It's one of the main nerves in the human body, which means that when something goes wrong with it, you can be sure it's going to let you know with as much pain as it can produce, which is a lot. Typically, sciatica is caused by damage to the spine, such as herniated discs or a bone spur, or by narrowing of the spine. This causes the sciatic nerve to become compressed, and if there's one thing nerves don't like, it's to be messed with. It's kind of their whole job to let you know when that happens. But what can you do when the thing bothering your nerve is your own body? Well, not a whole lot in most cases. Only if the pain is extremely severe will doctors consider surgery to try and relieve the pressure on the nerve. For the rest of you, you'll have weeks of debilitating pain to look forward to as your body naturally heals. Just try not to sneeze if you develop sciatica, as we have it on good authority that a sudden violent sneeze will quickly send you into Hellraiser level depths of agony. Our next condition can strike anyone at any time, but unlike sciatica, it can be absolutely deadly. Appendicitis Mother Nature wants to remind you that she hates you, and that's why she's putting a ticking time bomb in your body. The appendix, an organ whose purpose is still unclear and some doctors suspect is an evolutionary leftover, is home to lots and lots of bacteria. Most of that bacteria we know are there to aid in digestion, and a new theory states is that the appendix is meant to be a home of sort for these bacteria, a place where they can hang their hat after a tough 12-hour shift in your colon, helping digest and process your food. Sure, an appendix may not be an impressive place to live, but don't judge these bacteria too quickly. Their job is pretty crappy after all. Problems occur when bacteria multiply out of control, leading to a blockage and an infection. The appendix quickly becomes inflamed and swells up as it fills with pus. If you don't get treatment right away, the appendix will burst, spreading the infection throughout your body and potentially killing you. Treatments are highly effective as in most cases doctors simply have to remove the appendix before it bursts. If you begin to have pain that starts at your navel and then moves around the abdominal area, you should definitely see a doctor right away. On par with a kidney stone, appendicitis is completely debilitating and can feel like a horse kicking you repeatedly and non-stop in the side. Famously, a Soviet surgeon on a trip to Antarctica had to perform a self-appendectomy to save his own life using only mirrors so he could see what he was doing and absolutely zero painkillers. Appendicitis is easily resolved if caught early, though if the appendix does burst, treatment will include removal of the appendix and power washing of your intestines so you don't end up dying to the secondary infection, which we can imagine is also rather unpleasant. Our next most painful thing you can experience is as savage as it is deadly. Warning: Very graphic imagery ahead. Chimpanzee Attack We've covered plenty of ways your body can betray you in this episode, but we thought we'd end with one of the most painful things you can experience that doesn't come from within. Chimps. They're adorable. They're like small humans. Who doesn't love to see a chimp dressed up in a business suit with a fake cigar, pretending to be a real person? Well, it turns out that chimps don't always love to play make-believe, and sometimes we forget that chimps are wild animals who are several times stronger than the average human. Chimpanzee attacks are brutal, and it's our official stance on the infographic show that chimps along with jellyfish are the biggest a-holes in the animal kingdom. Hear us out. While much stronger than a human, a chimpanzee could easily kill a person, but evolution has given them an entirely different battle strategy. Instead of killing, in the wild, chimpanzees often try to disfigure and dismember rivals. And because evolution is all about reproduction, one of the first targets chimps go for is the groin. In 2005, a couple was visiting their pet chimpanzee they had to house in the Animal Haven Ranch in Caliente, California, after the chimp bit off part of a woman's finger. Already a red flag if we've ever seen one. While at the sanctuary, four other chimps escaped their cages and two male chimps charged at the couple. The woman lost her thumb, but her husband bravely managed to hold the chimp's attention so she could find safety, though paid for it dearly. He ended up having his genitals mutilated. He had a foot torn off. He had severe damage to his face resulting in the loss of one eye, most of one cheek, and part of his nose, as well as having part of his buttocks bitten and ripped off by the attacking chimps. In 2009, a woman was attacked by her friend's pet chimp. The chimp tore off both of her hands and completely mauled her face. 
The chimp attacked responding police officers, cornering one cop in his car as he opened fire point blank, killing the crazed animal. It's not just domestic chimps that have attacked people, however. In Uganda, chimpanzees suffering from habitat loss due to farming have begun fighting back in completely horrendous ways. In 2014, a chimpanzee snatched a toddler from its mother, broke off its arm, and mauled the child so badly he died on the way to the hospital. As chimps are finding it more and more difficult to find food in the wild, they've resorted to raiding farms and villages, with disastrous consequences for the Ugandans who live there. Much like in the wild, the chimps seem to be attacking infants with infanticide being an evolutionary survival technique ingrained into the chimps. If you deny your rivals their children after all, there will be no future competition for resources. Having our most sensitive body parts ripped apart by pure ape fury sounds like one of the worst things a human can experience to us. It started with a tingling in the lips. Within a week, she was howling in pain with what felt like electric shocks pulsating through her face with hot knives stabbing into her skull. And this happened around 25 times per day. But that's a condition so bad we want to save it for later. First, let's look at some of life's other horrifically painful conditions that often come with the word unbearable. Number 20. We're now going to start with what's called the world's most venomous fish, an animal whose sting is said to cause pain worse than childbirth. It's the stonefish, which doesn't look like such an aquatic thug. The problem with this little dude is it looks just like a stone, so when folks are walking down beaches where these things might be on the sand, it's very easy to step on them. If that happens, the outcome can be pretty horrendous. There's a reason they're sometimes called heart stoppers. Their venom is so darn potent it can paralyze muscles and cause cardiac arrest. A scientist talking to The Guardian about these little creatures explained how you get stung. He said when you step on it, that presses on the gland. The gland ruptures and the venom squirts up along the spine. Thankfully, these little blighters are usually only found in the Indo-Pacific region, but the bad news is they do tend to sting quite a few people. A handful of Australians can tell you about it. Once one of these things has stung you, applying hot water might help a bit, but in many cases an anti-venom is required. The sting can definitely be lethal as well as excruciatingly painful. If you don't believe that a stonefish sting can cause someone to have a pretty bad day, this is how one Australian described the feeling just after the sting. My body was convulsing, my mind slipping in and out of consciousness with each contraction. I could hear my heart thump 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 thump. Each beat was pushing the poison further around my body. I imagined my blood mixing with the toxin. She said it was very hard to breathe and she thought she was going to die. She explained I thrashed around dramatically for literal hours, teeth rattling, ugly crying. But thanks to some fast thinking people around her, she survived the ordeal. This happened on a trip to Barbados, but back in her native Australia, she'd heard that if you don't get antivenom within 15 minutes of being stung, you're a goner. That's not strictly true, but without help, people have died in the past. We found another story involving an Australian accidentally stepping on a stonefish. This time, it was a man. A man that said within 10 minutes of the sting, he felt like someone was slicing off his toe. He also said it went from a sharp, painful thing to being excruciating. It was like hitting your toe with a hammer and then rubbing it over and over again with a nail file. I've been through pain in the past where I needed a screw in my skull, and nothing compares to this. With that in mind, we're confident that this pain is worse than the pain of childbirth, but when it comes to stings, the critters we'll talk about next are said to be the kings of pain. Number 19. There are some people in this world that say the stonefish sting is more painful than a bullet ant sting, but we doubt there are many people that have actually been stung by both animals. That's because actively trying to be stung by a stonefish would be a very stupid thing to do, considering you might die in the process. You won't die if you're stung by a bullet ant. But since it comes at the top of insect sting pain indexes, well, getting stung is not exactly a walk in the park. The reason it's called a bullet ant is because of the intense pain makes someone feel like they've been shot. One victim of a bullet ant sting described it like this. Walking over flaming charcoal with three-inch nails embedded in your heel, waves of burning, throbbing, all-consuming pain that continues unabated for up to 24 hours. Luckily, these critters are only found in Central and South America, so the rest of you not from those places can breathe easily. Believe it or not, there have been people who've actually gone looking for them and filmed themselves being stung. That kind of thing can attract millions upon millions of viewers on a YouTube channel. Still, we don't advise doing it. When a man who calls himself Coyote Pearson did it, you could certainly see that the bullet ant is a remarkable animal. He already got himself bitten by all kinds of critters, but in this video he screamed out in pain. It's number one, it's number one, oh my gosh, ah, it's getting worse, ah! Number 18. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night and it feels like someone is crushing your big toe with a pair of pliers. That's what dreaded gout can feel like. 
The pain of gout varies in intensity and from person to person. But the word on the street is when it's doing its worst, gout can cause pain that will make a person want to chop off any joint where the pain is coming from. It's caused by urate crystals that form when there's too much uric acid in the blood. In some cases, it's down to diet. Gout used to be called the disease of kings because kings generally ate well and drank a lot of booze. Some foods contain chemicals called purines. These things are broken down by uric acid, so more purines mean more uric acid, which means gout. Let's say you have a diet that consists of tons of red meat washed down daily with gallons of beer. You could end up with gout. It's not that uncommon. Around 2% of people in the US will have this disease in their lifetime, a disease that can flare up time and again. It usually starts with a tingling feeling that can quickly turn into a living nightmare for some people. One woman who suffered gout attacks wrote on Facebook, this pain is off the charts, completely intolerable. The gout flare-up usually peaks around the 24-hour mark and can happen in many joints of the body, although the big toe seems to be a popular spot. It can go on for days, but not usually with the intensity of the peak. The scary thing is an attack might not happen for months or even years and then wham! One hits you and you'll wish you'd never been born. Gout isn't always the worst pain imaginable, but a particularly severe attack can be compared to the pain of giving birth. Ok, now for something that could affect you all. Number 17. You might laugh when we tell you that the next pain on this list involves a child's toy. Yeah, you got it, we're gonna go out on a limb and say that stepping on a Lego brick can be as painful as giving birth to a child. This might upset someone who's been through the sometimes excruciating experience of that and we certainly don't want to get on the wrong side of our viewers, but there's something you need to bear in mind here. You see, when you step on a Lego, the pain, though intense, lasts only a very short period of time. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have that unbearable pain last even a few minutes? What if, like childbirth, it lasted for hours? It would be absolutely awful. One reason it hurts so much to stand on a piece of Lego is the brick is so solid that nothing gives way. But the main reason is that your feet are one of the most sensitive areas on your body when it comes to pain. They are so sensitive because your feet send danger signals to your brain. Back in the day, the 200,000 pain receptors in a person's foot might have felt the ground tremble when a large, dangerous animal was nearby. They might have also felt a rise in heat when a fire was close. But in modern times, these sensitive things don't deal well with Lego bricks. They're not easy to escape either. Some sources state that there are enough Lego bricks in the world for everyone to have 83 each. Number 16. We're going to now talk about something that happens to a lot of people and it's called a slipped disc. In a paper published in the US National Institutes of Health, it says these things can cause severe shooting pains that radiate from the spine to the arms. It can be so bad that the person shows signs of paralysis. Basically, the discs act as shock absorbers between the vertebrae of your spine. But with a lot of wear and tear over the years, sometimes they can't handle doing their job any longer and slip. When they do that, they can hit nerves in the spinal cord and have you howling in pain. But it would be remiss of us to say any old slip disc is more painful than going through childbirth. But when these things play up, when they're at their very worst, the outcome can be horrendous for people. A sufferer on a web forum said he was on very strong drugs, but they weren't doing much for him. So he asked the question, how long will I be crawling up the walls in pain, unable to move without screaming? One woman replied, alluding to childbirth, saying, on occasions probably the most painful thing I've ever suffered. Yes, even more than that. What's terrifying is the fact that some women suffer from a slipped disc while they're pregnant. We'll pray for them tonight. Now for something you probably never heard of and you'll be glad you never have. Number 15. Here's a medical description of the condition before we tell you what it is. The acute vaso-occlusive pain crisis manifests as an abrupt onset of severe debilitating pain in any part of the body. That doesn't sound very nice at all. That pain is the result of something called sickle cell disease. In short, this is a rare blood disease inherited from parents. It means the red blood cells are not healthy. Usually these cells are round, but when you have this disease, they look more like a sickle, one of those grain cutting tools used on farms. When this happens, blood flow is blocked to places such as your chest, abdomen, and joints. This can prove extremely painful. The bad news is that this is for most people a lifetime condition. But the better news is the pain only comes in bouts, sometimes called pain crises. The UK National Health Service calls them severe and says they can last up to a week. These attacks of pain might hit the hands, arms, legs, or feet, but they might also hit the spine, the pelvis, the stomach, the ribs, or the breastbone. Some people might even have just one attack a year or less, but others can have them more often or less often. According to NHS, one bad episode can be horrendous, and we mean crippling. We looked at the dedicated sickle cell disease forums to try and figure out how the pain feels. 
One person wrote, I say it feels like being stabbed repeatedly while having a migraine throughout your whole body. Ouch, indeed. Another person said it feels like having multiple fractures, all at the same time, and another said it was like having broken bones and glass flowing through my body. Some more descriptions included lines like a monster, seemingly a never-ending torture. You're being poked or stabbed by tiny pointy iron nails. The intensity of the pain is indescribable. And for me, it's like you're beating me with a hammer on my bones. Wow, that sounds painful. And it would be hard to top. Nonetheless, you will see that there are pains in this world that can cause a similar amount of distress. Number 14. Okay, this one is short but not so sweet. It's called peripheral neuropathy, and a doctor that treats people with it said it can feel like walking on razor blades. It's the result of damaged nerves that carry messages to the brain. When this happens, muscles might not work. A person might even experience paralysis, and of course, there could be lots and lots of severe pain. Like many conditions, it's complex, so its effects can differ and the level of pain can too. But when it hurts, it hurts bad. One person on a forum said, I have talked to two young women who are prescribed morphine patches. I had no idea that neuropathy pain was so severe. It's also been called unrelenting and severe. But all the pain is made worse from the constant cramping and loss of some bodily functions, such as simply not being able to pick stuff up. We'll now endeavor to talk about something much more gory. Hold on tight, this is petrifying. Number 13. It might seem strange to you that we're putting a regular animal attack on this list, but you have to take into account some animal attacks can be slow. We mean death can be slow, not that a sloth attack is especially painful. Take for example an attack from a grizzly bear. If the bear doesn't kill you quickly by severing a main artery, you could be experiencing agonizing pain for some time. That happened to a man named Timothy Treadwell. When a grizzly bear attacked him and his female companion, they both died as a result. Treadwell was the focus of an outstanding documentary made by the filmmaker Werner Herzog called Grizzly Man. One of the most disturbing parts of the film is watching Herzog put on a pair of headphones and listen to the audio recording of their deaths. Treadwell had left his camera on when the bear attacked him. Herzog looks in shock, listening to what is a sustained attack. He said after, it's the most terrifying thing I've heard in my life. He later said to one of Treadwell's former girlfriends, you should never listen to it and you should rather destroy it. So, what do you think that bear did to Treadwell? Well, imagine your bones being crushed between a bear's teeth. Imagine being alive as it bites into your skull and perhaps pokes out an eye or two. People have survived bear attacks and lived to tell the tale. One such man, Johann Otter, described in detail his date with a hungry bear. He said, the grizzly's fangs sunk into my femur and it jerked me all over the trail. It gnawed on my head and I could feel flesh tearing away. Doctors later discovered a total of 28 wounds, including a claw puncture to my right eye. One of my top vertebrae was broken in five pieces, and I would undergo multiple surgeries including a skin graft from my back onto my scalped head. Okay, so the adrenaline rushing through the body would have saved him from a lot of pain, but if the screams of Treadwell are anything to go by, being eaten by a bear can hurt a fair bit. For that reason, we're okay with adding it to the list. Now for something way more prosaic and not anywhere near as frightening, but my god, it can sting. Number 12. Peritonitis hurts. Ask anyone who had it. It happens when there's an inflammation in the tissues that line your abdomen or belly. This tissue is called the peritoneum. When it's inflamed, it can be deadly. This can happen by way of an infection, but some of you have likely heard it can occur when someone's appendix has burst. Appendicitis by itself can cause pretty severe pain, but you really don't want the thing to rupture. That can mean you might not have long to live if you don't get treated soon. With peritonitis, you really, really need medical help very quickly. One complication of it is sepsis, your body's extreme response to the infection. This is like an all-in-one part of the show because appendicitis can be really painful, but many people who suffered from sepsis have also said it was the most painful thing they've ever experienced in their lives. Peritonitis is no walk in the park either. It might start with a dull ache, but in no time the person will be doubled over in absolute hellish agony. Now for something we guess many of you can relate to. Number 11. You might laugh when you hear we're going to talk about toothache now. Ha! You think I've had many, but they're a mildly uncomfortable sensation. But the reason you say that is you haven't had a proper, hardcore, full-blown, I feel like jumping out of the window toothache. Here's how one person on Reddit explained her toothache. I consider myself to have a very high pain tolerance. I've had my nipples pierced. I've cut my finger rather deep on a saw once. I've gotten rabies shots twice in my life. I've had chronic back pain for years, but nothing can ever compare to the pain I've had from this tooth. Once a tooth gets infected and inflamed and things start going wrong underneath it, well, there isn't much space there. 
This is one reason why these kinds of toothaches hurt so much. You can't relieve the pain and anyone who's had one will know that pain medications don't seem to do much at all. Here's how another Reddit user described his infected tooth and the attendant pain. The pain in the tooth gets so bad that just swallowing puts enough pressure on it to make you writhe in pain. You can't even think about anything else, let alone talk or eat. If you've ever got a really bad one, you'll know what we're talking about. There are regular toothaches and then there are monsters you'll never forget. Ok, time to move on now. Let's talk about the absolutely agonizing sports injuries. Number 10. Many injuries have been discussed regarding the severity of pain, and one that gets a mention quite a lot is breaking of the thigh bone, aka the femur. It happened to an American football player named E.J. Henderson. This bone is the strongest in the body, so to break it, it takes some effort. In Henderson's case, it snapped in half, which caused him immense pain. News reports said that when his teammates saw the pain he was in, some of them were reduced to tears themselves. He recovered and in the end was back playing inside a year, but he'll never forget what it was like to break the bone which out of all the bone breaks causes the worst pain. Number 9. There are many sports injuries that can lead to significant pain and one is shoulder dislocation. It could happen while playing sports but it can also happen at work, as you'll see. Some of you might be thinking this injury isn't so bad, but some dislocations are worse than others. There was a show on British TV called 24 Hours in A&E. And in one particular episode, a six-foot builder went into the ER screaming like a banshee. He'd fallen backwards into a hole while at work. We watched every episode of the show and we can say that we never saw anyone in so much pain. His howling was painful to watch. Please, 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 the guy shouted. That was after he'd been given three times the usual dose for pain relief. Even a person in the visiting area turned to her friend and remarked, oh my god, that noise. The fellow looked pretty tough too his body showing all kinds of injuries including a stab wound from the past. He later said he'd been stabbed, shot, hit with baseball bats, and had been to the ER many times in his life, but nothing compared to that shoulder injury. He said, I've been in a lot of injuries in my life with pain involved, adding he might have had pain that was at the scale of 10 before, but this one was definitely an 11. But why was this dislocation so painful? The doctor said he'd actually dislocated his shoulder in a way that was so rare he'd never seen anything like it in all her 30 years practicing medicine. Looking at the x-rays, she was taken aback, telling the nurses this was interesting radiography. His bones were sticking into his ribs and in other places in a very funny position that she said it would be insanely painful. She said the way his x-ray turned out I think surprised all of us, quite an excruciating pain of bone on bone being wedged. It's amazing what people can do to themselves. She explained that there are one-offs in the world of injuries and pain, and this was one of them. The funny thing she said is, if there's a male equivalent of childbirth, you've just seen it. To get the shoulder into the right place, they had to give him an anesthetic. After that, it took five people wrestling his body to do the job. It wasn't easy, but once it was over, the chap smiled again. In what sounded like a cockney accent, he said, it's embarrassing, isn't it, coming to the hospital? And you're screaming like a little girl, but you know, it was painful. Hey, I hold my hands up, I was in agony. Now for something so gruesome it'll give you nightmares. Number 8. There are a few things on a body that a man really doesn't want to think could snap or break, and one of them being his John Thomas. While penile fracture can be very painful, it is the balls that dangle below that can cause a person worse pain. By the way, if you don't want to break your Ron Burgundy, you might try sticking to the missionary position where it's most safe. Unfonnately, in the world of ours, there's something called gonadal torsion. This is when the testicle rotates, and that makes the spermatic cord twist. If that doesn't mean much to you, all you need to know is it causes severe acute unilateral scrotal pain. This can lead to a bout of vomiting, and it's something that will require medical assistance. It happens to one person in anywhere between 4,000 and 25,000 males a year, and in many cases it'll mean one of the balls has to be surgically removed. It can actually be very dangerous, as well as incredibly painful. In some rare cases, it's led to sepsis and gangrene. One person on a forum thought he had it, so he asked others what they thought about his symptoms. One response was this, if you had testicular torsion, trust me, you would not be on an internet forum asking others, giving a weak description of it. You would be rolling around in agony, clutching your berries and phoning a taxi to go to A&E. Unfortunately, it can happen to anyone, and it seems the cause might just be down to the person's body. One medical website explained, testicular torsion can happen at any time while standing, sleeping, exercising, or sitting, and with no apparent trigger in those who are susceptible. If you're age 10 to 25, you're in the age group that's most likely to get it. But we think this next pain is much worse. Number 7. There have been many brutal forms of execution throughout history, from simply sawing a person in half to roasting them inside a giant bronze bull. 
Historians now debate if that last one ever happened, but sawing definitely did, and there are a lot of documents to prove it. Historians are also sure that people were crucified, which even some Romans in ancient times thought was way too barbaric. Yeah, the same people that had elephants squash men. In terms of pain, it's hard to say which was the worst execution. Many of them were awful, but we think we have to give special mention to flaying. This is when a person had their skin peeled off, a procedure that was sometimes deliberately slow. This is how one person put it. The peeling usually began from the face, with every sinew of skin being ripped from the nerve endings. The pain experienced is unimaginable. Remember that sometimes the objective was to keep the person alive for as long as possible, although some folks would just go into shock early on and die. That was a godsend. We can't exactly find out just how much it hurt because there's no one to ask and it's not as if there are any modern sources that can explain the experience from a first-hand perspective. Still, we know how sensitive the skin is and we can only imagine what it would feel like if someone started to slice it off. We have no doubt that the experience would be more painful than having a child. Number 6. Many women have talked online about a particular pain that they said hurt a lot more than giving birth. This pain was the dreaded gallstones. These can appear in the gallbladder when the digestive fluid is hardened. Sometimes they don't cause any pain, but when they do, they are not something a person will forget about easily. One such person described the experience like this. Horrendous pain in the rib cage was radiating to the back. I was being sick and excessively sweating. Painkillers weren't touching it. In fact, we found a few women who had them and compared them to giving birth. One 46-year-old woman had this to say. Gallstone pain is like labor pains, actually a million times worse. They came in waves, gradually getting stronger. I've never felt anything like that pain up until that point, and now I get them about four times a year in the last two years. It's terrible, worse than having children. Okay, so that's pretty good proof that gallstones can indeed hurt more than having a kid. Now for something humanity goes to great lengths to ensure doesn't happen to many people. Number 5. As for stones, we think we need to mention them again, except this time it's when they appear in the kidneys. How much do kidney stones hurt? These little stones can cause excruciating pain in the back, the abdomen, and even the penis for men. The pain is incredibly intense in the worst cases. But don't take our word for it, listen to what former sufferers had to say about their stones. The first stone I had felt like many earthquakes in my lower abdomen. The pain gets so bad I projectile vomit anything, including water. I never felt such pain in all my life. It is indeed like some say, like having a knife in your side and someone keeps twisting it. I've had many kidney stones and I'm almost 50 years old. I can tell you that the pain is unbearable and definitely worse than natural childbirth. This was the worst pain ever. I'm 52 and it was my first stone ever. I hope I never get another one. It was worse than having a baby and I did all natural childbirth with my two boys. Worst pain ever. Not many people these days get the next one, but those that do are mentally scarred forever if they make it out of the other end. Number 4. It's called tetanus, and while it might not cause acute pain as bad as some of the pains we've talked about, we think you'll agree it's up there when it comes to scary pains. You only need to see images of sufferers and you won't disagree. This bacterial infection causes the muscles to spasm, which often starts in the jaw and moves to other parts of the body. These spasms can be so intense that they break bones. The spasms happen on and off while the person has it, and it can go on for months. 25 to 30 percent of people that have it die from it, while the survivors go through absolute hell. According to the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, from 2009 to 2017, there were 264 cases of tetanus in the USA, and 19 of those people died. In 2015, there were 209,000 cases globally, with 59,000 deaths. So while humanity has done well in vaccinating people against tetanus, it's still possible that one day you might suffer this living nightmare. If you don't believe us, listen to this. In 2009, a man described as a 25-year-old Hispanic male landscaper cut himself while pruning some bushes in the US. He did all the right things, tending to the wound and applying antibiotic ointment. Still, he soon ended up in the hospital, suffering from a fever and muscle aches. He then found that his jaw became very painful. Soon he couldn't even open his mouth to eat and it was hard to breathe. Doctors noted his muscles were spasming, so this guy was soon whisked off to intensive care and put on life support. He was one of the lucky ones because after being given drugs such as diazepam and penicillin, he made a recovery. In 2017, a young boy from Oregon almost died after getting tetanus from a cut. NBC News wrote, he started crying and experiencing involuntary muscle spasms and clenching his jaw. Soon he was arching his neck and suffering back and muscle contractions throughout his body. He survived but not before those muscle spasms became very intense and he needed a ventilator to help him breathe. Suffice to say, tetanus is a terrible beast. This is what a doctor said. Because tetanus causes such severe muscle spasms, it also causes severe pain. 
It can also be frightening to have uncontrolled muscle spasms, especially when it's so severe. Okay, now for something run of the mill, but you can't argue it doesn't deserve a place on the list. Number 3. Burns. We gotta give credit to burns. As you all know, even a minor burn can be very painful, but being on fire is another experience altogether. The strange thing is though, once the burn is so bad that it's burnt through the nerves, there's less pain. Then once the person gets help, they'll have their dressings changed, which according to some victims really, really is painful. One guy who was in an accident with his father explained it like this. I used to face too much pain in every dressing. I was able to see flesh on my leg. After one and a half months, I got the graft surgery done. They took skin from my left leg, which was all right, but it gave me too much unbearable pain. Wasn't able to sleep for a week. So yeah, burns need to be here. The next thing is rare, but it sounds horrible. Number 2. Cluster Headaches While we were looking at forums where people described the pain of their burns, we found one guy who'd been burned badly, but said the pain was nothing compared to cluster headaches. His actual words were, nothing compares to the pain of cluster headaches. The pain was so intense that I begged a nurse for morphine, heroin, ketamine, and induced coma if they had to. I have a very high pain tolerance, enough to shrug off migraines, but god damn those headaches. They made me question if life was worth living at that point. We're going to take his word for it because there are a lot of people and experts out there that put these headaches up there as one of the worst things a human being can experience. Medical websites tell us they often come in the middle of the night, waking a person up in extreme pain. They won't kill you, but they often come back time and again, usually lasting from 15 minutes to 3 hours. Britain's NHS calls them rare, but says they are excruciating attacks of pain. The internet is full of forums where people talk about these headaches, and what we've read is enough to make us pray we never get one. Here are some scary words we found. I will never forget the sheer and sudden agony which woke me up in the early hours of the morning. Someone's jabbed a white hot poker into your eye socket and is holding it there for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. It makes you want to get up and literally run from the pain. This is why some experts have called them the worst pain known to medical science. But as you'll now see, something might beat cluster headaches in the realms of intense pain. Number 1. It's called trigeminal neuralgia. Like cluster headaches, it's something that has made people say they'd rather die than experience the pain again. It's supposed to feel like an electric shock going through the face, with attacks lasting from just a few seconds to a couple minutes. The NHS writes, people with the condition may experience attacks of pain regularly for days, weeks, or months at a time. In severe cases, attacks might happen hundreds of times a day. This is why they make life so unbearable, because they keep coming back and they can't be cured. They're caused when something called the trigeminal nerve is compressed by a blood vessel, and while there are drugs that can help, the attacks might come back. In the UK, they happen to about 10 people in 100,000. As for personal experiences, a woman in the UK said she started having about 25 attacks every day. This greatly affected her well-being. She said the disease had completely consumed my life. I can't brush my hair or my teeth, eat, sleep, stand in the wind, touch my face without feeling like I'm being electrocuted across my face. So between these and cluster headaches, we really can't say which is the worst, but they both sound equally horrific. The animal kingdom is full of terrifying and deadly parasites. While there aren't any that'll eat their way out of a human's chest, unlike a certain sci-fi movie that makes us afraid, there is no shortage of parasitic animals that would love nothing more than to feed on you. These are the 13 most painful parasites that infect humans. Number 13. Tapeworms One of the most common parasites, tapeworms usually make their way inside the human body as hitchhikers alongside your lunch or dinner. These tiny, ribbon-like worms lurk inside the flesh of animals, commonly fish, beef, or pork. When you unwittingly consume them, these creatures don't get digested. They set up camp in the digestive tract and can live there for a long time. Their long bodies have hooks or suckers that embed themselves into the intestine, and then they get all their energy they need to live by absorbing part of your food. But they don't stay invisible for long. People who are infected with tapeworms soon report symptoms including nausea, vomiting, digestive issues, unexplained weight loss, and signs of malnutrition including dizziness. While most people eventually expel their tapeworm through their digestive tract, which can be a disgusting sight in the bathroom, they can survive for up to 25 years, and when ingested as eggs or larvae, the tapeworm can reproduce in the body. Larvae can turn into cysts that migrate through the body, even in the brain, where they can potentially cause serious illness or even death. This parasite is often invisible, but the next makes itself very well known. Number 12. Bed Bugs These little insects are the scourge of anyone who stayed in a hotel. Tiny, blood-sucking insects that are notoriously hard to find and eliminate. They spread in high-density areas and can hide in mattress seams or wall cracks. 
When they attach to a person, their bites cause a host of skin issues that become impossible to ignore. Skin rashes, blisters, and constant itchiness become a part of regular life until the bed bugs are eliminated, and more severe cases can result in fatigue and fever. While the insects aren't known to spread serious diseases, unlike other pesky blood-sucking insects, one of their biggest threats is causing allergic reactions. And while many exterminators will promise to get rid of a bed bug infestation, these little buggers can live up to 70 days without feeding and reproduce fast, making them likely to be unwelcome guests for a long time. These next parasites make their presence known in a very unpleasant way. Number 11. Pinworms Roundworms are a common species of parasitic worm that lay eggs in the body, but many of them don't pose a serious danger to humans. That's not to say you don't want to avoid them, especially the pinworm, a small worm that spreads via its eggs. It can be picked up via contact with the hands and then getting swallowed, and then it goes to where the sun don't shine. The pinworm likes to lay its eggs around the anus, and this causes a host of uncomfortable symptoms for unlucky humans. Pinworm hosts report itching around the anus, painful bowel movements, and difficulty sleeping due to constant annoyance. Fortunately, it can be treated with a number of medications, but the worm spread so quickly that the doctors recommend everyone who lives with the infected take the medicine. This parasite is so common that it's estimated that 20% of children in the United States will get infected. Some roundworms, though, can cause much more serious infections. Number 10. Filarial Worms Everyone knows mosquitoes are annoying, but some can carry something far more dangerous. These pesky bloodsuckers are hosts to tiny roundworms that can cause a whole host of diseases. Mosquitoes are a common transmitter of plague, and the World Health Organization estimates that more than 120 million people have an infection of filarial worms. While many of them don't cause any symptoms at all, they have the nasty effect of clogging lymphatic vessels in some cases. Another variety affects the eyes. These worms can usually be treated with antiparasitic medication, but if left untreated can cause serious ailments. They're one of the world's leading causes of blindness, and in severe cases, can cause elephantitis syndrome, a disorder that causes extreme swelling due to the inability of the lymph glands to drain, mostly affecting the legs. The next parasitic worm has more aggressive tastes. Number 9. Hookworm The hookworm is a species of roundworm that's common in many countries around the world, especially those without access to clean water. The larvae infects people both orally and through the skin, at which point it sets up camp inside the human digestive tract for a feast. Pretty similar to other parasitic worms, except the hookworm doesn't want your food, it wants your blood. These worms latch onto the intestinal tract and start acting like a vampire, causing major health issues for the unfortunate host. If left untreated, it can cause abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, and most seriously, anemia, that can result in weakness and other serious health conditions. This worm kills up to 60,000 people a year, and the good news is it's vulnerable to many antiparasitic medications, but it's hard to detect before it reaches maturity. But it's not the most deadly parasitic worm. Number 8. Whipworm the whipworm is a soil-based parasite that infects over half a billion people worldwide and is most spread by a contaminated soil and often eaten through fruits and vegetables. The eggs hatch and take up residence in the large intestine. While many cases are asymptomatic, those who have heavy infections can find themselves seriously sick. Not only do these worms wreak havoc on the digestive tract, but it can trigger more serious illnesses like appendicitis that require emergency surgery. Its most dangerous effect, though, may be on children. Kids who are infected can suffer delayed growth and cognitive impairment, as well as suffering from nutritional ailments. Experts estimate this worm kills upwards of 60,000 people a year, but like other parasitic worms, it can be killed off with antiparasitic medication. But the biggest challenge of battling these worms is preventing infections and treating people before they progress to serious cases. One worm makes its presence known with a name that says terror. Number 7. Dracunculus medinensis, or the guinea worm, translated as Little Dragon of the Mediterranean. The proper name of the guinea worm gives away that this worm is a killer. The female worms are among the largest worms that can infect humans, growing up to 31 inches in length, longer than many snakes as they slither around in the human gut. It's not surprising that they can cause excruciating pain. They infect people through contaminated drinking water and are most common in the rural areas of Africa and tropical regions like Southwest Asia and India. Once embedded in the human body, the effects can be deadly. These worms cause a secondary disease as the female worms try to emerge from the body through the skin. The chemical she releases can cause infections, nausea, blisters, and itching. 
but if she fails to emerge and gets stuck in the body, the worm can cause arthritis, paralysis, or severe swelling from the infection and resulting immune response. To treat this, doctors look for a blister where the worm's going to emerge and then use warm water to lure the worm out. They then slowly pull it out and wrap it around a stick. It can take several days to remove a full-sized guinea worm, followed by treatment with antibiotics and bandages. These next parasites don't wait for you to consume them. Number 6. Blood Fluke Everyone's scared of leeches, those predatory worms that latch onto your skin in water and start sucking your blood, but the blood fluke takes that nasty MO to the next level. After spending part of their life in a snail host, they lurk in the water and enter the skin of humans and proceed to feed on their blood. They can live for decades and can remain asymptomatic for years, but when things go bad, they go very bad. When they cause a series of infections called schistosomiasis, they can affect almost every part of the body. Their most serious symptom is swelling, which can cause long-term damage to glands and can even cause liver failure if left untreated. While the parasite can be treated with the same antiparasitic medications useful against other worms, these parasites are particularly common in Africa and are estimated to cause up to 200,000 deaths a year, making the blood fluke one of the deadliest parasites worldwide. The next parasite is much more visible and much more painful. Number 5. Jiggers Any dog or cat owner probably knows how annoying fleas are, constantly jumping everywhere and biting. But that's nothing compared to the sand flea, also known as the jigger. These fleas are common in Central and South America and have arrived in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they have a parasitic tactic that can make every step miserable. The smallest known flea, they lurk in the sand and attach to people as they burrow headfirst into the skin, usually on the foot. This causes swelling and lesions as the female swells up with eggs. This is just the beginning of the problem. It's common for the victims of jiggers to have dozens or even hundreds of them embedded in their feet. As the fleas die off, this can cause infection that results in pain, scabbing, dead skin, and permanent deformation of the toes. As pulling the fleas out can cause their bodies to tear and leave parts behind, jigger infestations are treated by a doctor to carefully remove any trace of the attached flea and disinfect the area, which can be a lengthy process. The next parasite also makes itself way too welcome in the human body. Number 4. The Human Bot Fly Flies usually do little more than buzz around you, making that annoying sound. But Dermatobia hominis, or the human bot fly, has a particularly invasive method of reproduction. Its eggs are carried by other insects like mosquitoes, which bite humans, transferring the eggs into the open wound. Then they hatch there, and the larva wedges itself into the human skin, growing there and creating a visible grub sticking out of the skin. Disgusting, but not dangerous, usually. The biggest danger the human botfly poses is infection, because when you see a grub sticking out of your skin, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to try to pull it out. That's a mistake, because while the body breaks off and the grub dies, the head and jaws attaching it to the body stay in place. That becomes a vector for potentially deadly infection. The best way to safely remove a botfly larva without medication or professional help? To suffocate it with a coating of petroleum jelly. After a day, it can be removed with tweezers. It makes sense that Australia would have deadly parasites, and the next one adds a killer kick to a common pest. Number 3. Australian Paralysis Tick Ticks are common parasites jumping from animal to human and sucking blood. While they're usually easy to remove with tweezers because they stay on the outside of the body, their main threat is a vector for deadly disease, including the potentially lethal Lyme disease. But one tick down under poses a bigger threat, one that can kill quickly. Not only can it cause allergic reactions, but it secretes a toxin that can cause neuromuscular function to fail. Within 8 to 12 hours of injection, paralysis can set in and even cause respiratory failure if it's allowed to progress. While these reactions aren't common, with only about 20 fatalities reported in Australia, this tick is one of Australia's most feared animals. And in the land of the bird-eating spiders, that's saying something. The penultimate parasite is invisible and deadly. Number 2. Brain-Eating Amoeba Not a true amoeba, but a tiny shape-shifting organism, this microscopic bacteria-eater lives in bodies of warm, fresh water. This means that it can be lurking anywhere people want to take a dip – rivers, lakes, wells, or even swimming pools that aren't treated with enough chlorine. While it doesn't function like other parasites and feed on humans long term, this organism has one major impact on humans. It causes a rare but almost invariably fatal brain infection that can kill a healthy person in days, and it's shown up in the happiest place on Earth. 
One of the earliest cases that brought this parasite to the public's attention was when a young boy died of the infection after swimming at Disney's River Country Water Park. The parasite enters through the nasal cavity, usually when swimming but occasionally through rinsing out the sinuses. It travels to the brain where it changes up its usual diet of bacteria and starts eating the brain's astrocytes and neurons. Symptoms appear an average of five days, and by then it's usually too late. While this parasite can't be spread between humans, it soon results in headaches, nausea, a stiff neck, decreasing brain function, seizures, and eventually death. But no parasite causes as much death as our number one. Number one, Malaria Plasmodium. When you think about the deadly disease malaria, you probably think about mosquitoes. These biting pests do spread the disease, but the actual cause of malaria is a single-celled parasite called Plasmodium. These protozoans enter the body through the mosquito's saliva, and they infect red blood cells. The cells swell and burst, infecting the bloodstream, thus spreading to mosquitoes when they bite a host containing the virus. This makes it one of the fastest spreading parasitic infections in the world, affecting up to 600 million people a year and things can get bad for the unfortunate victims. Malaria starts with simple symptoms including fever and chills, but in some cases evolve into something deadly. Vomiting and severe sweating turn to anemia, seizures, and possible damage to the blood's vital organs and bloodstream. This can cause the victims to slip into a coma, suffer serious neurological issues, and potentially die. Several hundred thousand people die of malaria each year, most in the global south. And while no vaccine is available, treatments are available to lessen the severity of symptoms. The challenge is to outrace the fast-spreading parasite, which spreads as quickly as the mosquito flies. This video was made possible by Wix. If you're ready to create a website, head over to wix.com go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. If someone asked you what the most dangerous animals in the world were, we're willing to bet you could rattle off a quick top 10. But what about the most painful animals in the world? We're talking the most painful bites, stings, and stabs in the animal kingdom. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographics Show. Today we're going to take a look at the top 10 most painful animal attacks you could ever endure. At number 10 is one of the world's deadliest animals. It is 100 times more deadly than sharks. Ranging from Asia to America, the crocodile claims on average about 1,000 victims every year versus just 10 by sharks. And while it would be excruciatingly painful to be chomped on by a big great white shark, a crocodile attack is exponentially more painful because of the crocodile's unique physiology. That's because unlike sharks and most other animals, crocodiles can't really chew. Instead, they're forced to tear chunks of meat from their prey and gobble them up in entire bites. They do this by the dreaded death roll, where a crocodile latches onto prey and begins to violently roll in the water. Crocodiles have the strongest bite force in the world. Once the crocodile is latched on, absolutely nothing will pry it loose, and the twisting motion of the croc's body ends up tearing loose entire chunks of flesh. Eyewitnesses to crocodile attacks describe seeing the victims torn to pieces one roll at a time. 9. At number 9 is an Australian native whose bite is venomous but not deadly to humans. The yellow-faced whip snake is an agile and fast predator that preys primarily on frogs, small lizards, and lizard eggs. Unlike most snakes, the yellow-faced whip snake is fast enough to even catch lizards at a full run. Its bite is venomous, as the bites of most snakes are, but it is not particularly dangerous to humans. However, victims have described the pain as an intense and incredible burning sensation that creeps up the extremities. Bites can also cause extreme localized swelling and repeated exposure to yellow-faced whip snake venom makes each subsequent bite even more painful. 8. At number 8 is a creature whose malice isn't exactly an attack, but more of a total infestation. The Ascariasis roundworm, the parasitic worm that lives in the intestines of wild animals and about 10% of the developing world's human population. People can become infected via the ingestion of Ascariasis eggs found in feces or soil contaminated by feces. Once swallowed, the eggs hatch inside of your intestine and the young larvae enter your bloodstream until they make their way to your lungs to continue their development. Once fully mature, the worms then leave your lungs and make their way to your throat, at which point you will either cough up or swallow the worms lodged in your throat. Those that are swallowed make their way back into your intestine, where they'll mate and lay more eggs, some of which will hatch while others will exit through your feces. It's disgusting, but that doesn't compare to the excruciating pain caused by a total infestation of Ascariasis, which can see the worms multiply to such numbers that they cause a blockage of the intestine's liver 
liver and pancreas. These blockages can not only lead to sepsis, but also create horrific stomach cramping and pain. 7. At number 7 is a miniature terror with one of the most painful bites of all insects. The assassin bug makes its home across the bottom two-thirds of the continental United States. While most bloodsuckers inject their victims with local anesthetics so they never even realize they're being bit, the assassin bug makes its presence known with a red-hot, painful bite compared to burning coals. As if that wasn't enough, about 60% of all assassin bugs carry Chagas disease, a parasitic disease that is spread via their feces. Causing heart failure and enlarged organs, Chagas disease is incurable, and if symptoms aren't managed, it is deadly. 6. At number 6 is another snake, though this time of a far deadlier variety. The infamous black mamba snake makes its home across Africa, and it has a bite so deadly it can kill an adult human being in a half hour if untreated, with a fatality rate of 100%. The black mamba's neurotoxic venom attacks the nervous system by destroying the chemicals needed to transmit signals between nerve cells. This leads to a paralyzing effect and can quickly shut down the lungs and heart. Survivors often describe feeling as if their blood was on fire and with the pain radiating from the bite and expanding across their entire body. 5. At number 5 is an arachnid from down under. Australia's red-backed spider makes its home anywhere humans live, hiding out under floorboards, bookshelves, and in flower pots. Identified by a red or orange strip on top of their abdomen, they bear a striking resemblance to the American black widow spider but are a fraction of the size. Barely larger than a match head, the redback spider nevertheless packs one of the most painful bites of all spiders. Extremely venomous, bites from a redback spider can be lethal for small children. They cause extreme pain in the affected area, followed by a loss of coordination, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes even convulsions. Luckily, only half of the population is a danger to humans, with a male's fangs being too small to penetrate human skin. Unluckily, though, the larger females fully capable of penetrating human skin are also extremely aggressive and will not hesitate to attack anybody that strays into their webs. 4. At number 4 is a distant relative of man's best friend. The hyena is a notorious pack killer, given a very wide berth by most Africans. While most predatory animals ensure a victim is dead before beginning to eat it in order to prevent injury to themselves by struggling prey, hyenas show no such compulsion. Observed eating crippled animals alive, hyenas don't bother making sure their prey is dead before beginning a feast. They're all too happy to settle down and start tearing pieces of flesh with their powerful jaws the moment they've overpowered an animal. Known for attacking sleeping campers in the bush, hyenas will often bite people's faces and eat the soft tissue of the nose, mouth, breasts, and groin, eventually moving to the stomach and intestines. Victims typically take minutes to die from blood loss, though one hopes shock sets in long before that. 3. At number 3 is one of the world's most unassuming and deadliest animals. Another native of Africa, the hippopotamus is extremely aggressive and territorial, killing 500 people a year. Weighing in at 3 tons, they are also surprisingly fast animals, achieving speeds of up to 18 miles per hour. Hippos routinely attack swimmers, canoes, and even speedboats that stray too close. With their massive jaws and 6-inch long teeth, they have been known to bite people in half with just one bite. Their hyper-aggressiveness often sees them continue to maul victims long after they're dead, trampling them underfoot and even biting limbs off. In one particularly gruesome attack in 2014, a hippo upended a boat transporting a group of 12 children and one adult, killing all of them. 2. At number 2 is a bottom-dwelling fish from the West Pacific. The infamous stonefish is perfectly camouflaged to look like, well, a stone, leading many hapless swimmers to accidentally step on one. The stonefish is an ambush predator, and its venom is delivered via its 13 dorsal spines and serves only as a protective measure. When a swimmer accidentally steps on one, each spine can shoot several ounces of potent venom deep into tissues of the stonefish's victim. Untreated, a stonefish sting can be fatal to an adult human within an hour. But even if treated, the pain will last far, far longer than that. 
Victims describe how the pain at first feels like a hot torch lit directly under your foot. The burning sensation then moves up the entire length of your body over the course of hours as the venom courses through your blood, and it's followed by a feeling like a sledgehammer pounding your limbs every 10 seconds. If that doesn't sound bad enough, there's also the fact that the pain can last for days. 1. At number 1 is hands down the most deadly creature in the ocean. None are more feared than the Irukandji jellyfish, which ranges in size from several feet to a few inches. The initial sting reportedly feels like a little less than a mosquito bite and is typically ignored by victims. However, within 30 minutes, symptoms begin to set in, including severe headaches, back, muscle, chest, and abdominal pain with intense cramping. Nausea, vomiting, sweating, anxiety, and hypertension quickly follow. Perhaps the most curious symptom of all is a feeling of impending doom. With victims so certain that they are facing death, they beg doctors to kill them. If properly treated, most symptoms go away within hours, but people with particular sensitivity can experience symptoms that last for up to two weeks, during which victims describe pain so intense that even powerful narcotic painkillers have little effect. When even morphine doesn't cut it, it's a little hard to blame victims for feeling like they're going to die. Its stinger is 6.25 millimeters, or about a quarter of an inch in length. That's not very long considering the Asian giant hornet, Vespa mandarina and its varieties, such as the Japanese giant hornet, Vespa mandarina japonica, are the largest hornet species in the world. Asian giant hornet queens are generally around 2 inches or larger, while workers and drones are between 1.6 and 1.8 inches, and their wingspan is generally around 3 inches. All of this is very interesting, but you probably don't care since you're howling in agony from the sting you've just received. Is a white hot pain shooting up your arm? That's par for the course. Asian giant hornets have one of the most painful stings in the world. One Japanese entomologist likened the sting to his leg being hammered with a heated nail. Do you feel dizzy? Blood rushing through your ears? No? Don't roll around on the floor. Panicking won't help, it just disperses the venom through your bloodstream faster. Sit here on the couch. You may be experiencing mild shock. Does your throat feel scratchy? Is it hard to breathe? No? Uh, that's really good. If your throat's closing up and you can't breathe, you're allergic to the venom and going into anaphylactic shock. We'd need to give you an epinephrine injection and get you to a hospital as soon as possible. You should probably still get checked out by a doctor, even if you don't have an allergic reaction. But it's less urgent. Did you know that rather than dying from the venom, the majority of the deaths that occur from Asian giant hornets are either due to an allergic reaction or cardiac arrest? Don't get me wrong, this hornet's venom is very potent and damages the human nervous system. In rare cases, receiving many stings can kill a victim through multiple organ failure. No, don't get up, stay there on the couch. Let me get you some water. I'll grab a marker too so we can track how badly you're swelling. I need you to hold out your arm. Hey, hey, crying is no big deal. No shame, it's a natural reaction when we get hurt. Deep breaths, I'm only drawing a few dots with the marker, I promise I'll be gentle, a few around the puncture wound, and then a few more around where the swelling is now. Wow, it's only been a couple of minutes since you were stung and I can't believe how much that bump is swelling. I brought an ice pack for you too. You can hold it on the sting area for 15 minutes. Give your arm a break for at least 5 minutes before applying the ice pack again. That should help with the hot feeling in your arm. Sorry about the numbness, it'll go away. Eventually. Anyway, back to the pain. There's this crazy but brilliant entomologist, Justin O. Schmidt, who created the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. Basically, he went around allowing himself to be stung by various insects as a way to categorize and compare their stings. During his research, he was stung by 78 insects. Where does the Asian giant hornet rate on Schmidt's pain scale? Actually, it doesn't. Not officially, anyway. Schmidt was never stung by an Asian giant hornet, so he didn't rate it. Other people who have also gone around being stung, seriously, I can't believe what people do for fun these days, say that the Asian giant hornet would be high on the Schmidt pain index, perhaps even scoring the highest rating, a 4. Another insect who also rated a 4 is the bullet ant, which Schmidt described as like walking over flaming charcoal with a 3-inch nail embedded in your heel. Then there's the warrior wasp. Schmidt referred to it as torture. You are chained in the flow of an active volcano. Why did I start this list? Oh, my bad. I thought hearing about the pain scale would make you understand how brave you're being right now. Okay, let's talk about something else. You actually got off quite lucky, and you should be thankful that you were only stung once by a single hornet. Unlike a bee, an Asian giant hornet can sting multiple times without dying. Also, they can release a pheromone to attract other hornets. Yeah, that's right. They call their family to come get in on the action. Gives a new meaning to bringing the pain, eh? <laughs>
Anyway, I know you don't feel lucky, but it could have been so much worse. In 2013, in the Shanxi province of central China, there was a high rainfall which produced a lot of vegetation, and as a result, there were also bigger than normal swarms of giant Asian hornets. Over the course of the summer, the swarms killed 42 people and injured another 1,675 in three different cities. Among those attacked, 206 had to receive treatment in hospitals, including dialysis, to help remove the venom and poison from their kidneys. Some of the victims were stung upwards of 30 to 40 times, which means they received about a teaspoon of venom, experienced paralysis, and organ failure. Right, right, I get it, you don't want to hear about death or illness from hornets right now, but you've made it past the crucial 15 minutes with no severe reaction. You're not going to die. Ok, ok, I'll move on to a new topic. I can't believe you ran all the way back to the house after being stung. You should never run from a swarm of Asian giant hornets. They're known to chase people at around 600 feet or about one and a half soccer fields. Next time you're not in a place where you can easily get inside, your best bet is to stand still and let the swarm pass by. Sure, some of them will crawl on you and you'll probably get a few stings, but if you run, you're more likely to be stung more. They can fly up to 25 miles an hour and also go 60 miles in a day. I hear you, there isn't going to be a next time when you get stung, got it. But just in case, trust me, the best thing you can do is stay still until the swarm moves on. Ok, so you were just sitting outside quietly drinking coffee and looking at your phone when the hornet stung you? Bummer! Bad luck, I guess. While Asian giant hornets can be territorial and sometimes aggressive, especially during mating season, they don't intentionally seek humans out. However, they can be attracted to sweet smells, alcohol, and human sweat. Asian giant hornets actually tend to like rural areas such as lowland forests. They prefer to nest in trees or holes in the ground, such as those created by tunneling animals. But I guess they nest under buildings and in garages too. They build nests that are about the size and shape of a basketball. And frankly, you're looking pretty good right now. Yeah, I know your face is swollen, but that's probably mainly from crying. By now, the venom delivered in the sting is attacking your nervous system. It contains a mandara toxin. It's also attacking your red blood cells and tissues. In a couple hours, your puncture wound's gonna turn black because of necrosis. You'll probably end up with a gnarly little scar there. No, don't scratch the wound. I, I know it's really itchy, but the bacteria under your fingernails just makes things worse. We should put some antibacterial anti-itch cream on the sting area. Also, you can take an over-the-counter painkiller, such as aspirin, but scratching or squeezing the puncture site is definitely a no-no. If you think Asian giant hornets are bad for humans, they're the stuff of nightmares for honeybees. Asian giant hornets eat other insects, their favorite being the honeybee. A hornet scout will fly around and locate a honeybee hive. Then it sprays pheromones to attract its comrades. When a swarm of hornets shows up, the mayhem begins. The hornets murder the honeybees using their enormous mandibles to rip off honeybee heads and legs. A single hornet can decimate about 20 victims a minute. A swarm of around 30 hornets can take out a colony of 30,000 honeybees in a few hours. The honeybees try to fight back by stinging, but their stingers can't pierce the hornet's hard shell. Japanese honeybees have developed another defense against the Japanese giant hornet though, the bee ball. When a hornet scout investigates a hive, the honeybees will surround the intruder and vibrate. The kinetic energy generated can grow hot enough to slowly roast the hornet alive. The heating is very precise too. Japanese giant hornets can withstand heat up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and the bee balls can reach 117 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just shy of 118 degrees Fahrenheit that the bees themselves can stand. And in case the heat doesn't kill the hornet, all the same time the crowding bees constrict the hornet and carbon dioxide grows inside the ball. Hornets, in fact all insects, have an open circulatory system, and the bee crowding makes it hard for the hornet to pump blood through its body, which also affects its ability to regulate its temperature. If the hornet scout dies, this prevents the coordinates of the hive from getting out to other hornets. Sure, some worker bees die from the scout attacking them or of being crushed or asphyxiated by the bee ball, but the hive is saved. It's not weird that I know so much about Asian giant hornets. It's taking your mind off the pain, isn't it? So if Japanese giant hornets massacre all the worker bees in a hive, they steal the larvae and they take them back to their nest. If they can't move all the honeybee larvae in one trip, they'll leave hornets behind to guard the hive while they shuttle back and forth. Adult workers then chew the bee larvae into a nutritious paste and feed it to the hornet larvae. The Japanese giant hornet larvae regurgitate a concoction which contains 17 amino acids and serves as a powerful energy drink to be consumed by adult hornets who cannot digest solid protein. This is where hornets get their strength to be able to fly up to 60 miles in a day. As you can imagine, this macabre harvesting kills a lot of honeybees. In a breeding season, each Asian giant hornet hive produces an average of 1,000 to 2,000 offspring. 
Hey, when you're feeling better, we should go get some of the Hornet-based energy drinks. After discovering the Hornet's recipe for energy, scientists began producing a synthetic version known as VAM or Vespa Amino Acid Mixture. It's used in sports drinks and as a nutritional energy supplement for athletes. Allegedly, VAM boosts metabolism and burns fat while providing a little extra stamina. A few scientific studies have shown that VAM does increase oxygen intake and burn fat in older women. Other studies have shown that it did better than water to increase the stamina of mice who did swimming exercises. However, in both studies, the sample size was pretty small. As of yet, there's no conclusive scientific proof that VAM-infused products do any good. However, some professional athletes swear by them, including some Japanese Olympic runners. Currently, VAM isn't banned by international sports doping rules. Actually, you can totally get revenge by eating your enemy. There are a couple of dishes that are made with hornets. People eat them fried as snacks. Sorry the thought of eating bugs is so weird for you, they're sustainable and a great source of protein, and I won't mention the other hornet-based dishes, but in case you were wondering, cooking venom denatures it, making the hornet safe to consume. Well, I think your arm isn't going to swell any further. Yeah, I see your whole forearm stiff, the puncture wound's starting to turn purple, but you're looking good, you're breathing normally and you're totally lucid. Once again, it could have been so much worse. It looks like you're getting tired, so why don't you take a nap? Holler if you need anything, I'm going to go read up on VAM. I have an idea for a real money maker, VAM infused ice cream. It boosts your metabolism and helps you burn fat while you eat it. From having a giant needle plunged into your spine to getting your skin ripped off over and over again, these are the 15 most painful medical procedures someone can possibly go through. The crazy thing is, some of them are not all that uncommon. Number 15. The first procedure on our list is a type of elective surgery. This means people choose to go through the pain of having it done. Liposuction involves removing fat from the body. This may be done for a couple of reasons. Some people want to change the way they look and feel, so they decide that certain areas of their bodies need to be reshaped. Many people who decide to get liposuction have the fat removed from under the arms or around the thighs. Regardless of where the procedure is occurring, the fat needs to get sucked from the body and this is going to hurt a lot. The procedure itself starts with a needle being inserted into the area where the liposuction will take place. The problem with this is that people who get lipo often want to remove fat from sensitive areas of the body. This means before the actual procedure even begins, the patient will be in discomfort. The first step of the procedure is that a needle filled with saline solution to help fluids and fats solidify in the region is stuck into the body. After this happens, the doctor squeezes a tube under the skin and literally sucks out the fat. Depending on the location and amount of fat that needs to be removed, the whole process can take several hours. Most liposuction patients are given local anesthesia anesthesia, meaning they will remain awake for the entire procedure. But if the tube is not in the right position or the doctor is sloppy, the pain can be excruciating as tissues connected to the fat are also sucked out. Even if all goes well, after the procedure is complete, the area of your body that was operated on will bruise and be tender from the violence of having your insides hoovered out, so the pain will continue for several more days. If blood or needles makes you squeamish, this next procedure will probably freak you out. Number 14. Arterial blood gas tests require a medical professional to extract blood from an artery using a syringe. The main difference between this procedure and what happens when you donate blood is the location where the fluid needs to come from. Normally, blood is taken from your veins, but since this test is often used to measure the amount of oxygen in your blood, the needle needs to be stuck into an artery. The most common location for blood to be taken during arterial blood gas tests is from the wrist, but sometimes it needs to be extracted from an artery near the groin or the inside of the arm. Since artery tend to be slightly further under the skin, the needle needs to puncture deeper into the body than typical blood draw. The deeper the needle goes, the more painful the experience. The other part of an arterial blood gas test that makes it so uncomfortable is that the amount of blood needed to make an accurate assessment means the procedure can take a while. So if you think a normal blood draw is painful, imagine having to sit through several minutes of a large bore needle buried two inches into your groin. Like needles, how about needles and drills in your mouth? Number 13. Having dental work done is rarely pleasant, but there is one oral procedure that hurts more than all the rest. Dental implants that are given to patients who need a part or entire tooth replaced. In order for the fake tooth to function properly and stay in position, the doctor needs to drill deep into the gums similar to a root canal. Then metal rods are screwed into the tissue and jawbone to keep the fake tooth in place. Unfortunately, this isn't the only painful part of the procedure. Oftentimes, a damaged tooth or root system needs to be removed first, which can be excruciating 
once the Novocaine wears off. Next, the jawbone may need to be grafted to ensure the implant remains secured and resistant to other complications. During each dental implant operation, a needle will puncture the mouth to deliver an anesthetic, but before the drug kicks in, the patient will definitely feel a sharp prick. After that, the actual procedure can begin. These steps typically happen over the course of several visits, which means after each one, the mouth will ache. When the implant is secured and the anesthetic wears off, there's often a painful throbbing in the patient's gums and jaw. This is especially true when they need to eat, and although the patient can probably sustain themselves on a liquid or smoothie diet for a while, eventually they will need to go back to eating solid food. As the bone regrows around the implant and the nerves are repaired in the area, every bite after getting dental implants will be painful until the mouth is fully healed. The healing time can vary, but tends to take a week or two to recover completely. Our next spot involves extreme cutting and tearing in the most sensitive part of the body. Number 12. You probably have never heard of a myomectomy, but it can be an incredibly painful procedure that women sometimes need to have done. The surgery takes place in the uterus when fibroids need to be removed. Fibroids are non-cancerous growths that can cause discomfort and bleeding in the uterus. The specific methods of the operation to remove these growths vary, but since access to the uterus is required, the doctor needs to get inside of the sex organ. Normally, this is done by cutting into the abdomen. Once inside the reproductive system, the doctor will need to cut up the fibroids and remove them from the body. It should come as no surprise that cutting up growths within the uterus can be painful, but even worse is that oftentimes there are multiple fibroids that need to be removed. This means that each one needs to be sliced up and extracted. The patient can be put under general anesthesia or given local anesthesia depending on the number of fibroids, how big they are, and where they're located. However, the real pain begins when the anesthetic wears off. It is at this point that the patient will feel each cut and tear made into her reproductive system. As the body heals, there will likely be bleeding and some cramping in the region, along with constant pain. From start to finish, a myomectomy is a very painful procedure. Next, imagine having an entire bone cut out of your body. Number 11. Having a hip replaced is normally a procedure reserved for someone who is in excruciating pain due to arthritis or degeneration of the hip bone. This means having a hip replaced should alleviate pain, but unfortunately, the surgery itself can oftentimes increase the pain exponentially until the hip is fully healed. Open hip surgery can take up to three hours to complete. The hip is not a small bone, which means the incision to gain access and replace it is larger than in most surgeries. After the skin and muscle is cut away from the hip, the bone itself needs to be removed. All of the damaged bone must be replaced Placed by artificial materials. Depending on how much damage and degradation there is to the hip, a significant amount of bone might need to be removed. The pain associated with having parts of a bone cut off and then a prosthetic reattached can be extreme. The doctor may also need to smooth out the socket where the hip rests so it can rotate freely. This is done by the doctor taking what looks like an electric sander to the patient's bone and buffing it out. Again, this would not feel very good. Thankfully, the patient is asleep for the whole procedure. However, the recovery time for hip replacement surgery is long. It can take somewhere between 6 and 12 months for the patient to fully recover, and during this time, their replacement hip will ache and feel strained. Although the prosthetic is not technically part of the body, nerves, tissue, and muscle will regrow around it. As this happens, the body is literally rebuilding the connection severed and the damage done during the surgery. After months of physical therapy, the pain will lessen, but for those first several months as the body heals and gets used to the prosthetic hip, the patient will be in a lot of pain. Our next procedure is embarrassing, but also excruciating. Number 10. Hemorrhoids can definitely be painful, but the surgery to remove them can be even worse. This type of procedure is called a hemorrhoidectomy. It is done to remove infected tissue in the anal canal. This is much different from being probed or getting a colonoscopy. The doctor literally has to tear away tissue in the rectum to stop excessive bleeding. Hemorrhoids themselves are swollen veins similar to varicose veins, but located in the anus. This is where the whole procedure will take place, which means that it's not only painful but can be extremely uncomfortable. Unfortunately, in some situations, the Hemorrhoids need to be stapled to block the blood flow in the region. This means that the veins in a patient's rectum might not only be sliced apart, but staples might need to be inserted into anal tissue. And for anyone who's ever accidentally stapled their finger, imagine that feeling happening to your anus. Next, we're going to be ripping flesh off from one part of the body and reattaching it elsewhere. Number 9. A skin graft is a procedure where a piece of skin from one area of the body is cut off and transplanted onto another part of the body. This is sometimes done with burn victims or after a major surgery that has damaged a lot of skin tissue. However, the procedure itself is not the only painful part of the skin graft. Maintaining the cleanliness of where the new skin is attached can be easier said than done. Bandages need to be constantly replaced, and if not done properly, there can be some nasty side effects. Since the patient is under general anesthesia and asleep when the actual procedure is happening, the pain doesn't occur until after 
after they wake up. It is then that there will be two major areas of the body that will hurt. The first will be where the skin was removed from, and the second is the location where it's been stitched back on. However, it's the recovery process that really begins to take its toll on the pain receptors of the body. There is a chance the graft won't take, and the body will attack or destroy the skin that was surgically implanted. In this case, there would be pain from the immune system trying to destroy the skin. Skin grafts can also become infected, meaning that the transplant might inflame, and the area could feel as if it were slowly burning. One of the most painful parts of a skin graft is when the bandages covering the operation site need to be cleaned or replaced. As the bandage is removed, there might be dried blood or pus that's connected it to the skin graft. If the bandage needs to be ripped off, some of the skin could go with it, causing pain to shoot through the area. Then, the cleaning agent to prevent the infection will get under the skin and activate the pain receptors, which just adds insult to injury. The worst part of the skin graft is that if the body rejects it or it does not heal properly, the patient may need to go through the procedure all over again. The next procedure is something most of you will have to endure sooner or later. Number 8. A lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap, can be a painful procedure. It consists of a doctor sticking a very large needle between the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae in the back. The thought of a sharp needle being stuck through your skin and into your spinal cord is definitely a nerve-wracking one. The doctor then uses the syringe to suck cerebral spinal fluid from the subarachnoid space in the spine. The needle is not supposed to come into contact with any nerves or the spinal column itself. But accidents happen, and if the needle manages to tear through any bone or tissue, the pain will be excruciating. Regardless, even if the procedure goes 100% according to plan, the doctor will need to take somewhere between 5 and 20 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid from the body. This means that the needle will be in the patient's back for a decent amount of time. And remember, this isn't just a pinprick. The needle has to be long enough to penetrate the skin, muscle, and slip its way into the spinal column. Most of the time, with a skilled physician, the patient will only feel a slight pressure in the lower back during a spinal tap. However, many patients also report feeling a searing pain, like a gigantic bee sting shooting up their spine. When this intense pain occurs, the first reaction of the body is to move and get away from whatever is hurting it. But this can cause even more pain during the procedure. If the patient moves unexpectedly, it could cause the needle to go into the nerves or scrape against the bones in the spinal column. In this scenario, there would be no escaping the pain. It would be intense and unrelenting. Nothing quite beats the pain of having organs ripped out of your body, though. Number 7. Gallbladder removal, or cholecystectomy, is when the organ responsible for collecting and storing bile is removed from the body. When the gallbladder is not working properly, it can cause a lot of problems and pain. Patients have reported feeling intense discomfort immediately upon waking up from the surgery. Considering they were just hacked into and had an organ carefully cut free of its blood vessels and other connected tissue, extreme pain isn't unsurprising. In open cholecystectomy, the surgeon creates several incisions, the largest of which is about 6 inches long. The procedure is done if someone needs to have gallstones removed removed from the gallbladder or to alleviate other problems that might be causing intense discomfort. In order for the gallbladder to be removed, it must first be separated from the liver and the small intestine. Although someone can live without a gallbladder, having it removed hurts a lot. The recovery time from the operation can last from just over a week to several weeks. After the body begins to heal, the pain subsides for many people. But just after the surgery, patients find that a lot of painkillers are needed to get through the first few days of recovery. Our next procedure involved stretching the most sensitive of body parts to extraordinary proportions. Number 6. Although not technically a surgery, the next procedure is probably the most common painful experience women go through in hospitals. There is no event in life that can cause as much joy and pain as childbirth. If the baby is born vaginally, the mother is in for a lot of suffering. However, in emergency situations, the baby may be extracted via a C-section. This is typically less painful, but the hours of labor beforehand will be filled with discomfort regardless of what type of birth the mother goes through. For women who give birth vaginally, it's like pushing a long watermelon out of their reproductive tract. Just to be clear, the birth canal is not the size of a watermelon, which means as the baby is pushed out of the body, it is forcing the opening to become larger and larger, pushing anything out of your body that isn't urine or fecal matter is going to be painful. This is why any other type of pain can rarely come close to the pain felt during childbirth. But that's not the most painful thing a woman can experience with her reproductive organs. Number 5. An abdominal hysterectomy is a procedure used to literally scoop out part of the female's reproductive system. That's right, this surgery takes the entire uterus out of the patient's body. It's probably pretty obvious that having an entire organ removed would be painful, and if that organ is part of the reproductive system, it comes with an increased amount of pain. In order to remove the uterus, the doctor needs to cut open the abdomen and separate the organ from the rest of the reproductive system. Unfortunately, the uterus is connected to a lot of different structures, including ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the upper vagina. 
The blood vessels, ligaments, and connective tissue that support the organ also need to be severed in order to remove it. After all the cuts and punctures to the reproductive system, the uterus can finally be extracted and the patient can be stitched up. Even after the surgery, there will be bleeding from the vagina, and the pain of having the organ removed will be intense. The recovery time varies, but can take several weeks, all of which will be agonizing. The next spot on the list involves removing even larger amounts of organ from the body. Number 4. Similar to a hysterectomy, a proctocolectomy removes organs from the body. In this procedure, part of the large intestine, rectum, and anal canal are taken out of the patient. The surgery might be done to combat ulcerative colitis, bowel cancer, and some forms of Crohn's disease. In order to reach the organs that need to be removed, the doctor needs to cut open the patient's abdomen and separate the structures using surgical tools. Depending on the needs of the patient, the entire colon must be cut out. After the necessary parts are removed, the surgeon will reattach what remains. This means that after a proctocolectomy, colectomy, things can get very messy. Patients need to be monitored to ensure they can have healthy bowel movements. At first, their stool will most likely be filled with blood, and every poop will be painful. Therefore, patients who go through the procedure don't eat solid food until the excretory system has had time to heal. Even still, going to the bathroom after a proctocolectomy can be just as painful as the surgery itself until the body fully heals. Now we're up in the top three most painful medical procedures, and this next procedure will make just standing up excruciating. Number 3. Open reduction internal fixation of the calcaneus is the fancy medical way to say surgery of the heel bone. Regardless of what you call it, this procedure may be one of the most painful experiences of someone's life. We don't necessarily associate the heel with being a very sensitive part of the body, but for anyone who's ever had a bad fall and shattered their heel, they know nothing could be further from the truth. The heel supports a lot of body weight, which means that it needs to be strong. However, it also means that if it's damaged, a lot of pressure is put on the injured part of the body. And since the bone is meant to be sturdy, repairing a damaged heel comes with a lot of pain. First, the doctor needs to cut through the skin, muscles, and tendons to access the heel bone. This means there's a chance that the nerves in the foot during surgery will be damaged. This will cause immense pain when the patient wakes up. Once the surgeon has a clear path to the bone and sees how bad the fracture is, decisions need to be made. In some cases, the only way to repair the heel is to put metal screws and plates in the foot. Imagine someone twisting a screw screw through your bone to secure a metal plate between broken pieces of it. This would be agonizing. But the worst part isn't over yet. Once the screws and plate have been put in place, the ligaments need to be reattached and the whole foot needs to be sewn up. Upon waking from an open surgery on the heel, patients have reported experiencing the worst pain of their life. And this is all before they start putting weight on it again. After the surgery, the patient will need to go through months of physical therapy where they will be applying pressure to the reconstructed heel. Hopefully, there will be no infections after the surgery as this would cause the patient even more pain. Also, there is a slight chance that the screws and metal plates don't set right, meaning the doctor would need to cut open the foot and reset everything. This would result in the patient having to go through the open reduction internal fixation of the calcaneus surgery for a second time. We mentioned the spinal tap earlier in the list, but there is a procedure that's even more painful than having a needle shoved between your vertebrae. Number 2. There's few things less painful than having your spine fused together. People who have had degenerative diseases that affect the spine often need to have surgery to address the issue. A spinal fusion procedure is used to connect two or more vertebrae together to keep them in place. This procedure could require a bone graft, which in and of itself is notorious for being painful. The physician will take a piece of bone, normally from the hip, leg, or rib, and attach it to one of the vertebrae. The doctor might also realign and connect the spine using metal rods and screws. If this is the case, the pain can be excruciating due to the number of nerves running through this area of the body. The connection of the vertebrae needs to be precise, leaving very little room for error. This means the procedure is slow and meticulous, which is also how recovery will go. Unfortunately, the entire recovery process will not only be long, but agonizing as well. At our number one spot, we have a procedure that's not only excruciating, but will probably lead to even more painful procedures in the future. Number one. The most painful medical procedure might be a bone marrow biopsy. The basic premise of this procedure is to extract marrow, which is the tissue inside of bones. What makes this procedure so painful is that the only way to extract the bone marrow is to pierce through the skin, muscle, and all the way through a bone. Bone marrow biopsies may be done to make sure the body is producing the right amount of blood or to diagnose certain types of cancer such as lymphoma and leukemia. Normally, the doctor will give a patient a local anesthetic, which means they'll be awake for the procedure. But even with the pain dulling drug, the bone biopsy can be torture. The doctor will insert a hollow needle into the patient's body and into their bone. This will send massive amounts of pain signals to the brain. It's the combination of a needle penetrating deep into the body and the destruction of part of a bone that makes the biopsy so painful. Normally, the needle is stuck into the hip bone, so following the procedure there can also be lingering soreness in the region. 
September 1999, a woman is driving home from a birthday party when a drunken high school student plows into her car. With her legs trapped under the dashboard, flames begin to lick her face, and soon much of her body is engulfed. How much did that hurt? This is what one of the first paramedics who arrived on the scene said. She was screaming and wailing, an almost inhuman sound I never heard another person make. So, dying in a burning car is sure to be up there as one hell of a painful death. But as you'll see today, dying isn't always so horrific, even when you get shot, stabbed, or die from a disease. Just so you know, that woman survived. Her name was Jackie Subarido, and she appeared on Oprah in 2003 to talk about her new life. She spent 10 months unconscious after the accident, and when she woke up, she saw that the fire had melted the flesh over much of her body. She died in 2019 from cancer, which is a terrible disease we'll get to later. When it comes to biting the dust in a fire, the best you could hope for is suffocating on the hot gases, which is something that happens to most people who are in fires. If the flames do touch the skin while the person is conscious, the pain is excruciating until they burn through the nerves. That's the painful part, downright excruciatingly painful. That's when you might make a sound that's been described as unholy. For instance, when a woman named Catherine Hayes was burned at the stake in England in 1726 for killing her husband, she was supposed to be strangled first. It didn't quite go right, and an observer remarked that the air was filled with her cries and lamentations. So, dying by burning, not a great way to leave the planet. Also, thankfully, not a very common way to die. The World Health Organization wrote that throughout the globe, around 180,000 people die each year as a result of burns. Burning in a car crash is classified as an accident death, of which there are many forms, but the form we know you're interested in is going down in a hail of bullets, or perhaps succumbing to just one bullet. Imagine the scene. You're walking down the street with a friend and suddenly you hear gunshots. As sometimes happen, you're caught in what's called a crossfire. The next thing you know, you're down on the floor with your buddy clutching your stomach. Thing is, he's crying out in pain and you don't really feel anything. But it is you who's going to die, and he'll be the one to survive to tell the tale. As law enforcement officials have pointed out, when it comes to being shot, you can get hit in a dangerous spot and survive, and hit in a non-lethal spot and die. Also, a slight injury can cause much more pain than a severe injury. It's all about the internal damage and, of course, how fast you get help. For you, you'd feel just like this gunshot survivor said, like a very warm, like liquid is just running down my chest. He said he didn't even feel the impact, he just felt the blood. You're bleeding out, but all you really felt was a thud in your chest as if someone had punched you. It can all happen so fast that the initial hit doesn't really hurt. Although we came across one guy who said he was shot in the genitals, and the pain was apparently excruciating. First there is shock, and then the pain comes in all its glory. The guy who was hit down below was in pain for months. In your case, your friend is rolling around yelping like a dog on fire. That's because he's taken two bullets in two of the worst places when it comes to pain. One in the knee that has shattered his kneecap, aka patella, and one in the foot that smashed some of those little bones in there. If the patella was smashed, it transmits the pain to other parts of the leg, such as the femur, and that's one reason why getting shot there hurts so much. What has happened to you is the bullet has entered your chest, and because of something called the hydrostatic shockwave, much of the tissue inside your chest has been damaged, including your aorta, the largest artery in your body. The mortality rate for being shot in this place is somewhere between 92 and 100 percent. Your death is almost painless and very fast. Here's what one guy said happened to him after being shot, just before he passed out. When the bullet hit me, surprisingly it didn't hurt at all, not one bit, which shocked me. I remember thinking, that felt like someone just chucked a small pedal at me. But he could have easily died despite the lack of pain. When this guy finally came around, he explained stage 2 of his injury like this. The bullet entered my side just above my right hip and traversed diagonally upward and lodged itself just below my left ribcage. Instead of pain, there was a burning, aggravating sensation in my stomach area. There's no universal feeling when you get shot. Survivors talk about feeling numbness, to just having a bizarre feeling, to pins and needles, to a dull ache, to getting hit with a baseball bat or even stung by something. Some of those people said the treatment hurt more than the initial contact, possibly because of the initial kick of adrenaline. If it is indeed a fatal shot and your blood pressure drops catastrophically, you are in more shock than pain. You feel confused, you'll start struggling to keep conscious, and within just a couple of minutes you can be dead. It can be fast, and just be glad that you didn't get shot in the stomach. That is extremely painful as toxins are released into other organs. As the experts say, this kind of ordeal can cause multi-systemic traumatic injury, meaning the bullet inside you can cause all kinds of damage. 
Without treatment, this could lead to peritonitis and deadly sepsis. It would be an awful and exquisitely painful way to die. You can easily die from being shot in the leg if the arteries are damaged. We found a guy who shot himself just above the knee, and the coroner ruled the cause of death was from a buildup of blood around the heart, something called cardiac tamponade. This happened when his iliac arteries were damaged, arteries that provide blood to the pelvic area. We don't know what happened to him, but we do know what happened to a soldier named Nick Lavery after he'd taken a bullet to the leg in Afghanistan. The brave man subsequently put himself on the line of fire to save an infantryman, but despite the movie-like heroics, that one shot was a lot worse than a Hollywood movie might suggest. The guy described as almost indestructible was hit close range by a bullet from a PKM 7.62mm machine gun. The medic later said it couldn't have been much worse since the bullet shattered his femur, a very painful injury and severed his femoral artery. His heart then started pumping large amounts of blood to his leg, and the medic saying he would certainly have died without fast intervention. He still lost his leg above the knee. In US war zones, 90% of preventable deaths are due to uncontrolled bleeding, but if someone is there to stop the hemorrhaging, a person can usually survive. That same medic said sometimes men die from a collapsed lung when people are shot in the chest, something that's highly distressing and painful. Air builds up between the lung and the chest wall, and it keeps building. That's when you might see someone with blood coming out of their mouth. It's enough to shock anyone, especially as breathing is so hard. Then the low oxygen levels, also known as hypoxia, can lead to unconsciousness. Blood loss can lead to shock, and the person can easily die a very horrible death. We found a guy who was shot in his lung and other parts of his body during a burglary. He almost died and said it was the worst experience of his life. In his own words, he said, lying there with a hole in your lungs and liver, with your girlfriend crying over you, lying there uncertain of what just happened, not knowing what to do, not knowing if you're going to die, that part hurts. But that's just it. With so much adrenaline helping him cope, he said the mental anguish of losing his life was worse than the physical pain. Everyone is different, of course, but getting shot in the lung or bleeding out from a shot in the leg is always a terrifying ordeal. If you think dying by someone else's bullet could never happen to you, a paper published in the US National Institutes of Health said, firearm homicide is the second leading cause of injury and death among youth 10 to 24 years of age. That is, in the USA at least. If you were in, say, the UK, things might be different. Since you can't buy guns with the same ease as in many parts of the US, extreme violence is often perpetrated with a knife, but cold, hard blades can be just as deadly. According to a study undertaken by the Perelman School of Medicine, one-third of the patients they studied with bullet wounds died, while only 7.7% of patients with stab wounds died. Many stabbing survivors have talked about their ordeal online, with a lot of those folks saying that they felt like they'd been punched. One of them said, I never felt the actual stabbing, but I heard a girl screaming that he'd stabbed him, and the realization of a warm, wet patch on my then slender tummy. Knives might not seem as dangerous as guns, but it's so easy to have a major artery hit and die from blood loss. If you're unlucky enough to be hit in a major organ, not much can be done to save you. Victims are often in too much of a state of shock to really understand the pain. But as they bleed out, they will start to look very pale. They might also get a headache and feel nauseous. That's what happened to MMA fighter come Major League criminal Lee Murray. This is what he said happened after he got stabbed. Blood was literally flying out of my chest like a yard in front of me. This is how he described the pain. I didn't feel nothing at all. We'll come back to arguably the most painful kind of accidental death later, but let's now discuss what will likely take many of you from this earth, statistically speaking. Imagine, it's just a few years from now and you've got a ringside seat in the metaverse, watching Jake Paul come out of retirement to fight a partially blind 75-year-old former boxer with debilitating arthritis in his hands. The mismatch has made you furious, and since you're incredibly unhealthy, that fury plays havoc on your tender heart. The buildup of plaque in your arteries means you have coronary heart disease. As Paul goes down in the third and starts to cry, you stand up from your chair and scream for joy. You see stars, you become lightheaded, a sudden sharp piercing pain in your chest spreads out across your torso. You, my friend, are having a heart attack, aka myocardial infarction. People have explained the feelings as a fullness in the chest or like someone sitting on your chest. It often comes with pain that's been described as uncomfortable to intense. Britain's NHS writes that some people might not feel much at all, maybe just some dizziness or indigestion. A few people feel no pain at all, although they're often very old or diabetic. Most of the time, this doesn't lead to cardiac arrest, which is a sudden loss of heart function due to electrical disturbance. But with you, it has. Since you're at home and not in the hospital, you have less than a 10% chance of survival. You fall to the ground and die. Game over. That wasn't so painful, was it? 
There are many ways cardiac arrest might happen, not just when you have coronary heart disease. In some very rare cases, a jellyfish sting can lead to cardiac arrest, or perhaps when a person has gone too far with certain drugs. Let's stick with the drugs. In 2021, the CDC wrote, Drug overdose deaths in the U.S. top 100,000 annually. That was more than falls and traffic accidents added together. It's sad to say that drug overdose deaths have been going up and up in the U.S. for years now. The CDC writes that synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl, have led to many of the deaths, as have semi-synthetic opioids and lesser so stimulants, such as methamphetamine and cocaine. With the latter, an overdose could lead to a seizure, stroke, or even a heart attack. But the one thing you've all seen on TV is paramedics slapping people around the face and perhaps giving them a shot of something after they've taken too much of a certain opiate. According to recent media articles, since the beginning of the USA's opioid crisis, there have been over 1 million opioid overdose deaths. So this is really something we can't leave out of the show. What does it feel like? In short, when a person overdoses on heroin, they might look like they're unconscious or very close to it, and in some cases their muscles might spasm. There's also a triad of things going on, which is the loss of consciousness, tiny pupils, and something called respiratory depression. Opioids affect part of the central nervous system associated with breathing. As you know, not breathing is generally not cool for humans. It can lead to something called hypoxia, which means tissues in the body are not getting enough oxygen. The method used to save them is often a shot of opioid receptor antagonist medication that reverses opioid intoxication. This is what one person said about his overdose when he mixed oxycodone with Valium. I was told I instantly slumped over in the car seat with my head very nearly between my legs. Someone asked if I was okay. Apparently, I responded I was fine. Instinct must have taken over. I was asked again, no response. The third time I answered the same, that I was fine. Then I stopped breathing. Another person wrote about her overdose, saying, I got off my bed and started to walk around. Within five seconds, I knew I was in serious trouble. I fell to the ground, my vision started to collapse, I could see, then I couldn't, and this happened in waves. My chest felt very tight, so tight that I couldn't breathe. I was making all sorts of noises trying to breathe. So perhaps not painful, but scary for some. But it's not only drug abusers who die from opioid overdoses. Sometimes people taking the drugs for certain kinds of pain can one day slip over the edge. One of the pains associated with pain relief drugs is cancer, something that happens when your body produces too much abnormal cells and your immune system can't stop reproduction. When the cancer overwhelms vital organs, it can spell the end of your life. You need to know how it might feel dying from it since statistically there's a high chance you'll go this way. Cancer is a tricky one because there are over 100 kinds of it that can affect all parts of the body, and the conditions can give people varying amounts of pain. That's why some cancers are called silent killers because people might not know they have it until it's too late. Studies tell us that 90% of cancer sufferers will experience pain at some point through the crisis, but that pain could be anywhere on the pain scale. For instance, a study undertaken in the Netherlands reported that only one in four cancer sufferers described their pain as intolerable. According to the CDC, in 2019, the most common cancer that killed people in the USA was lung cancer, which was associated with 23% of all cancer deaths. Other common killers were cancers of the colon, the pancreas, the female breast, and the prostate. The problem with lung cancer is that it can indeed be a bit of a silent killer, with many people finding out they have it when it's already progressed. Sometimes the person might have a constant cough or lung infections that come back, sometimes chest pains when the tumor presses on the nerves. They might also feel nothing and be dead in two weeks. A woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer said this about her pain. Initially, I did not have any pain but noticed the lump first. It was 6 centimeters in diameter, so it was big enough to see when I looked in the mirror. But within a week, I was in a lot of pain. It's hard to say how much pain the person will be in, and it's just as hard to say when they'll die. But as time passes, if the cancer cells cannot be beaten, the person can be bedbound, and in the later stage, they might not even be able to talk. If any of you have been at someone's bedside during the final stages, you might have seen that the person wasn't screaming out in pain. In many cases, they just seemed to drift out of life, although pain medications could have been administered at that time. This is usually happening as the person could be at the stage that's called preactive death. This is usually just a week or a few weeks before they die. After that comes active death, which happens in the days and hours before death. In active death, the blood pressure will drop, breathing could become shallow, and the person might not be able to be awoken. At some point, the person will make a sound known as the death rattle, which means it lights out. If you've seen someone in active death, you'll know it's not easy to understand their pain levels since they're only half there. With that in mind, dying can be a very complex process, but it can also just be plain bloody horrible, as you'll now see. 
In 2014, the Washington Post wrote that because of terrorism in part of the Middle East and a subsequent refugee crisis, thousands of people were at risk of dying from an excruciating death. That death was not having food or water. You've all been thirsty before, some of you so thirsty that the water might have seemed like the most wonderful thing the world has on offer. There's good reason for this. It is. As you may know, our bodies are made up of around 60-70% to 70 water, some of which is lost each day from urinating, sweating, and breathing. When you're severely dehydrated, the water in your cells is transferred into the bloodstream, and this makes those cells shrink. When the cells in your brain shrink, that beautiful and complex organ doesn't work very well. This is why people who've gone without water have gone somewhat delirious. Another organ, the kidneys, will start to shut down because of this lack of water. That means they won't do their job of getting rid of all the waste products in the blood. Soon, all the organs in your body will start to shut down. So, with toxic blood and a failing brain, the dehydrated person will eventually fall into a coma. This is why a long time before you get close to that stage, you'll start thinking water is the greatest thing on the planet and you'll almost do anything to get some. Just as the explorer Chaz Powell said, a man who almost died from dehydration. He told the BBC in 2020 that when he was in this state in Africa, he went from being concerned to going half mad. By this point, I was starting to feel really ill, he said. I started to overheat, and my body temperature was just insane. When things get really bad, he started to drink his own urine. But that urine, which is usually 95% water and 5% waste, had more waste in it because he was already dehydrated. It wasn't very good for him at all, but he didn't have any other options. Not long after, an SOS call he had made was answered. He was told the helicopter would get to him in four hours, to which he thought, I don't have four hours. He moved on down a cliff at one point, fainting. He was at risk from kidney failure, delirium, and even having a heart attack because dehydration at its worst can also seriously affect the cardiovascular system. All organs eventually fail if dehydration is not treated. He survived, but had he died, it would have been a really horrible way to go. Needless to say, going without water or food is one of the worst ways to die, both of which at the end lead to multiple organ failure. We can't imagine that something like starving to death could be anything but horrific. This is why during great famines, some people have turned to cannibalism out of sheer desperation. With starvation, your body literally starts eating itself. Once the fat's gone, it starts taking the muscles, and after that, the vital organs are affected in a bad way. It's hard to say just how long it takes because everyone is different. But an article in the British Medical Journal mentioned a bunch of hunger strikers who were stopped somewhere between 21 and 40 days because the people who were starving were on death's door. The cause of death is often disease, since without food the body's immune system can't function properly. This is a very slow death, and while the pain might not be acute, the long process must be extremely difficult. Just to give you a real-world example, one person said this about his lucky escape from starvation. Very painful, very terrible way to go. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. The World Health Organization said throughout the world heart disease is the biggest killer, but in second place it had stroke, so we think we should have a look at that. Stroke kills close to 6 million people in the world every year. It happens when your brain does not get the blood supply it requires, often because of a clot in an artery. And with a lack of oxygen to that brilliant organ, things can go terribly wrong very fast. According to world-stroke.org, around 13 million people every year will have a stroke. But there are a lot of survivors. Unfortunately, many people that will have a stroke are left with profound disabilities, often with affected speech or even paralysis. When the stroke is termed catastrophic, well, the person might lapse into a coma that they never come out of. But what we want to know is, does it hurt dying this way? People who've arrived at the hospital after a stroke are very confused, although they don't usually scream out in pain. They might have slurred speech, the loss of some bodily functions, or they might have a facial droop, but they don't seem to be hurting all that much. Here's an example. A guy named Doug Tapking said he was waiting for his steak in a restaurant in California when things started to get weird. His friends told him he was mumbling. In his own words, he said, My right arm came up without any trouble, but my left arm was limp at my side. So I reached out and grabbed my left arm at my wrist, you know? I kind of pulled it up to my chest level, and I let it go, and it just immediately fell into my lap. At that point, I vividly remember saying to myself, oh crap, I'm having a stroke. But for others, it can indeed be very painful. A woman named Mari Mendenhall said the pain was so intense, it felt like an explosion in her brain. She, like many stroke victims, had some fairly serious disabilities to deal with after. In conclusion, you could die from a stroke and not feel that much pain. Your sweet life could be over before you had much time to think about pain. Now for two more things that come very high on the list of how you might die. They are chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and liver disease. 
These two get a special mention because the death is usually very gradual. They might also be the result of some not-so-great life choices, such as smoking for many years or habitual boozing for breakfast. With both these diseases, the problem is when they're at the most severe stage, they often affect your well-being to the extreme. With COPD, your lung capacity might be so low that it's very hard to breathe. This can also be very painful because it makes the lungs blow up and creates a lot of pressure on the chest wall, as well as the spine and the diaphragm. The son of a man that died from COPD said at one point in time all his energy was spent just trying to breathe. So yes, dying slowly from this might cause significant pain, but close to the end, the person would usually be in hospice and loaded with drugs. As for liver disease, people get non-alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic liver disease. We tend to think of the hardening of the liver, or cirrhosis, happening mostly to people who drink a lot. But the majority of people get it from inherited conditions, obesity, and infection. This is one of the world's biggest killers. It's another one of those silent killers, too, because often people don't feel pain until they have a severe form of cirrhosis. We looked at the British Liver Trust Forum in the UK, and people there said things like, don't read the internet, because you'll end up thinking you'll be dead in a minute. Many of those people said sometimes they had pain where the liver is, but many said they didn't suffer from much pain. But in the end stage, 82% of people will feel pain, usually the chronic kind. Sometimes the liver damage causes fluid retention and that can enlarge the spleen, causing pain in the abdomen. The problem worsens when the toxins from the liver can travel to the brain and cause something called hepatic encephalopathy, which can make people fall, be confused, or even have seizures. That's why the last stage before death can be very unpleasant. Now for some very painful ways to die. More accidents. As you already know, many people around the world die from drug overdoses, although the highest on the list of accidental deaths around the world is traffic accidents, much more so in less developed nations. In the US in 2020, Reuters reported that 38,680 people died in road accidents out of 3,358,814 total deaths. That was with the extra COVID deaths. These are big numbers, and that's why the WHO says there are around 1.3 million deaths from traffic accidents globally. You already know about burning to death, which is one of the leading causes of accidental death in the world, and that can happen in a car crash. But the main reason you might die in a traffic collision is the fact that you suffer severe trauma to a part of your body, especially the head. With a severe traumatic brain injury, you could be dead and not feel a thing. Although, if you die from internal bleeding, there can be severe pain and then shock. This severe trauma can affect any part of the body. And if you've ever seen someone in the hospital after they've been smashed up and broken many bones, well, often they're screaming out for mercy. Sometimes that person could have a complete amputation of a body part, which happens more often with motorcycle accidents. If they're not unconscious, they'll likely be very confused and dizzy. The next stage could be shock, and if that happens, even if the person gets to the emergency room, there's only around a 20-50% to 50 chance of survival. This is how one survivor described his motorcycle accident. He said, I remember tumbling violently, then sliding into the curb's ankle first, then continuing to slide. I tried to get up, but still sliding and ate it again, then continued to slide on my back. He looked down where he stopped and he saw a lot of blood, including what he described as the inside of his ankle. Weird thing is, his other leg hurt much more, even though that was intact. He added, I was conscious during the whole thing, from start till surgery. I had to sit in pain for 10 minutes in an ambulance, 15 minutes for them to get me into the ambulance, and 20 minutes for the hospital. Somebody collected the bit of his leg that was missing and put it in a bag. So little was left that the rest had to be amputated. Amputation can also be a consequence of a car crash when someone's legs are crushed, a feeling described as intensely painful. The femur, sometimes said to be the most painful bone to break, can also be shattered. When you break the strongest bone in your body, you may also cause nerve, tendon, muscle, and ligament damage, and with the bone being so big, you feel a lot more pain. Crushing injuries cause the most extreme pain imaginable, which is why victims are often given ketamine and morphine. And in some cases, this is not enough and these poor victims end up screaming in pain until their untimely death. Such injuries are common in earthquakes, with one in New Zealand mentioned in a research paper as causing severe neuropathic pain after the initial injuries. That's pain related to your nervous system not working right. Still, a young man who survived an earthquake in the US and was lucky to survive said, I thought I was paralyzed, I couldn't feel my legs, I couldn't feel my back. Spinal fractures are very complicated but often come with lots of pain. So, with a traffic accident and accidents that might cause similar injuries, there could be incredibly severe pain right before death. But it might also be over before you know what's happened. The next way to die we think is about as bad as it gets, for a very short time at least. When it comes to accidental deaths around the world, drowning kills a lot of people. 
The WHO reported in 2019 that 236,000 people drowned to death in the entire world. In comparison, the WHO said that same year, there were 684,000 fatal falls globally and close to half a million deaths due to illicit drug use. Smoking kills around 8 million and booze around 3 million, while homicide deaths numbered around 460,000. But let's stick with drowning. There are countless people who've almost died from drowning and every one we looked at had a different take on the pain. There's a misconception that drowning is a peaceful experience, it's harrowing, and when your lungs fill with water, there is certainly pain. When you first swallow the water, you go into what's called fight-or-flight mode. But what happens then is the airways close themselves so more water can't get in. After that, it should take around two minutes for the person to pass out. At this point, they can still be resuscitated. Obviously, the person doesn't know what's going on at that stage. Their heart will begin to slow and they might go into something called hypoxic convulsion, which is a kind of seizure that occurs when the brain is robbed of adequate oxygen flow. Then, when the brain, heart, and lungs are beyond repair, there's death. This should take between 4 and 6 minutes. One person described it like this. Long before that struggle is over, your throat is on fire, agonizingly on fire. Your throat closes up and you start to feel that your lungs couldn't possibly hurt more. This is a kind of torture, although we found quite a few cases of survivors saying when they let go, a kind of peaceful state did occur. One such person said, after some time, things start to get black and you start to feel a sort of peace. Ironically, you stop trying to float and you just let yourself go. We also found a fair bit of data about people seeming to find some kind of peace just before death. According to Scientific American, it's not unusual for people to have a near-death experience and live to tell people they went to a kind of paradise where everything was just perfect. Some see angels, some meet loved ones, some go to distant lands and trip like they've had a big hit of DMT. In fact, a paper published in Frontiers of Psychology said that a near-death experience for some is like a blissful psychedelic experience. Scientists don't really know why, with the paper saying this warrants further investigation. These strange experiences also feel very real. In a paper published in the U.S. National Institutes of Health, just over 1,000 people who had near-death experiences were asked how real their experience felt. 95.6% of people ticked the experience was definitely real box, 4% said probably real, 0.3% said probably not real, and 0.1% said definitely not real. We're all going to die someday, which is scary, but it's also something we might think about now and again so we embrace life right now. There's also a big payoff to death, which is the absence of pain. Let's hope when we go, it's not just blackness we experience at the edge of life, but what this person experienced. I found myself in a meadow, mind cleared, identity intact. The meadow was lit with this glorious radiant light, like no light I've ever seen, and a gentle inner glow shone from each and every plant. This video was made possible by Wix. If you're ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. No pain, no gain, they say. And on that note, we're back again for the third time in this series as we explore avenues and alleyways of physical discomfort. In our quest to discover the most painful human experience you can possibly suffer, you might find yourself, as a passive bystander, feeling a little squeamish. But that's okay, seems you guys can't get enough of it. And we're, as always, happy to oblige here at the Infographic Show. From the potentially fatal sting of the stonefish to the artful execution of the death by a thousand cuts, we explore a world of pain once again, discover the acute delirium of malaria, and the utter horror show of a gonadal torsion. On this episode of the Infographic Show, we'll be looking deep into pain as we share with you the most painful things a human can experience, part 3. In previous episodes, we've explored the pain of stepping on a simple Lego brick and the agony of our arthritic gout. Just imagine if you were to step on a Lego brick while suffering from gout. Hurt much? Well, it should do. That's what we're looking into again, the greatest pains a human can deal with. We've discussed toothache, kidney stones, being burned, and being stung by bullet ants. We've weighed up shingles and spoken about the joys of childbirth. What other pains can a human experience? What excruciating stones, other than kidney stones, have we left unturned? Have we simply exhausted our supply of agonizing experiences? Is the well of throbbing discomfort drained dry? Let's take a look at some of the most fiendishly terrible experiences left known to man. 7. Stonefish Sting Lurking behind the rocks in Indo-Pacific waters, this fish is one of the most venomous aquatic life forms known to mankind. 
Their stone-like camouflage might suit their lifestyle, but it sure hurts like hell when you mistake one of these suckers for a rock. How much pressure you apply while stepping on that aquatic predator equals the volume of venom you'll be awarded for doing so. Should the sting not be fatal, you might wish it had been as you double over in excruciating pain, convulsions, nausea, and vomiting. That's if it doesn't kill you first. 6. Ling Chi Otherwise known as death by a thousand cuts, this Chinese and Vietnamese form of torturous execution is far from a walk in the park. The victim's body is slowly cut into pieces with the intention of keeping the unlucky customer alive for as long as possible in order for them to fully enjoy the ordeal. Think about this next time you complain of an unbearable paper cut. Number 5. Malaria When it comes to tropical diseases, malaria wins hands down in the pain game. A plethora of ailments will overcome the unlucky sufferer. Intense mind-blowing headache, audio and visual hallucinations, delirium, and the will to die are the order of the day here. You'll experience freezing chills one moment and a burning fever the next. If you find yourself lucky enough to be hospitalized, medical staff will apply ice packs to your body one moment and hot water bottles the next in an effort to control the fever. Morphine may or may not be administered to fight the pain caused by this terrible condition. You better hope it is. Number 4. Gonadal Torsion Most men in the infographic house will testify that there's nothing quite as painful as a kick in the nuts. Gonadal torsion is taking a kick to the balls to a whole new level. This is the big boss of wedgies, if you will. This overwhelmingly painful experience can apply both to the testes in the man or the ovaries in the woman. Torsion involves the twisting of the gonads or respective female reproductive glands to such an extent that blood supply is cut off. Often, surgery is required to save the offended gonad. When this medical emergency strikes, act fast. Common in children, acute scrotal swelling often foretells a gonadal torsion medical emergency and may result in the removal of said gonad, so act fast if your gonads become torn. Number 3. Durkham's Disease this rare condition is no picnic by any stretch of the imagination. A number of painful tumors develop on the body, and these areas are so extremely sensitive that taking a shower is like being assaulted with a series of battering rams. The reason why this condition appears isn't quite clear yet, but you'd be extremely unlucky to suffer from it. Some experts postulate that it arises from a mutated fat gene that's passed down through generations. Others believe it's caused by a malfunction in the immune system. Others still insist that it's God's way of saying that he doesn't like you. Fatty tissue appears all over the body and cause terrible discomfort wherever the nerves are pressed. So it's one of those okay as long as you don't move kind of pains. 2. Complex Regional Pain Disorder Imagine your pain receptors went haywire, causing extreme swelling and pain in an isolated part of your body. This gets worse over time and there is no cure. Sometimes the only remedy is to amputate the affected region. Experts reckon that CRPS hits as a result of central nervous dysfunction and is most common in people around the ages of 40. There's no cure, and often the only medical contingency is to remove the offending limb or body part, or else experience a lifetime of acute pain and suffering. It really sucks to have this. Number 1. Penile Fracture Far worse than the old foreskin in the zipper toilet malfunction, this dilemma can cause some serious grief in the trouser department. This condition results from the rupture of one or both of the fibrous coverings enveloping the penis and is caused by a rapid blunt force to an erect member, usually occurring through a vigorous session of consensual procreation or a heroically enthusiastic session of self-administered gratification. Penile fracture is nothing to be sniffed at. Partial or complete rupture of the urethra, assault of the dorsal nerves, veins, and arteries leave the sufferer in complete and utter pain, and probably total embarrassment. The tragic feeling of impending doom is not to be overlooked. In fact, some surveys place emotional pain as the greatest of all pains. The emotional pain experienced after realizing the extent of this tragic event no doubt amplifies the breadth of overall suffering. Women put up with a lot of pain in their lives between childbirth and conditions like endometriosis. But let's not leave the men out of it. These are 10 conditions that usually only happen to men, and they are the most painful around. It's almost a ritual for young boys the first time you get kicked in the nuts. You might have been horsing around with friends, or maybe your older brother decided it'd be funny to convince you to play a game of who's tougher. He goes first, of course. 
One thing's for sure, you might have fallen out of trees and skidded halfway across gravel playgrounds without batting an eyelash, but the first nut shot is probably the most painful thing you've ever experienced. You double over, tears coming out of your eyes and probably you let out a scream or some choice curse words. What about getting kicked in this specific spot causes so much pain? It's all a part of the wonder of the human reproductive system. Testicles are designed to be part of sex and are packed with nerve endings to make sex more enjoyable. But with great pleasure comes great pain. Which is not a superhero quote. That added sensitivity is a double-edged sword because pressure on this area causes extreme pain. Plus, while many areas of the body are covered by a protective covering of muscle or bone, the testicles are exposed and just hanging out there. That's why they're easy to injure. You can essentially kick yourself in the testicles by sitting down the wrong way. When the coach advises you to put on your cup in case a ball goes sailing the wrong way, you should probably listen. Because a hard impact to the balls can cause serious problems. Usually, an impact to the testicles doesn't require medical intervention. Just lay down, take some mild painkillers, and get an ice pack to prevent swelling. But if the pain doesn't subside after an hour or you notice other danger signs like bruising, nausea, blood in your urine, or damage to the protective sac of the testicles, it might be time to seek medical attention. Not only can an injury cause extended discomfort if left untreated, but a hard enough kick can cause testicles to rupture, which can cause infertility or even death if an infection gets into the bloodstream. Maybe the next time your brother suggests that favorite game of his, it's better to play Mario Kart instead. But it's not the worst thing that can happen to the testicles. The testicles are very important organs. They hold the future of the human race inside them, which makes it kind of silly that they're so fragile. They don't even need to be injured by an outside force. When something twists just the wrong way, they can essentially strangle themselves. This is testicular torsion, a condition that happens when the spermatic cord that holds the testicle twists, cutting off the testicle from its blood flow and slowly depriving it of the energy it needs to stay alive. As soon as this happens, it's usually accompanied by intense pain in the testicles, something not as extreme as a sharp kick, but usually more persistent and impossible to avoid long term. While this is sometimes caused by a congenital malformation, it often happens to people who have no risk factors. So, is there any way to avoid this? Most of the common risk factors include age and body type. It happens most often in newborns who can't express the, hey, my balls hurt the way older people can. Or during puberty, when there's sudden growth and the testicles have yet to fully descend. The other main risk factor is trauma, particularly the slow pressure caused by frequent bicycle riding. While this is a small percentage of cases, it's significant enough for many cyclists to check down there regularly while they're doing heavy riding. Oddly, it seems like cold weather months might make this condition more likely to happen, although the cause is uncertain. And when someone's worried about it, they should do something about it quickly. Testicular torsion won't be ignored. It's usually accompanied by extreme pain in the testicle and stomach. And that's because it's running on a ticking clock. Not only is it painful, but the testicle is being starved and slowly dying. The best approach is to head to a doctor or hospital immediately, so they can try to manually manipulate the testicle back into place. If this doesn't work, the next step is surgery to manipulate the spermatic cord back into position. This is usually a simple operation, but one that has to be done quickly. There's only a 12-hour window in most cases before the testicle dies and has to be removed. In this case, the intense pain is a warning sign. Listen to it and save a testicle. It's not the only case where the genitals betray men. It's not often a disease that makes its way into the tabloids, but the President of the United States' genitalia became the subject of national debate when Paula Jones described Bill Clinton's anatomy and said his penis had a distinctive curve. While it's never proven true or false, if it was true, Clinton's member might have been one of the many afflicted with Peyronie's disease. This is a connective tissue disorder that affects the soft tissues of the penis, causing scar tissue and fibrous plaques to grow, affecting the thin sheath of tissue surrounding the erectile tissue. Normally, the penis looks normal, but when the man becomes aroused and has an erection, it affects the shape of the penis, and it has a nasty tendency to turn pleasure into pain in a hurry. The penis is normally a little curved when erect, but this condition it can get extreme. In severe cases, it causes large lesions and can even cause the penis to bend as if it has an extra joint. It can not only cause extreme pain, but can make it much more difficult to have an erection. After all, if every case of sexual arousal results in shooting pain down there, it's going to be pretty difficult to keep feeling hot. This can make it difficult to have sex as well as have long-term psychological effects. Men suffering from Peyronie's disease often report feeling inadequate and being self-conscious about what they look like down there. 
So what causes this disease? Is there any way to avoid it? The bad news is, the top risk factor is one every man will experience, or at least they hope to. It becomes more common with age, with up to 10% of men eventually experiencing it. However, it can also be caused by diabetes, repeated injuries to the penis which cause abnormal scar tissue growth, and excessive consumption of alcohol or tobacco. It's more common in people of European background, and people are more likely to have it if they have a family history of it. While there is no cure, it can be treated through physical therapy to slowly pull the penis back into shape using a traction device, although this can be more uncomfortable than the original condition. Sometimes the problems go deeper. The prostate is a small gland, but it's responsible for a lot, including the production of semen and the unique switch that lets men both pee and ejaculate without crossing the streams. It's an important little part of the body, and when something goes wrong, it can be a big pain. The prostate is vulnerable to a condition called prostatitis, and many men have it without even knowing it. That's because many of the cases are asymptomatic, consisting of an inflamed prostate but no associated pain. Doctors often discover it during a urology visit and recommend treatments before it becomes a problem, because if it proceeds to a later stage, it can result in urinary tract infections. And that's just the beginning, because it can cause some serious pain. If it advances to the most serious phase, acute prostatitis, it becomes a serious bacterial infection that can be a serious medical emergency. Signs include chills and fever, difficulty urinating, and inflammation and pain in the genital area or lower back. If doctors examine the prostate by probing through the rectum, they'll often find that it's extremely sensitive and painful, often by the patient yelling at the top of their lungs as soon as the gloved finger makes contact. This is a common condition after a patient has a prostate biopsy to check for cancer cells and is much more common in older patients. And when it happens, it's time to go into crisis mode. When acute prostatitis can be treated, it's important to catch it early. This increases the odds that a patient can be treated with antibiotics and sent home to rest. If left untreated, it can result in elevated white blood cell counts and even sepsis and immunocompromised patients. If the antibiotics aren't doing their work and the patient shows a high fever, they'll usually be admitted to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics. One of the biggest side effects of acute prostatitis is difficulty urinating, which might result in the need for a catheter. But most patients recover fully without it becoming a recurring problem, although the diagnosis and treatment can often be painful and make many men self-conscious. The next pain isn't exclusive to men, but it can be much worse for them. Anatomy is a tricky thing, and one little nerve ending out of place can be a real big pain, literally. That's the case with the pudendal nerve, located in the pelvis near the cavities known as Alcox Canal. It can easily get compressed and trapped in this area, leading to complications with nerve function in that most sensitive area. It's usually associated with intense pressure on the pelvic region, which is often why it's nicknamed cyclist syndrome. The first symptom isn't pain, it's numbness. While there's no standard test for the disorder, the first sign is usually when you start to feel your butt fall asleep. This has probably happened to most people during a long bus ride, and immediately they stand up and try to stretch their legs a little. But if they don't, things can get messy. If the nerve gets compressed for too long, it can start to wreak havoc and function around the area. First, the genitals and anus become numb, very inconvenient for anyone with an active sex life. This also can cause trouble with bathroom function, making it hard to tell when you need to go. Men also report that it makes the feeling of ejaculation change, and when the sensation does return, it can be associated with intense burning pain, similar to the kind that happens when your arm comes back to life after a very awkward night of sleeping on it. And when there's reduced sensation, it comes with an increased risk of injury from other causes. Fortunately, this condition can be alleviated easier than most, usually. At the first sign of the disorder, it's recommended to change your behavior. The nerve usually becomes compressed through excess pressure, and reducing the pressure can keep the symptoms from getting worse. But for many cyclists, that's not an option. There's a race to train for. Physical therapists can help people develop better posture or use exercises to loosen the tension, but if the disorder is allowed to progress to the point where the symptoms become severe, a combination of medications and injections can improve the symptoms in most cases. While some doctors in a few countries claim to perform surgery to relieve tension, this is controversial and most doctors prefer less invasive techniques. It's not the only case where sitting can cause problems. The term trucker's butt probably creates funny visuals of a big guy bending over to pick up a quarter and exposing, well, just about everything. But it's actually a major problem that affects countless people each year, mostly men. Officially called pilonidal disease, it's what happens when a cyst forms at the upper end of the butt cheeks. It's estimated to affect 3 in every 10,000 people. 
And the cause is unexpected. Body hair. Men have a lot more of it than women, so it's rare for it to affect women. And men also have a lot more of the common risk factors. It starts with itching and discomfort around the affected area, and it leads to a large lump forming around it, often leaking and causing stains on the underpants. But if it becomes acute, it can be unbearable. The problem comes when the pleonidal cyst becomes infected and is unable to drain. Then, suddenly, it can swell up quickly and make it impossible to sit down, a major problem for students or people who sit down for a living, like truck drivers. It's most likely to affect those who are overweight and don't exercise often, but the biggest contributing factor is ingrown hair. Moisture fills the cavity where the hair grows, leading to bacterial growth, which leads to infection. And while people can have this condition for years without having any real symptoms, once it becomes an acute issue, the person might not be able to function without getting it treated. Fortunately, there are multiple choices for treatment. If it's not at the acute stage, treating it with antibiotics can make it go dormant again, but it can recur at any time, often at the worst possible time. If it's swelling up and painful, a doctor can cut open the cyst and let it drain, relieving the pain and letting the patient get back to work. But to cure a pleonidal cyst, it often takes surgery. To not only drain the cyst, but then to remove the tissue and the nest of hair causing it to be infected. While the surgery is relatively non-invasive and usually done under local anesthesia, it can have a long recovery period which makes it difficult to sit down, which is why many sufferers choose to relieve the symptoms but not actually treat the disease. Inactivity leads to this disease, but activity often leads to this next one. The human body is a fragile thing, with hundreds of organs and muscles working together to keep us functioning. If one thing gets out of place, things can get messy. That's the case with the abdominal cavity, filled with organs that are kept in place by the inguinal canal. When things get a little out of place, that's called a hernia, and it can be both unsightly and deeply uncomfortable. The first sign is the protrusion of a large lump on one side of the groin. It doesn't always cause immediate symptoms, which is why many people ignore it at first. But if it's allowed to proceed, it can cause serious pain. People report intense discomfort, especially when coughing, using the bathroom, or being physically active. But could that last one be the cause as well? Many men report that their hernia started when they lifted something heavy, and it's common among laborers. But doctors aren't sure if there's a manual cause to the disorder, and instead point out that many of the patients have other risk factors, including smoking, heart and kidney disease, obesity, and past surgeries. It's also a genetic risk factor, and people who have previously had an invasive vasectomy might be especially susceptible. While women can get inguinal hernias and pregnancy is a risk factor, it's rare. Only 2% of women get them in their lifetime, while around a quarter of men do without pushing new life out of their body. And in the past, the cure might have been worse than the disease. Until recently, elective surgery was recommended to cure hernias and involved the use of a belt to hold the gut in place. While this provided a cosmetic improvement and more support when the wearer was lifting things, it had possible long-term consequences. Today, doctors advise against surgery in minor cases, although surgical repair is more common in women who can have more complications because of the location of their arteries. When doctors do perform surgery, they often use laparoscopic techniques to create tiny incisions and allow the patient to get back to work more quickly. For men with minor hernias, they're usually advised to watch it carefully, because in extreme cases the hernia can start strangling the contents of the abdomen and cause life-threatening complications. What's worse? How about agonizing pain every time you pee? Both men and women have urethras, the canal that lets them pee. But men have a longer one that extends through the penis, and that makes it much more vulnerable to urethral strictures, or the narrowing of the canal that makes every trip to the urinal a visit with pain. The first signs of this include a weak stream of pee, as well as a splashing in unusual directions and needing to make frequent trips to the bathroom in a hurry. In more serious cases, it can make every time painful and unsatisfying and lead to a urinary tract and prostate infections. But in some cases, it can become a medical emergency. If the tract becomes so narrow that the bladder can't empty, it is at risk of rupture. So what causes the urethra to betray men everywhere? It's usually caused by scar tissue in the urethra, including from surgery or infection, and it can be caused by the use of surgical tools like a catheter that affects the urethra. But the most common cause is injury. A pelvic fracture that compresses the area can cause lasting trauma. But it can also be caused by more common injuries like getting kicked square in the penis. Getting kicked in the testicles may be more intensely painful, but a sharp kick in a certain area can lead to far more serious consequences. So what's to be done to get the waterworks flowing smoothly again? If it's an emergency where the patient is unable to urinate, they'll likely be given a catheter in the emergency room to bypass the urethra, 
or have a surgical procedure to drain the bladder in more severe cases. But in less acute cases, the doctor concentrates on getting things moving without extreme measures. This can include manual dilation, which can be painful and make things worse in the long run, but also cell therapy to try to repair the damage. However, in most extreme cases, doctors perform a urethroplasty to reconstruct the canal and replace the scar tissue with healthy tissue from a skin graft. Whew, that's enough to make you grateful for every time you belly up to the urinal, even if that guy always stands next to you. But it's not the worst thing men feel while taking a whiz. You probably heard it all the time from your mom. Make sure you drink enough water, you don't want to get a kidney stone. Turns out she was right, because many people report kidney stones as being the most painful thing they've ever experienced in their life. This is when the concentration of minerals in the kidneys gets so high that it forms a solid piece of material that then tries to leave the exact same way as everything else produced by the kidneys, through your urine. Needless to say, the urethra was not meant to handle the little irregularly shaped rocks, especially when they reach a certain size. Many tiny kidney stones may pass through the urine stream without ever being noticed, only causing momentary pain. But when they make themselves known, watch out. When kidney stones form in the kidney, the first sign is often a serious pain that goes from the side of the groin, and it can be extreme. Sufferers report having to go to the bathroom more often, being unable to rest, having blood in the urine, and even feeling nauseous due to the intensity of the pain. With most people, they're just given painkillers and told to wait to pass it, which can be excruciating and escalate the pain as it gets closer to the exit. Anyone can get kidney stones, with the biggest risk factor being dehydration, high protein intake, and underlying medical conditions like Crohn's disease. But it's also much more common in men. So why are men plagued by these stones? Over 10% of men will have kidney stones in their lives, compared to just over 5% of women, and men are also more likely to have extreme cases that require medical treatment. If someone's unable to pass a stone on their own, the doctor is likely to start by prescribing some medication that might help to break it up. They also can use a machine to deliver pulses of ultrasonic energy to break up the stone without any treatment. But in most extreme cases, they can use surgery to remove the largest stones. But just because one stone is gone doesn't mean the ordeal is over. People who get kidney stones are likely to have them recur, so listen to mom and keep on drinking that water. But there is one pain that men fear more than any other. This isn't a medical condition caused by repetitive stress or your body betraying you. It's caused by one slip-up at the urinal. You're finishing up, shaking, tucking things back in, and your member makes an unfortunate reappearance just as you're zipping up. Instant agony. And trying to pull back makes things even worse. You're caught in the most embarrassing injury possible for men everywhere, the zipper malfunction. Made famous by Ben Stiller in the famous 1990s romantic comedy There's Something About Mary, it's unfortunately not Hollywood fiction. It happens to hundreds of men a year, many of whom need medical attention. But fortunately, it's not all that likely to happen to you. There are a couple of common risk factors that most people won't fall into. If you're healthy, competent, and sober, the odds are you'll be able to stop in your tracks when something's in the way. But there is one group that should watch themselves. The drunk. Party guy Joe goes to the bathroom after throwing back a few too many and suddenly the party's over. Being drunk hurts your reaction time and this is probably one of the worst risks, you know, besides getting behind the wheel or doing a handstand on the balcony. So, what happens if the worst happens? First of all, you'll be tempted to pull it free. It might seem easy, just roll the zipper back, but that's likely to be extremely painful. Same for trying to pull it loose. This could cause a nasty tear with massive bleeding. So, as embarrassing as it is, just call 911. They'll know what to do. They've seen this situation many times before, probably too many. At the hospital, doctors know how to numb the area and extricate the foreskin from the zipper. The good news is, while it's extremely painful and embarrassing, the zipper malfunction rarely causes permanent damage. The pain usually makes people stop before they actually damage the penile tissue, and the skin can usually be repaired with stitches and bandages. So, zipper malfunction survivors will usually be fine, even if they sweat every time they pass by a urinal. It's coronavirus time, which means everyone's locked indoors. Sick and tired of quarantine, you decide to go where you can't possibly infect or be infected by the virus. Nature. Except maybe all this time indoors had made you forget one crucial fact. Nature sucks and really wants to kill you. Don't worry, Infographics is here to remind you of all the reasons man invented apartment buildings and Netflix, with some of the most venomous bites and stings in the world. Warning: Some of these entries contain images that may be difficult to stomach. Black Widow Spider Scarlett Johansson notwithstanding, Black Widow bites are pretty terrible affairs. 
These spiders can be identified by the red hourglass-like coloring on the abdomen set against a black body, and they inhabit every continent on Earth except Antarctica. With venom as much as 15 times as potent as a rattlesnake, these tiny eight-legged horrors can cause anything from moderate discomfort to death, depending on how sensitive the person is to the venom. Luckily, they discharge far less venom than a rattlesnake per bite, or else they'd surely be exponentially more deadly. So what delights are in store for you after getting a love bite from everyone's second favorite Black Widow? Within 15 minutes, you'll start feeling cramps in the area where you were bitten, as your nervous system fires off random signals uncontrollably. Within the first hours, your body will begin to experience powerful muscle spasms as the venom goes all 2007 Britney Spears on your neurotransmitters. Now the pain begins to become acute, and good news for all you wannabe heartthrobs because your abdomen will become rock hard as the muscles cramp. The venom isn't trying to give you a sweet beach bod though, instead the alpha latrotoxin and accompanying cocktails of chemicals is busy trying to kill as many of your nerve endings as possible. Remember, this is a spider that kills by paralyzing its prey. Lucky for most of you, you're too big for the venom to completely shut down your nervous system. Unluckily for you, things are still going to be very, very painful. After about 3 hours, your cramps will become acute, leading to extreme pain. You may be looking for painkillers at this point, but because of the effect of narcotics on the body, doctors likely won't prescribe them for fear of helping the venom shut down your breathing. Your skin will get clammy and your blood pressure drop, which will lead to mild delirium and mental confusion. Pregnant women will likely go into labor at this point. As you move into day two of your ordeal and assuming you haven't died yet, symptoms will start to fade, though you can look forward to large amounts of swelling in the affected area for several more days. Black widows may be painful but they don't even hold a candle to our next entry on this list, Irukanji jellyfish. Jellyfish are simple creatures. They have almost no measurable intelligence and their entire hunting strategy consists of floating around aimlessly. Irukanji takes everything that's awful about jellyfish and cranks it up to 11. Jellyfish are notoriously difficult to see and avoid already and the Irukanji doubled down on that and became even smaller and more difficult to see. The bell is only about 5 to 25 millimeters wide, but the tentacles can extend up to a meter in length. While other jellyfish have only stingers on the tentacles, Irukanji was kind enough to line even its bell with stingers. You know, so there's absolutely no chance of avoiding getting stung if you run into one. Despite its tiny size, Irukanji jellyfish pack one of the biggest venomous wallops in the world and is generally accepted as being the most painful sting in Mother Nature. The initial sting is only mildly painful and leads most swimmers to believe they ran into a common jellyfish. However, within minutes as the venom circulates through the body, the real nightmare begins. Painful muscle cramps first hit the arms and legs, which can lead to drowning. As the venom makes its way into the organs, the kidneys pulsate with pain akin to that of a kidney stone, while the back begins to spasm. Waves of fiery pain course through the body as nausea, headaches, uncontrolled sweating and vomiting kick in. The heart begins to race uncontrollably, leading to serious problems for those with pre-existing heart conditions. Hospitalization is absolutely necessary for an Irukanji sting, and even the most powerful narcotic painkillers have been widely reported to be completely ineffective. Victims must simply ride out the pain as hospitals try and make them as comfortable as possible. Perhaps the most terrifying part though is the way the venom causes psychological feelings of doom and despair, leading to suicidal thoughts and depression. At least the Irukanji jellyfish have the decency of trying to kill you. Our next entry will leave holes in your body if it gets its fangs inside you. Brown Recluse Warning: This next entry contains some disturbing images. Spiders are basically the jellyfish of land. They're often extremely venomous, difficult to see, and there's probably one working its way up your pant leg right now, but you probably think we're kidding and you just feel a random tickle. If it's a brown recluse on your leg though, you better start making arrangements to get to the hospital. A bite from a brown recluse is typically painless, though you'll start to feel tender around the bitten area within a few hours. The area will become inflamed quickly, with burning pain setting in. If you're lucky, this is as bad as it'll get, but most people are not lucky when it comes to brown recluse spiders. For the unlucky victims, necrosis will set in around the affected area as the venom destroys the surrounding tissues. Typically, this begins with a very large blister, then an ulcer will start to develop. Over the course of one or two weeks, the ulcer grows by inches and dead tissue begins to blacken and scab on the wound. Within three weeks, the bite will finally begin to heal but can take up to three months to fully heal. Depending on the location you were bitten, you may need skin grafts or full-on reconstructive surgery to recover from the massive tissue death, and you'll likely carry a significant scar or deformity for the rest of your life. Some victims may even need a limb amputation. Brown recluses only sting defensively, but our next entry doesn't just pack one of the most painful stings in the world, it can fly and chase down its victims. Tarantula Hawk 
No, it's not a spider that can fly like a hawk. Even that's too terrifying for nature to come up with. Instead, the tarantula hawk is a species of wasp that lives to prey on spiders. If you live in the southern United States or south and central America, you're smack dab in this species' habitat. Tarantula hawks like to hunt down spiders and inject them with venom that paralyzes them. The wasp then drags the spider into a hole and plants its eggs inside of it. The growing young promptly hatches and feeds on the still-living spider, kind of like a really slow-acting xenomorph. In humans, the venom isn't strong enough to paralyze, but it's more than enough to create one of the most painful experiences of your life. American entomologist Justin Schmidt, who has dedicated his life to creation of the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, has this to say about the tarantula hawk sting. All you can do is lay down and scream. The good news is that the pain only lasts about five minutes. The bad news is that this will definitely be the most painful five minutes of your life, other than that last time you tried to do something special in the bedroom for your significant other, only to be a complete disappointment. And that is an infographic sting, with pain that can last from minutes to a lifetime. Our next entry is not only so well camouflaged that many people get stung by accident each year, but the pain of even a glancing sting can last for years. Stonefish. Its camouflage is almost perfect, and 13 deadly spines line its body to ward off would-be predators. Unfortunately for humans, these same spines routinely end up piercing the bottom of swimmers' feet fairly regularly. For its victims, there's few experiences in life more painful than getting stung by a stonefish. One swimmer stung by a stonefish in Australia managed to accidentally nick one with a finger, and that was more than enough to bring on a nightmare of pain that would last years. Stung on the finger, the pain was immediate and intense, described as having a sledgehammer smash into each knuckle, the wrist, the elbow, and then up to the shoulder for an entire hour after the sting. After that, the venom went to work on the kidneys, causing so much pain the victim couldn't stand or sit straight up, and was forced to remain doubled over in crippling agony. For him, as with most victims, the pain would take years to go away, with recurring kidney pain striking long after the initial sting. And that was just a glancing blow on a single spine. Divers who have stepped onto a stonefish and experienced several of the spines piercing their body have experienced pain so intense they begged for their limbs to be amputated. Now that's just one more reason to leave the ocean to the jellyfish, in our opinion. Most people avoid bugs and creepy crawly things that can bite or sting with good reason. Dr. Schmidt, a scientist at Arizona's Southwestern Biological Institute, however, has been stung countless times by at least 150 different insect species. Some of these were accidental and chance encounters, but others were deliberate. Under the circumstances, he's quite an authority on the subject. He's created the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, ranking each sting by its level of agony. Bullet ants, the largest ants in the world, top it. Knowing this, we'll consider a rather unfortunate scenario on this episode of the Infographics Show. What if you were bitten by by 100 bullet ants. Dr. Justin Schmidt is an entomologist who specializes in the study of stinging insects. His research spanning the last 30 or so years has taken him all over the world, including to far off and obscure locations. And once there, he collects live bug nests. It is in these circumstances where he is often stung. His pain index was first created in the 80s, but has since been changed so now it ranks the pain of 78 species in the Hymenoptera group. This includes wasps, ants, and bees. At level 1, the lowest on the scale, are fire ants and sweat bees. Level 1.5 includes the bullhorn acacia ant. Honeybees, yellow jackets, and bald-faced hornets score midway on the scale at level 2. Just above those are the paper wasp and harvester ant at level 3. Then comes the top, or level 4, which according to Dr. Schmidt, is a feeling you don't want to know. It includes the bullet ant and the tarantula hawk wasp. Though between the two, the wasp sting ranks a bit lower, because it doesn't last nearly as long. This is in part due to the purpose of the wasp's poison, which is to prevent it from getting eaten by things like birds. Strong, intense, and immediate pain for about three minutes is more than enough to discourage a would-be predator to give the wasp time to escape somewhere far away. Its poison is also potent enough to paralyze tarantulas, which become food for its offspring. Dr. Schmidt describes it as 20,000 volts from a snapped power line coursing through your body. But the bullet ant venom serves a different purpose, and it is to be used in defense of the ant's home and to protect the other thousands in its colony. It's meant not just to temporarily discourage an intruder, but to make it so whatever it was would never even consider coming back again. Dr. Schmidt, who was stung by an ant on his finger, said it was like putting it in an electric socket, or the feeling you could expect after throwing a hairdryer in your back. 
path. The sensation traveled upward so his entire arm was shaking. However, though, it has systemic effects, hence is shaking. It's also located to the general area where he was stung, but the pain lasted for hours. Those who would know say it's like getting hit by a bullet and that feeling continues in endless waves of agony from 12 to 24 hours. Beyond just rating the pain, Dr. Schmidt uses his knowledge to hypothesize about the function of pain in an insect's life. As we mentioned, it helps with defense and also allows them greater resources as they can explore large areas without the fear of being eaten. It lets them thrive in groups as well. For example, bullet ants live in a colony of 1 to 3,000. Therefore, it's entirely possible for some very unlucky person to stumble upon a nest and get stung by many of them several times, especially since, according to experts, they can signal to others nearby to start stinging Singing along with them. The question is, what would happen next? To explore the answer, we must first discover what takes place when one is bitten by several ants and not just one, which was Dr. Schmidt's experience. Steve Backshell, for example, described shaking, sweating, and an increase in pulse as the sensation traveled his entire body. In his opinion, in the case of multiple stings, many people would go in and out of consciousness. He claims you would know nothing else but pain for hours. However, even Backshell, like Schmidt, is but a novice when it comes to the bullet ant sting when compared to the indigenous Saterimawe people of Brazil. The custom is for young teenage boys to wear gloves that are covered with hundreds of bullet ants for 10 agonizing minutes at a time to prove their manhood. These gloves are first made by sedating the ants in an herbal liquid and then weaving them into palm leaves in the shape of a large mitt. The boys must keep it together and remain as calm as possible with their hands inside these gloves while they are stung repeatedly. They must do this not just once, but a total of 20 times. You heard that right. They must reach into these ant-filled gloves 20 different times. It leaves their hands swollen and unable to move. However, as gruesome as this sounds, the effects don't last very long and eventually they go away. Of course, one wonders if they have some kind of ancestral immunity to the sting. For example, Hamish Blake of the Australian show Hamish and Andy wore the gloves just once and then immediately went through what he called six stages of sting pain. Step one was shrieking, which he did quite nicely and far from stoically. The second was a departure from tradition as he either refused or was unable to dance. Stage three was screaming and swearing, which again he did brilliantly. Then he began to sweat, shake, and use a biting stick to complete the last three stages. After two hours of thrashing around in pain, he was taken to a hospital and received morphine. It was 18 hours before he was able to talk normally again, though he came out a winner in the end. His friends commented that he looked more like a man and he claimed the experience had grown him another testicle. However, despite his shrieking and swearing and at times lying prone on the ground as if dead, Hamish was not truly in danger of dying. In fact, there's never been a documented report of death due to bullet ants, ever. This is despite the local ritual that countless young boys have participated in as well as anyone else unlucky enough or, in Hamish's case, curious enough to be stung. In fact, it's estimated that a vertebrate would require 30 stings per kilogram of weight to be killed by these insects. That is 30 stings for each 2.2 pounds. In other words, 2,250 stings would be needed to kill a human weighing 165 pounds. And though it's painful and enduring, within 24 hours all signs of the potent neurotoxin will completely vanish. You will be left with only your memories, which just might keep you up at night. The fact that the bullet ant's poison is virtually pure neurotoxin is key. It has no allergens within it, so there's no risk posed by some type of histamine reaction that could prove deadly, such as with the bee. And get this, a day after you're stung by a bullet ant, you actually feel amazing. That's right, you're basically high off the adrenaline. Backshell said he felt so great it was like he was a god or could fly if he wanted for a good week after. Still, one wonders if it's worth a full day of agony to get to that point. Surprisingly, that's not where the benefits of the ant venom end. It has potential uses as an effective insecticide, and oddly, similar synthetic substances have shown pain relief properties on rats. In fact, scientists believe that with some adaptation, the bullet ant's toxins can be used as a painkiller instead of a source of pain. And we can turn to the Central American Indians for further proof of bullet ant benefits. Stings have been used by them as a type of treatment for rheumatism, and its mandibles or jaws have worked as sutures, and ants can bite a wound closed after which its head is snapped off. It then continues to hold the skin tightly together. Further, its saliva causes swelling of the area which helps to seal it off and promote healing. We didn't see that one coming. 
So the answer to our original question of what would happen if you were bitten by 100 bullet ants is somewhat anticlimactic, as really the answer is likely nothing. Unless you are very, very small, you will not die, but oh, you will suffer. You will likely join Hamish in the six stages of sting pain, or maybe even create a seventh all your own. You will swell and shake and sweat and possibly even pass out, but as long as it's short of the thousands of stings you need to die, you will live on, and after the pain is ended, you will find glory all your own. You will likely emerge high as a kite with an additional testicle or two. Want to learn how to make videos like us? Find out after the video how we use insights from vidIQ as our secret YouTube weapon and get a 98% discount. You heard that right, 98% off. But you've got to stick around to the end of the video to find out how you can try vidIQ for yourself for just $1 for 30 days and start making your own hit YouTube videos in no time. What's the summit of suffering? The apogee of agony, the peak of excruciating, harrowing, torturous pain. Today we're going to 11 on the pain scale. Man, we might even hit 12. Hold on to your hats and just hope none of these things ever happen to you. Number 10. Today you'll hear about familiar pains that affect many humans, but we'll also throw in a few outliers, pains you can probably avoid in your life. So to kick off the list of horrors, we'll give you the curse of the platypus. Yeah, we're talking about that duck-billed chap that's so cute if you ever saw one in its resident country of Australia, you'd probably pick it up and take a selfie with it. These ridiculous beasts might look like a bunch of animal spare parts stuck together, but by God do they pack a punch if you tick them off. In short, their bodies contain venom. Really horrible, scary venom. It contains 19 peptides, which are short chains of amino acids. That probably means nothing to you, but it would if you were the victim of a platypus attack. You'd survive but you never forget the experience as long as you lived. You certainly wouldn't forget it for weeks or months after because once you've been stung by one of these things, you might have a sensitivity to pain, a condition known as hyperalgesia. And just after you were envenomated, there's a chance you'd be in so much pain that you wouldn't just roll around screaming, you would pass out. They get you with the little sharp spurs on their feet, usually a tool for males to scrap with other males during mating season, but humans are also fair game if you catch a platypus in a bad mood, you might see one in the water and think it's a good idea to try to play around with it, and then it might take a swipe at you. Within a few minutes, you wouldn't only be in excruciating pain, but you might be paralyzed. That would only be temporary, but the problem is, once you've been dragged out of the water and received some attention, not even the strongest medications could help lessen the pain, which in one report said was to be immediate, sustained, and devastating. A Vietnam War veteran once said, his platypus sting hurt more than when he got struck by shrapnel. Not only that, but you probably have to pull the spur out of your skin. And word on the street is victims can't do that, since they're hurting so much. Few people have experienced this, but some have. One report published in the National Library of Medicine said the patient spent six days in the hospital, and the envenomated area remained painful, swollen, and with little movement for three weeks. Significant functional impairment of the hand persisted for three months. We guess the message here is that in nature, you should never judge a book by its cover. Pain caused by animals doesn't really get any worse than this. Thank God it doesn't happen often, but this next pain happens to many of us in life, minus the exploding part. Number 9. A piece of advice we're going to give you is when you know there is something wrong with one of your teeth, get it seen to. Toothaches generally mean something is wrong and won't get any better without medical attention. You have loads of nerves in your teeth. You might have a cavity, which might cause a little bit of discomfort, but the pulp down in the root of your tooth might then get infected. Trust us, this is bad. It's an 11 on the pain scale. You want to rip your tooth out by yourself. There are actually plenty of reports of people doing just that when they couldn't get medical attention. Unlike the rest of your body, there isn't much you can do to lessen the pain. You cannot get in there since your tooth is in a closed structure. The infection might develop into a dental abscess, and you'll wish you were toothless. Perhaps one of the worst stories we've ever read while researching these shows was the case of exploding teeth. No, we're not kidding. In the 19th century, a dentist in Pennsylvania named W. H. Atkinson wrote about severe toothaches. Talking about one particular case, he said, During his agonies, he ran about here and there in the vain endeavor to obtain some respite. At one time, boring his head on the ground like an enraged animal, and another poking it under the corner of the fence and again going to the spring and plunging his head to the bottom in the cold water. In those days, teeth caused people hell. Another case explained that one man was observed to cry day by day for hours together. 
he actually died, not from the pain, but as a result of how he handled it. In another story, a clergyman from back then became delirious with pain. In this case, his tooth exploded. The case file says, all at once a sharp crack like a pistol shot burst his tooth into fragments, giving him instant relief. That happened a few times. In another case, it was explained that the explosion was so loud that a woman's ears rang for days. The tooth was said to have bursted with a concussion and well nigh knocked her over. The BBC wrote that there is no easy explanation for why these explosions happened, but they did and before that the people suffered as much as is humanly possible. Don't ever think that because you had a regular old toothache, tooth issues are not that bad. Toothaches can go off the scale in terms of pain. You know that you've already been there. Women who've had harrowing childbirth experiences have said their toothache was much worse than pushing out the bloody bundle of joy. Okay, so we guess this is a good time to talk about what some urologists have described as male childbirth. Number 8. We don't mean men pushing babies out of their urethras, but it can feel like that. We're talking about kidney stones. Those little devils that can lay in wait for ages and then at some point decide it's time to exit your body. Imagine that if it was the size of a human fist and weighed 2.48 pounds. True story. 11% of men will have a kidney stone in their lives compared to 6% of women. In 2022, it was reported a guy in India had a whopping 206 stones inside of him. He'd been living in absolute agony for months on end, and not one pain medication made him feel much better. He was in so much pain that he could hardly do basic things, such as brush his teeth. What happens with kidney stones is waste products in the blood crystallize, and that can end up becoming stones, or in this guy's case, 206 stones. It took surgeons just one hour to take them all out of his body. It would be an understatement to say he was relieved. A guy in the US was asked to describe what his kidney stones felt like and he said, indistinguishable from being stabbed with a white hot glowing knife that's twisted into your insides non-stop for hours. Another person on a forum explained, when you're in that kind of pain you'll try anything. Feels like a knife stuck into you shaped like a star with multiple sharp edges cutting deeper with each breath. The problem is people don't often know what's going on until it's too late. Still, kidney stones can be managed just like with a toothache as soon as you feel any kind of pain, go see a professional. Kidney stones aren't always excruciating, but they can be, especially, as the NHS says, when they are as big as a golf ball. Now for something a bit out of the ordinary again. Number 7. If you wanted to invent a name for a creature and make it sound like a gangster, you'd probably come up with something like Tarantula Hawk Wasp. Wasps get a lot of bad press, but let's face it, they don't exactly ingratiate themselves with humans. At least honeybees fall on their sword after they plunge their stinger into you and they make delicious honey. Wasps are more like natural born killers, but the tarantula hawk wasp is on another level. You can find them in the US, and you should know more about them. One person writing about their sting made us laugh when he said the pain was unacceptable. A biologist explained that if you do get stung, just lie down and start screaming. He wasn't joking, he said it hurts so much that people can get injured running around like their backsides are on fire. There are reports of people in so much pain that they were unable to speak for a few minutes. That's the good thing about this creature, if you do get stung, the intense pain will usually only last for about 5 minutes. In some ways, then, you could call the pain the worst of them all because, let's face it, no one could handle it for hours on end, like childbirth or toothache or kidney stones. We're not sure why, but a scientist once tried to discover what it would be like to be stung by a handful of these critters simultaneously. A paper explained, undeterred after the first sting, he continued, receiving several more stings, until the pain was so great he lost all of them and crawled into a ditch and just bawled his eyes out. That doesn't sound very scientific, but it was indeed published in 2004 in a paper titled Venom and the Good Life in Tarantula Hawks. The abstract reads, Although the instantaneous pain of a tarantula hawk sting is the greatest recorded for any stinging insect, the venom itself lacks meaningful vertebrae toxicity. That just means it won't kill you. The wasp is a nightmare on wheels regarding how it gets its name. It looks for a tarantula, which let's face it isn't exactly a pushover in the wild. The wasp then stings the spider, paralyzes it, and drags it into its lair. It lays eggs in them that turn into larvae, which over a few weeks devours the paralyzed spider. If that's not gangster, we don't know what is. They don't really have any natural predators. As one person wrote, no animal is dumb enough to go after a tarantula hawk wasp. 
The good news is that they're very solitary creatures and very rarely bother humans, which makes a change from those normal everyday bastard wasps that make their nests above your garage door. Still, if you do manage to annoy one, be prepared for 5 minutes of instantaneous, electrifying and totally debilitating pain that is unacceptable. Now let's get back to the things that might happen to many of you on any given week. Number 6. Cancer It's never a cheery subject to talk about. It fills us with dread. But it will happen to a lot of us. After heart disease, it's the biggest killer in the US, taking out more than 20% of people in that country who die each year. Cancer is a formidable killer worldwide, so it's best you know what's coming. The good and bad news about cancer is often you don't know you have it until it's too late. Some cancers can be quite silent, so unless a tumor pushes itself against an organ, it can grow to its heart's content in relative silence. Cancer is like social media, you don't know it's killing you until you are way past being able to survive it. Not all cancers are the same though, they come in many shapes and sizes and cause varying levels of pain. But the one people seem to hate the most in terms of physical agony is bone cancer. Thankfully, it's not that common compared to breast, prostate, skin, colon, and lung cancer. But if you do get it, you might find you have intermittent bursts of serious pain that happen a few times a day every day. Sure, the pain isn't as bad as having a platypus stick his mean spurs into your face, but that constant unrelenting throbbing can drive you half crazy. A paper in the National Institutes of Health described it as an intermittent episode of extreme pain that can last seconds or minutes and can hit a person many times in one day. It sounds like the old school torture technique of just putting a bag over a person's head as they're sitting tied to a chair. But ever so often as the person is feeling comfortable, coming up to them and smacking them in the chops. Physicians often say the bone cancer is really, really hard to deal with as sometimes they just can't seem to take the pain away for their patients. But again, not all bone cancers are really painful. We looked at cancer forums where it seems everyone is different regarding how they feel. One person said his bone cancer went from occasional and more of a dull ache to constant and sometimes almost unbearable, though it will reduce back down to a dull ache, but now it's always there. Another person said, I was just walking fine and all of a sudden at the snap of your fingers I suddenly have massive pain about the size of a dime in my lower left leg. I could hardly make it back home. This continued off and on for weeks. So that coming and going, not knowing when you'll get hit, must be awful, especially if you're one of the people that gets the super intense version of the pain. We take our hats off to cancer sufferers, you are tough cookies if you can get through that. The next one sounds like something Satan invented. Number 5. If tarantula hawk wasp is a scary name for an animal, we think spinal headache is a scary name for a condition. Imagine telling your buddy on the phone, hey, uh, I'm gonna skip that nuclear assault concert tonight, I got a spinal headache. Joking aside, people have said that when you have one of these very special headaches, it feels as though someone is trying to split your head apart. Intense pain is often accompanied by what one medical website called visual disturbances or feelings of nausea. They can last for hours, and the pain can move from inside the head to the face. That sounds like any old headache though, and you all have them from time to time. Again, we are the bearer of good news because spinal headaches usually only happen after someone has had a spinal tap or spinal anesthesia. That's why some women who've been pregnant get them. It happens because spinal fluid leaks through a puncture hole in the membrane around the spinal cord. When that happens, you might not only start tripping, but also get dizzy, lose your hearing, and possibly have a seizure. Thank God spinal headaches are uncommon, but if you've had one of those procedures that we just mentioned, there's a chance you'll have one. If you're not already sold on how bad these things are, a paper in the National Library of Medicine said they can last weeks, and during that time the person might not even be able to function. Not only that, there's a good chance of death or at least what the paper said are serious complications. We looked on forums and found some women who had one after having an epidural during childbirth. One woman said her headache was so bad there was no way on earth she'd ever get an epidural again. Another woman said, I toughed it out. It was so much pain. I noticed when I would roll my head, I would hear cracks. Uh, yet another woman said, it took about a week before I was able to stand up without severe pain. But to all the women out there watching this, please talk to your doctor about this if you're going to have a child. These headaches can happen, but there's much more chance you'll have a hazard-free epidural. Making kids is hard work, of course, but guys have a certain sensitivity too when it comes to their baby-making tackle. Number 4. We imagine most men watching this have been hit in the balls at some time or another. It's common. Really common. Soccer balls, baseballs, tennis balls, stray feet from angry kids. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but they can do much more damage to your mighty eggs. It hurts so much 
because there are so many nerves packed into such a small area. After all, you have to protect those things with your life. In purely evolutionary terms, you're only here to procreate, so losing your balls makes you about as useful as a spoon in a gunfight. So what you really don't want is them getting squashed, stabbed, shot, or bitten off by an angry dog. Now you're thinking, well, that ain't ever gonna happen. You might be right, but there is something else you need to worry about. Something that's actually not that uncommon. It's called testicular torsion. Possibly the two worst words ever put together on our planet. Because the balls basically twist around, which can cause extreme pain. The pain is almost always severe. It happens mostly to young guys under 18 years of age, and although it can be the result of some kind of trauma, most of the time it just happens all by itself. It's so painful that the poor kid might be unable to eat, sleep, or in some cases, he might be in so much pain he can barely communicate. That's the worst case scenario. Sometimes the pain is moderate, with one guy writing on a forum, I had the real deal, the symptoms are basically swelling of the scrotum, with the penis shrinking a lot, and a prolonged pain very similar to that experienced after a kick to the balls, only more acute and constant. It needs to be sorted out fast, as it can cause necrosis, which means tissue death. Right, I think it's time we talked about violence. Number 3. We'll start with this one question, which movie is this line out of? Aside from the kneecap, the gut is the most painful area a guy can get shot in. Did you get it? The answer is Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. If you've seen it, you'll know that the guy who got shot in the stomach was in incredible pain. The actor Tim Roth made that injury look like the worst thing known to man, perhaps a lot worse than testicular torsion or bone cancer. But if Tarantino is right, a shot to the abdomen doesn't hurt as much as a shot to the kneecap. Just imagine if someone bashed your knee with a hammer and smashed all those little bones and ligaments. Trauma like that to the knee is very, very painful and one of the worst things that could ever happen to you. You'd beg for a platypus sting over that. If you know much about the so-called troubles in Ireland, you'll know that certain groups had what were called punishment attacks. In 2017, the BBC talked about such attacks in Northern Ireland's Protestant loyalist areas and the Catholic Republican communities. The attack of choice was being shot through the knee. The reason for some of the attacks was that young folks were selling drugs. One lad explained that it happened to him after he fell in with the wrong crowd. He said, the first time they shot me, I only moved a bit, but the second time they shot me, I was screaming. It went right through and hit my main artery. It bursted my whole knee bone. Another guy explained, I was shot in the shin, thigh, ankle, and calf. I was in shock but shouted to my girlfriend, call an ambulance, then I passed out. It's supposed to cause the most amount of pain without killing you. And from what we can see, if you don't pass out, you will scream like a banshee. If you don't lose the limb, you'll almost certainly have a limp for the rest of your life. This kind of paramilitary policing in the streets is frowned upon by most people in Ireland. And thank Jesus it doesn't happen much these days. The next two pains on the list do. Number 2. Just about everything we talked about today is so bad, it'll make you wish you were unconscious. It's a sad fact that pain has literally driven people to the edge of despair and sometimes over the edge. The internet is full of folks who say their pain was literally, not figuratively, unbearable. The situation is always worse when the pain medications don't touch the pain and when the pain is chronic. Sure, a wasp can make you howl, a toothache will make you cry, and a shattered kneecap will make you wish you were dead, but at least in the back of your mind you know the pain will end. This brings us to cluster headaches, the most awful thing, or second most awful thing on this list, nature ever passed on to us. Maybe God had read the Marquis de Sade because cluster headaches really feel like the invention of a sadist. They are described as excruciating attacks, usually on one side of the head and around the eye, that can come on at any time with no warning at all. They can bring you down to your knees, make you bite onto wood, scream, cry, and crawl around like a dog on broken legs. It's like being stabbed through the head with a hot knife. People have been known to bash their heads against walls, knocking themselves down just to do something. They can be like that anywhere from 15 minutes to 3 hours, and the bouts might happen up to 8 times a day. This usually goes on for 4 to 12 weeks, and then they usually stop. They might stop for months or years and then start all over again. Welcome to hell. It doesn't really get worse than this, which is why some sufferers have googled the words euthanasia clinic in their darkest hours. We don't even know what causes them, although some scientists have said they seem to cause activity in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. It seems smokers get them more, but they might also be related to certain smells and they could be passed on through genes. Regular meds will do nothing, although specialist treatments might help. In the US, some scientists say psychedelics are one of the most promising treatments. They say magic mushrooms might not just fix severe depression, but they might stop headaches from hell. 
One recent paper said the magical type of mushroom for treating such horrible headaches were comparable to or more efficacious than most conventional medications. The Washington Post in 2021 talked about a guy who tried everything on earth over 40 years to make his cluster headache stop, and what finally worked was a good old psilocybin, the stuff in the mushrooms that opened what some people once called the doors of perception. These people were willing to try anything. One said he'd eat boot polish if he thought it would help. Another said the pain is so intense, I've had some seemingly psychotic thoughts during attacks, like maybe if I could take the pliers and start pulling out my molars, or if I hammered in the smallest drill bit near my eye, I could relieve the pressure. Do we need to say any more? Most of the 300,000 people in the US that have these headaches suffer in silence. They don't get help. They aren't part of any specialist medical trials, and in some cases even their friends don't believe them. That is really hell for them. You're probably now thinking, how do we top that? What on earth could be worse than a cluster headache? Number 1. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. These are the words people might hear when they have another bout of trigeminal neuralgia. These are similar in some ways to cluster headaches, but they certainly aren't the same. Still, they might feel like a knife going through your head, which might happen a hundred times a day. No kidding. You can't live a normal life when you have them. The attacks might go on for months at a time. They're caused when something called the trigeminal nerve is compressed by a blood vessel, and while there are drugs that can help, the attacks might come back. We're not allowed to give you the nickname of this disease since YouTube doesn't like the word. So let's just say that people who have these attacks literally cannot put up with them. In this case, unbearable means unbearable. As one man explained, it's a hundred times worse than the worst pain you've ever felt, but pulsating and persistent like someone's trying to pull your eye out. Now, are you wondering how we come up with the ideas for videos? It's all thanks to vidIQ. vidIQ is a super powerful YouTube tool that basically acts like a cheat code for picking video topics. With vidIQ, you can see exactly how many people are searching for a topic each month, how much competition there is for that topic from other creators, and what videos from those creators are trending. Put all that information together and you can find the perfect video like we did hopefully with this one. So go check it out for yourself and get vidIQ for just $1 for 30 days. That's 98% off the regular price, but only at vidIQ.com slash the info show. A man screams wildly as he's dragged up the Acropolis steps by two soldiers and thrown at the feet of King Phalaris. The tyrant looks down at the weeping man and shakes his head. The prisoner has done nothing wrong except speak out against the mad king of Akragas. You've been sentenced to death for your actions. My rule shall not be questioned, Phalaris says with disgust. He points to a large metallic creature resting on a platform. Throw him in the bull, Phalaris signals to the guards. I want to watch the beast come alive with the screams of this traitor. This is the story of one of the most barbaric and painful torture devices ever created, the brazen bull. There are accounts from ancient Greece and Rome describing the brazen bull being used to execute prisoners in one of the cruelest ways possible. A victim would be thrown into the statue, the door secured behind them. Then a fire would be lit under the bronze bull, increasing the temperature inside to unbearable levels. The person within its belly would literally be cooked alive. The victims of the brazen bull were not only put through unbearable amounts of pain for long periods of time, but their death was sometimes turned into a spectacle for the amusement of others. Before we get into the brutal history of the brazen bull and where it came from, let's examine the terrible nature of the device. How did it work? What would it be like to be inside the belly of this bronze statue when a fire was lit underneath? In a word, excruciating. You would be literally roasted to death, while your screams escaped through tubes of the metal beast making your pleas for help sound like the bellowings of a bull. But if you really want to know what it's like to be tortured to death in the belly of a brass beast, then let's follow one unlucky man along his hypothetical journey into a brazen bull. Alexander lives in ancient Akragas, a city in what would one day become Sicily. He's a young philosopher who's just finished his studies with one of the greatest academics in the Greek Empire. Alexander celebrates with a group of scholars. They drink wine and sing songs about ancient heroes and odysseys. He leaves the party ready to begin his journey to educate the masses. But first, he meets up with the love of his life for a romantic evening. He met Lyra while watching a play at the local amphitheater. She was beautiful, intelligent, and witty. The moment Alexander spoke to Lyra, he fell in love. From then on, they spent every free moment together, and in a few days Alexander planned on asking Lyra to marry him. Unfortunately, destiny had other plans for this Greek philosopher. The next day, Alexander walks through the city streets talking to anyone who will listen. His teachings have centered around equality and representation for every class of citizen in the governing of Akragas. Unfortunately, the rule of Phalaris, the tyrant controlling the city, has been a brutal one. 
People's rights have been stripped away, free speech has been all but eliminated by the evil ruler. Alexander knows that if he can gather enough support from the citizens of the city, there could be change. Alexander stands atop a marble bench, looking out at the people gathering in front of him. He sees starving farmers and poor merchants, both of which have lost practically everything to the greed of Phalaris. Alexander shouts that equality is key and that all men should be able to think freely and pursue their dreams without being hindered by a tyrant. As he speaks, a group of soldiers pushes through the crowd. The citizens of Akragas flee as Alexander is pulled from the bench and thrown to the ground. The guards begin to kick the philosopher repeatedly as they shout for the crowd to disperse. Alexander gasps for oxygen, but with every blow the air is pushed out of his lungs. He feels like he's going to suffocate to death, but then the beating stops. The guards pull Alexander to his feet and drag him toward the palace. Alexander's blood seeps into the ground, leaving a red trail in the dirt as he's dragged down the path to the palace steps. The guards carry him up to the top of the Acropolis where Phalaris awaits. I have heard your teachings, young Alexander, and I must admit I am displeased with your lies that you've been spreading, Phalaris says with a wicked smile. Alexander tries to speak, but one of the soldiers punches him in the stomach before any words can come out. He doubles over in pain and falls to his knees. There's only one thing to be done with traitors who try to overthrow my rule. Phalaris continues, throw him in the brazen bull. Alexander's eyes open wide. He opens his mouth to scream as one of the soldiers punches him in the face. There will be no mercy. Alexander's vision blurs as he feels himself being lifted off the ground and dragged toward the bronze bull waiting on the edge of the Acropolis. It looks over the city, like an evil sentry guarding a stolen treasure. Alexander desperately tries to claw his way away from the soldiers, but their grips are as strong as crocodile jaws. They approach the brazen bull. The sun gleams off its polished metal casing. The bull was only recently invented for the mad tyrant Phalaris, and very few people have been unlucky enough to be locked inside it. Alexander sees his reflection in the polished metal, but can't help notice the look of terror on his face. The soldiers pull him closer and closer to the bronze beast. They're only inches away when one of the guards reaches down and opens a hatch on the side of the metal bull. The door swings open. Alexander is about to be thrown inside when Phalaris gives the command to halt. For a moment, Alexander thinks he'll be spared. The cruel ruler walks up to Alexander and pulls a knife from his belt. Hold his mouth open. The king hisses. The soldiers tilt Alexander's head back and force his jaws apart. Phalaris reaches into his victim's mouth and pulls out his tongue. He uses his knife to cut it off. Alexander chokes on the blood pouring from his mouth. He tries to yell for help, but he feels like he's underwater. He spits at Phalaris, covering him in blood. It's Alexander's last act of defiance before being tortured by the malicious king. Phalaris only smiles as Alexander's blood drips down his face. Carry on, he says. The soldiers shove Alexander into the opening of the brazen bull and slam the door shut. The first thing he notices is the smell of burnt flesh. Although the brazen bull has only claimed a few victims, the stench of cooked skin is unbearable. Alexander is now trapped within the rancid underbelly of the bull. The door closes behind him, silencing his screams. As he inhales to let out another shout, the putrid smell of burnt flesh fills his nostrils. He throws up all over the inside of the torture chamber. It's pitch black black, besides the little bit of light coming through the cracks where the door had swung shut. Alexander prays to every god he can think of, begging for mercy. All he was trying to do was make the city a better place. Now, the evil tyrant that's caused so much pain for its citizens has condemned him to the worst death imaginable. From the outside of the metal bull, Alexander can hear the muffled voices of the soldiers talking to Phalaris. The ruler of Akragas taps on the side of the metal bull and puts his face against its warm exterior. He will not die fast and you will not die well, young philosopher. Take the time while you are being cooked alive to think about all the mistakes you've made by speaking out against me. Phalaris steps away from the brazen bull. Burn him, he says to his soldiers. They begin piling dried sticks and logs underneath the bronze bull. The sounds of Alexander pounding on the inside are little more than dull thuds. Then he hears a sound that signals the beginning of the end of his life. The crackling of the wood as it catches fire echoes through the chamber. He weeps as thoughts of his beloved Lyra race through his head. He left her that very morning with the intention of asking her to be his wife later that day under their favorite fig tree. Now she'll be left wondering what happened to him as his body burns to dust. The heat inside the bull begins to rise. At first, it's just the bottom of the chamber that heats up. Alexander lifts his hands and knees off the metal, alternating between each side of his body. Every time his skin touches the metal, it sizzles. The temperature inside the brazen bull rises higher and higher. Phalaris has gathered his closest advisors and friends to watch the spectacle that will occur as Alexander is roasted alive inside the bull. Perilaus of Athens only just invented this new torture device, so most have yet to see it in action. It was a gift from the now deceased sculptor to the Mad King. Phalaris himself has witnessed what the brazen bull can do and heard the sounds that a screaming victim from within will make, but he wants to show it off to others in his circle, just to be sure that they don't get any ideas of double-crossing him. Alexander could barely tolerate the heat 
heat anymore. The fire rages underneath the brazen bull. He can no longer touch any of the sides of the bronze statue without being burnt. He begins to rock back and forth as he howls in agony. The entire bronze statue shifts as Alexander throws his weight against the sides of the bull. His shrieks escape through the series of tubes contained within the statue. His voice is distorted to sound like the snorting and grunting of a real bull. Phalaris claps his hands in glee as smoke begins pouring out of the nostrils of the brazen bull. Before the smoke is released from the statue, it passes through chambers filled with incense to counteract the stench of burning flesh. Alexander wails as he is cooked alive. It could be hours until the heat inside of the statue kills him. As time passes, he can no longer move. The nerve endings in his skin have all been destroyed. His flesh bubbles with third-degree burns. All Alexander can think about is his beloved Lyra. Would she still love him if she saw him like this? Skin and muscle begins to fall off his bones as it's now completely cooked. Alexander lays in the belly of the brazen bull, praying for death when the gods finally answer his pleadings. After much too long, he succumbs to the burns and leaves the mortal realm to join his ancestors in whatever existence comes after this one. After several more hours, the door to the brazen bull is pulled open. The soldiers sweep out the charred remains of the young philosopher and separate the bones from whatever else remains. Phalaris sorts through Alexander's bones, looking for just the right ones. He pulls them out, careful not to burn his fingers and fastens them together with a piece of string. He ties the bones to his wrist and smiles at his new piece of jewelry. This horrifying story is what victims of the brazen bull would have to go through before the torture device killed them. Anyone who was thrown into this torture device did not have a happy ending to their life. This was even true for the man who was once said to have created the brazen bull. What we know about the brazen bull of ancient times comes mostly from the writings of Greek historians. Theodorus Siculus mentioned it in his Bibliotheca Historica, which tells us about Paralaus of Athens, who invented the brazen bull for Phalaris as a way to execute criminals. The Bibliotheca Historica was completed sometime around 36 BCE, which was several hundred years after Phalaris and Paralaus lived. As the story goes, Phalaris the tyrant was amazed and loved the concept of the brazen bull, but he had doubts if it would actually work. Being the awful guy, that he was, he asked Paralaus to climb inside and shout into the tubes so he could hear what the contraption would sound like when a victim was inside. When Paralaus climbed into the bull, Phalaris slammed the door shut behind him. He did not just want a mock demonstration, he wanted the real thing. He ordered his men to build a fire underneath the brazen bull while its inventor was inside. The flames rose and with him, the temperature inside the bronze bull did as well. Paralaus began to scream at the top of his lungs. He was being cooked alive in the very bronze bull that he had created. Here he was, a great sculptor that had made a magnificent contraption for his king, and now he was going to die. The sculptor slammed his body against the sides of the torture device. The bull rocked back and forth, giving it the illusion of being alive. When Paralaus screamed, the tubes within the bull turned his human shrieks into the sounds of a bull. Phalaris was impressed. He loved his new execution device. Before Paralaus died of being cooked alive, Phalaris opened the hatch to the brazen bull and pulled him out. He praised Paralaus on what a good job he had done as the inventor lay on the ground in agony, smoke rising from the melting skin on his body. It's not entirely clear what happened next. Some accounts state that rather than letting the brazen bull kill Paralaus, Phalaris brought him to the top of a nearby hill and threw him off it. It seems like an odd choice, as if Phalaris wanted to kill the sculptor, all he had to do was leave him in the bull. But as you can probably tell, Phalaris was a monster and might have had no rational reason for his actions. Regardless of how the brazen bull actually came about or if Phalaris really did kill its inventor, the fact remains that the torture device creates one of the most painful experiences anyone could go through. Being slowly cooked alive comes with all kinds of nasty consequences, even without the fact that you are stuck all alone in a dark chamber while people outside laugh with glee as your screams are turned into the sounds of a bull. This device would be a terrible way to go. The anticipation of what was to come would instantly send the body into a panic. It would become hard to breathe. Not because there wasn't enough oxygen in the bull, but because the victim would become hysterical. Once the fire was lit, it would only take a few moments for the bottom of the bull to become too hot to touch. But since there would be nowhere for the victim to go, they would immediately begin burning whatever part of their body was in contact with the metal statue. The inside of the brass bull likely reached somewhere around 600 degrees Fahrenheit, which wouldn't be hot enough to cause someone to burst into flames, but would certainly be hot enough to cook them alive. Like any type of meat that is cooked in an oven, the muscles and cells began to denature and the body released liquid. If cooked for long enough at a lower temperature, someone's muscles could literally slide off their bones. This is why the brazen bull was such a terrible torture method. The victim could remain alive for hours if the fire was controlled. They would be in agony the entire time until their body finally couldn't take it anymore, and they died from extreme dehydration or organ failure. It would be the severe burns and the blistering of the skin and muscles that would cause the most painful part of the brazen bull experience. Over time, the brazen bull came to be known by other names such as the bronze bull, 
Sicilian bull or the bull of Phalaris. After it fell out of favor with the Greeks, the brazen bull was said to be used by the Romans. This was during the turn of the century when Christianity was spreading throughout Europe and the Middle East. The Romans threw Christian dissidents into the brazen bull and cooked them alive to make an example of them and show what happened to Christians in a Roman Empire. Both Saint Antipas, who would be invoked to help ease the pain of toothaches, and Saint Eustace, who was a pagan Roman general that converted to Christianity, were executed via the brazen bull. Saint Eustace had a family he was forced to separate from for several years as he hid from the Roman authorities, who were after him. He eventually returned home only to be captured and then cooked alive inside the brazen bull. The worst part was that the Romans also put Eustace's family into the belly of the bull with him, and they were all roasted together. Ironically, when we go back and look at the writings of ancient Greek historians, there are some stories that state Phalaris himself was roasted alive inside of one of his own brazen bulls. Perhaps the people of the city of Akragas had become so fed up with their tyrant ruler that they revolted, removed him from power, and threw him into one of those torture devices. This would have been a fitting end for an evil tyrant who had been so eager to use the brazen bull on others. Getting punched sucks, but there are definitely spots that hurt more than others when hit. In fact, getting punched in one area can instantly cause you to black out. Another location can literally cause you to pee yourself. We're about to tell you where the most painful places to get punched are, so pay attention. Your body's core is pretty resilient since this is where many of your vital organs are located. However, with precision, getting hit there can be incredibly painful. Professional fighters warn that if you ever get punched in the liver, it can be one of the most excruciating sensations of your life. The liver's main job is to filter toxins and other unnecessary substances out of your blood, but when you get punched there, it can throw your whole body out of equilibrium. The liver is covered in nerves which, when struck, send pain signals to the brain. If you're hit hard enough in the liver, you can go into shock momentarily. This means that the body pretty much shuts down until the brain can get the pain signals under control. This is one of the reasons why professional fighters keep their elbows tight to their body. But there's another organ in your midsection that you don't want to be punched in, the kidneys. When punched in the kidney, the body feels an intense amount of pain. However, it's not just the pain from the initial impact that professional fighters warn about. Instead, when taking a punch to this region of the body, it's the lingering effects that can cause the most pain. In order for a punch to impact the kidneys, the attacker needs to get up under the rib cage. But if someone manages to sneak a punch past the protective covering, it can cause some severe damage and immense pain. And even hours after the initial impact, there will still be lingering discomfort in the abdomen and back. So being punched in the kidney is not just painful in a single region of the body, but can result in long-lasting aches that persist throughout the midsection. One final region in the core of the body that's painful to be punched in is the bladder. Unfortunately, there's an unintended side effect to being struck there. The punch would have to be a low blow, as the bladder is located just above the groin. But if punched hard enough in this region of the body, not only would you double over from intense pain signals, but you could pee your pants as well. This would happen as a result of the fist putting pressure on the bladder, causing it to release any urine it was holding. There's a part of the body that getting punched in is not only painful, but can cause death. The throat contains several vital structures that can cause both physical pain and life-threatening circumstances when punched. The trachea is the tube that you breathe through, and it can be very sensitive. This is why it should come as no surprise that getting punched in the trachea can be painful, but other threats come with getting punched here. For example, even a light punch could cause the larynx to collapse and block the windpipe. You would not be able to breathe until your body recovered, but depending on the damage done by the punch, getting hit in the trachea could be life-threatening. It's unlikely, but if the trachea and the larynx are damaged by a powerful punch, you could suffocate to death. Getting punched in the throat can also result in another dangerous side effect. The pain to the throat from a well-placed punch could be so intense that you could pass out. This means that all with one punch, you would feel incredible pain, lose your breath, and lose consciousness. This is why being punched in the throat is considered by many to be one of the worst places to get hit. This brings us to the most painful region of the body to get punched in, the face. According to professional MMA fighters, the worst places to have a punch land are around the head. But there are several key locations that you definitely want to avoid being hit. Some fighters claim that getting punched in the back of the head is the most painful place to get hit because after the initial impact, you lose equilibrium. A solid punch to the back of the head is going to cause the brain to jostle slightly in the skull. Obviously, this is a problem and would cause discomfort. But the fact that the spinal cord connects the brain at the base of the skull means there are a ton of nerves in this area of the body. When these nerves are impacted by a punch, pain signals will flood the brain. The overwhelming amount of signals can cause disorientation, which makes recovering from such a punch very difficult. But this is nothing compared to getting hit in the side of the head. 
If you've ever had your ears boxed, you know how dizzy it can make you, but also how much the initial impact hurts. Following a punch to the ears, you would not only be in pain with ringing in your ears, but the world around you would become distorted as you lost balance. Then after the initial impact, the ear would throb and a burning sensation would persist for a long time. The nose is one of the most sensitive areas of the face due to nerves running across the bridge. These nerves contain respirators that allow you to smell, but with its high concentration of nerves also comes a high concentration of pain receptors. This means getting punched in the nose will shoot pain signals directly into the brain, causing the eyes to water, involuntary motor reflexes, and enough pain to cause you to black out for a moment. The crazy thing about getting punched in the nose is that it doesn't even need to be hard. Even a light punch can cause bleeding and pain. But if the punch lands with enough force, it can cause the bridge of the nose to break, which would result in severe pain until the bone could be reset. And although it's highly unlikely, a punch could shatter the nose, sending shards of it dangerously close to the brain itself. If you were very unlucky, some of the bone fragments could penetrate the nervous tissue and cause brain damage. If you've ever been poked in the eye by accident, you know how uncomfortable the feeling can be. Now, imagine getting punched full force right in the eye. This is often mentioned as being one of the worst places to get punched by professional fighters. At the back of the eye are a series of connective nerves that lead directly to the brain. When someone gets punched in the eye, signals are shot through these nerves and intense pain is felt. On top of that comes disorientation and the loss of depth perception. A punch to the eye could also rupture blood vessels, which would not only be uncomfortable but messy. However, the worst part about getting punched in the eye could be the long-term effects. If the impact is hard enough, it could damage your eye beyond repair. This means from a single punch, you may be temporarily or permanently blinded in that eye, and in really extreme circumstances, the entire eye could pop out of its socket by a strong punch. This would be so painful that the person would go into shock immediately. If this happened, the eye would likely be stopped by the eyelids, but with enough force, the eye could leave its socket and dangle from the hole in the face by the nerves connecting it to the brain. Needless to say, this would be one of the most painful spots anyone could be hit in. Being punched in the eye might just be really painful or it could be the worst experience of your life. However, the most painful place of all to get punched in is not where you might think. According to several professional fighters, a punch that connects with the chin is actually the most painful of all. Many fighters recommend always covering the chin even if it leaves another part of the body vulnerable. The reason for this is if the chin gets hit, the pain is so intense that even the toughest fighters get knocked out. In fact, many professional fighters have stories early on in their careers where they made the mistake of not protecting their chin and the next thing they knew, they were on the ground looking up at the ref, who ended the fight on the account of knockout. But why is this area of the body so painful to be punched in? The reason is, there is a high concentration of nerves around the chin and jaws. Since these nerves are so densely packed, a hard punch to the chin sends an overwhelming flood of pain signals to the brain. The massive amount of signals being sent all at once overloads the nervous system and causes you to black out. The difference between being punched in the chin versus other parts of the body is the puncher doesn't need to be very accurate. In this case, it's the amount of force that matters. If someone can punch hard enough and connect with any part of your chin, it's going to be incredibly painful. Whether the punch lands squarely on the chin or just clips the side of it, you're going to go down from the punch. This brings us to the last painful place to get punched. And it should come as no surprise that being hit in the genitals is considered by most people to be the most painful place of all to be punched. These low blows are not often used in professional fighting, but when they are, it's normally by accident. Being punched in the groin will cause different sensations based on the sex of the person, but for both males and females, intense pain and discomfort come from being hit in the genitals. For a woman who's punched in the vagina, the impact will cause a throbbing sensation that travels all the way up to their midsection. Luckily, their ovaries and uterus are concealed within the body itself, which does offer some protection. But a punch to the female reproductive organs will cause a massive amount of pain. Males, on the other hand, are slightly more vulnerable as their testicles hang outside of the body. This means a punch could strike one or both testes head on. This would send a massive surge of pain signals to the brain. The stomach could cramp and the person would double over in pain. The male and female genitals need to be sensitive areas due to their main purpose, which is pleasure. However, the reason that sex and orgasms are so pleasurable is because of the number of nerves that run through the genitals. The more nerves there are, the more sensitive an area is. Unfortunately, those same nerves are also capable of sending pain signals, which means that the genitals can deliver just as much pain as pleasure. So, where is the most painful place to get punched? If you ask a professional fighter, they'll most likely tell you it's the chin. However, for the rest of us, the genitals would definitely be at the top of the list. You asked for more, so we found more.
Get ready for the next iteration of the most painful things a human can experience. This is our fifth video in the compilation, and we dove into the deepest depths of pain to top our previous four videos. Now sit back, get ready, and try to relax as we tell you even more painful things a human can experience. The first thing on our list is for the ladies out there. It's a condition called endometriosis, and it's been said to be just as painful if not more painful than childbirth. This is probably because endometriosis has to do with the same organs as childbirth. The condition occurs when the tissue that is similar to the uterine lining grows outside of the female reproductive organs. You can think of it like new tissue being grown close to but not exactly where it's supposed to be. This can cause all kinds of problems and is almost always accompanied by excruciating pain. The rogue pelvic tissue starts to affect the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the uterus itself, causing massive discomfort. When the pelvic tissue begins growing in the wrong places, it can cause cysts and scar tissue to form. But the real discomfort occurs at adhesions. Adhesions are scar tissues that bind two or more organs together that are not supposed to be connected. It's kind of like staples made out of scar tissue. If the adhesion is pulled apart in the wrong way, the scar tissue is torn, or in this analogy, the staples are ripped out of your organs. The pain and discomfort resulting from endometriosis can intensify during the menstrual period. So if cramps and shooting pains weren't enough for this time of the month, endometriosis makes everything more painful. Also, sex can cause women who have endometriosis extreme pain as the penis causes irritation to the pelvic skin forming outside the reproductive organs. In order to combat endometriosis, a doctor can provide pain medication and hormone therapies, but oftentimes the pain is too intense and the tissue needs to be surgically removed. If you're a male, you're probably relieved to know that you don't need to worry about this intense pain caused by endometriosis. However, if you are a male, you definitely should worry about this next pain. This next painful experience can affect men and women, but it's much more excruciating in men. Pudendal neuralgia is a severe pain around the gluteus maximus, or in more common terms, a pain in the ass. This can happen from a bad fall or from high impact trauma. The reason pudendal neuralgia is so painful in men is because it also affects the penis. Pudendal neuralgia can cause intense pain in both the penis and the scrotum. In fact, a report in the Journal of the Canadian Chiropractic Association described pudendal neuralgia as an insidious constant penis pain. That's not something you want to hear about, a medical condition that happens in the genitalia. The pudendal nerve runs from the back of the pelvis and travels just past the base of the penis or vagina, eventually branching off into other nerves. It sends signals from the brain to the genitalia, sphincter, and other muscles in the area. When this nerve is damaged, it can cause pain signals to radiate throughout the region. As mentioned before, this pain can be constant. If you've ever tweaked a nerve and been in immense pain until you massage it out, you can imagine how terrible that would feel in the lower back, pelvic, and genitalia regions of the body, especially if it was never-ending. For someone who has pudendal neuralgia, they might feel a sharp burning in the perineum, which is the area between the genitals and the anus. For males, it might feel like pins and needles being stuck into your penis and scrotum. All of these sensations could be exacerbated by sitting down, so you could become physically exhausted as you try to remain standing to mitigate the pain. It also goes without saying that a male suffering from pudendal neuralgia would feel pain during sex, or even when he gets an erection, so make sure to remain calm and turned off if you're ever diagnosed with pudendal neuralgia. The final medical condition we'll look at makes the first two seem like a walk in the park. This next painful experience is enough to drive you to the point of insanity. Fibromyalgia is a chronic condition that can literally cause pain in every muscle and bone of the body. The disease itself intensifies pain signals being sent throughout the nervous system, so it's almost like a feedback loop of pain. The pain of fibromyalgia is so terrible and constant that it normally keeps people with the disease from sleeping, which leads to fatigue as well. It's important to note that the discomfort associated with fibromyalgia isn't just one location or for a short period of time. This is a pain that's constant and everywhere. We've all probably experienced some pretty painful things like stepping on a Lego or getting stung by a bee. Now imagine that pain constantly running throughout your body, and that's what it's like to have fibromyalgia. The pain itself might not be as intense as some others, but the consistency and distribution is enough to drive anyone crazy. When you think of animals that can cause pain, you're probably not thinking about this next one. Fun fact, it's one of the only two types of mammals that lays eggs. The platypus inhabits the continent of Australia. And although there are a lot of different animals that can cause you massive amounts of pain there, you probably wouldn't think the funny-looking platypus would be one of them. Male platypus have an ankle spur on their hind legs, which contains a toxic venom. The barb and venom combination can cause a massive amount of discomfort. Researchers who have been unlucky enough to be stung by a platypus 
claimed the pain is excruciating and causes bad swelling in the affected area. To be fair, platypus don't normally sting humans unless they're provoked or being harmed in some way. In fact, the spur and venom is actually used when fighting other males for the right to mate. The idea is if the platypus can stab its rival, they'll be incapacitated. When the rival platypus is injected with venom during a fight, it'll be unable to move and the first male will be able to breed peacefully with the female platypus. The venom eventually wears off and the stung platypus recovers. However, if a human is stung by the spur of a platypus, things can go a little differently. First things first, the most painful time to be stung by a platypus is during mating season because this is when the platypus produces the most venom. If you find yourself in Australia during platypus mating season, stay as far away from them as possible. But what does it feel like to be stung by a platypus? In a word, painful. There have been no recorded human fatalities from platypus stings, however, after being stung by the animal, you may wish you're dead. One of the worst parts is that the spurs on platypus are not meant to come out easily. This means if you're stung, the barb will stay inside you, injecting painful venom into your body until it's manually removed. If the initial sting wasn't enough, you will probably take a good sized chunk of skin and muscle off when yanking the spur out of your body. In reality, researchers say you probably wouldn't be able to remove the spur yourself though. You'd be too distracted by the immediate, sustained, and devastating pain of the platypus venom. Doctors in Australia would need to administer local anesthesia to make the pain subside, since not even morphine is powerful enough to stop the pain of a platypus sting. And if you're as unlucky as one 57-year-old victim, the area that was stung could stay hypersensitive to pain for three months after the initial encounter. Needless to say, being stung by a platypus would be one of the most painful and unpleasant experiences anyone could go through. Sticking with the stinging theme, this next insect has the most painful sting second only to the bullet ant. Unfortunately, it's found on every continent in the world except for Europe and Antarctica. Being stung by a wasp hurts. There is no wasp sting more painful than that of the tarantula hawk wasp. Even the name of the creature sounds painful and scary. These wasps are huge. The name itself comes from their favorite activity of hunting tarantulas, so you know that they're going to need to be pretty big and pack a deadly sting. The large stinger combined with the venom the tarantula hawk wasp creates is the perfect one-two punch of pain. If you were ever stung by a tarantula hawk wasp, you would instantly regret it. The stinger would cause an initial prick of pain, then as the venom was injected into your bloodstream, the real agony begins. One researcher who was stung by the tarantula hawk wasp recounted the experience as being immediate, excruciating, unrelenting pain that simply shuts down one's ability to do anything except scream. The pain lasts for about 5 minutes, but it would be the most painful 5 minutes of your life. And if the pain associated with the sting wasn't bad enough, tarantula hawk wasps lay their eggs inside of tarantulas after they kill them. So if you were an incredibly unlucky human, you may be the surrogate mother for dozens of tiny tarantula hawk wasp babies. This has never happened before, but it definitely is the stuff of nightmares. Our final and hottest, most painful experience comes from eating. You may enjoy spicy things, but this next pepper is so hot, it can cause massive amounts of pain when consumed. One of the most painful things a human can experience is eating a Carolina Reaper pepper. It's the hottest chili pepper on the planet, and it can cause some serious damage. The Carolina Reaper is a cross between a ghost chili and a habanero. The way spice is measured in terms of peppers is using the Scoville heat unit. On this scale, a jalapeno has a Scoville rating of 5,000, a habanero has a rating of 200,000, a ghost chili rates at around 1 million, and the Carolina Reaper has a rating of 2,200,000 SHUs. So if you think a habanero pepper is hot, the Carolina Reaper is 11 times more spicy. People who have eaten the Carolina Reaper have experienced excruciating pain. From the first bite, the heat pain receptors of the mouth go crazy. The body reacts as if it were under attack by dumping chemicals into the bloodstream to increase blood flow and cause inflammation to protect itself. As the juices go down your throat, it feels like your esophagus is on fire. The pain is so intense that your body temperature starts increasing. The burning sensation follows the path the pepper takes through the body. And when we say the pain follows the pepper, we mean all the way through your body. Many people end up vomiting after eating the Carolina Reaper. This is normally an involuntary reaction caused by the brain trying to rid the body of whatever harmful substance is causing it so much pain. However, if the pepper is not ejected this way and it makes it all the way through your digestive system, it will burn once it comes out the back end. The extreme burn associated with the Carolina Reaper will literally run through your body like a wildfire. The pain of having a burning digestive tract is one we recommend you stay clear of. Everyone is different, and the ability to tolerate pain varies from person to person. However, on average, the experiences on this list would cause anyone extreme discomfort and agony. 
We here at the Infographics Show routinely cover the most pressing scientific questions of our age, such as what would happen if everyone on Earth screamed at the same time, or what if everyone went blind for 10 seconds. Occasionally, we like to get silly and talk about Link's love life in The Legend of Zelda, or taunt our favorite guinea pig by assigning him the most ridiculous challenges. But that's what makes our channel so fun. And while our teams of world-class researchers, historians, and philosophers are often busy finding new interesting topics to explore, we absolutely love Love answering questions directly from you, our viewers. Today, we're going to be answering a question asked by Khalil, who emailed us asking about the most painful illness known to men, trigeminal neuralgia. So, let's get to it. The trigeminal nerve is the fifth cranial nerve, and it's the largest. This nerve is responsible for transmitting sensory data from the face to the brain. The cause of trigeminal neuralgia is mostly unknown, but many doctors believe it has to do with compression to the trigeminal nerve, causing chronic, excruciating pain in the face. There are three branches of the nerve where the pain tends to be located. The ophthalmic, located in the forehead, the maxillary in the cheek, and the mandibular, which is located in the lower jaw. Pain typically starts in the ear and makes its way to the jaw later. The pain can last anywhere from minutes to hours and sometimes even days. It can make simple, mundane tasks like brushing your teeth, shaving, or putting on makeup extremely unbearable. You can't even smile or chew food without triggering the distress. Sometimes even talking is impossible. The average age of diagnosis is between 50 and 80 years old, with the majority of sufferers being women, though there are many patients diagnosed with this condition who do not fit into this category. One woman named Keisha Bush was only 25 years old when she was diagnosed. She has been interviewed in documentaries explaining how she cannot work or take care of her child because of the intense pain. Symptoms of the disorder tend to be very specific, often described as a sudden onset of severe pain. Now, when we say severe or excruciating as it relates to this condition, we are not just putting this lightly. We are referring to the type of pain that can have you completely incapacitated. People who have gone through trigeminal neuralgia explain it as a sharp, stabbing, shooting, almost indescribable type of pure agony. Imagine the sensation of having needles or even knives driven into your skull. Ouch! This pain tends to be electrifying and usually occurs on predominantly one side of the face, consistent with the area of the fifth trigeminal nerve. Diagnoses of trigeminal neuralgia can be very easy if you know what you're looking for, and it's usually based on the history of the patient, which is sufficient enough to determine this condition as the problem. Unlike many other ailments, this condition doesn't typically require the use of elaborate tests to figure out its diagnosis. In a perfect world, the patient simply points to the part of the face that's been causing them the distress, and the doctor can simply simply tell by examining which area it's coming from and attribute it to the fifth nerve. However, this condition is very often misdiagnosed as dental pain, TMJ disorder, or a couple of other similar disorders with the abbreviation SUNKT and SUNA, which tend to involve edema of the eye, lacrimation, and nasal congestion. Misdiagnosis usually occurs because the condition is extremely rare, with an incident rate of about 12 cases per 100,000. For this reason, many doctors may not even be aware of the illness. So, then how is a condition treated when the proper diagnosis for it is made? Doctors typically refer to the use of an anticonvulsant, a medication normally given to people who have seizures. Specifically, the medication known as carbamazepine is the preferred drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia. If that doesn't work, doctors may try phenytoin or gabapentin. Because we know you're well versed in the complex names of pharmaceutical medications, and you can probably pronounce them better than we can, you likely know exactly what they are. Another treatment method relates to neurosurgery, which can either be non-destructive or destructive depending on the severity. Non-destructive methods include microvascular decompression, a fancy term to describe a procedure where the nerve is separated from the surrounding arteries or vessels that may be causing compression. The destructive surgical method, which is sometimes necessary, refers to causing purposeful damage to the trigeminal nerve so that it can no longer transmit pain signals. The loss of pain signals may sound nice, but it also involves certain consequences, such as loss of other sensations. For instance, you may no longer be able to feel the gentle hand of a loved one affectionately stroking your cheek. Before surgery is utilized, the patient must have exhausted all other options and forms of treatment. Usually, an MRI of the brain must first be used as well as having a consultation with a neurosurgeon. As you can probably tell, it's an extensive process, which can greatly rack up your medical bill. Hopefully, you have some good insurance. This disease doesn't always have a simple fix, however, and it's often nicknamed the suicide disease for good reason. 
As mentioned at the beginning of this video, it is the most painful condition a human can experience outside of being externally tortured. It can drive many sufferers to take their own lives just to escape the enormity of the awful feeling. But it may not be just the pain that can push people to consider suicide. There may also be certain social implications. For those who don't have trigeminal neuralgia, it may be difficult to understand why it's such an ordeal. Pain in the face? Big deal, I go through that every time I get a root canal or get punched in the face at my local bar. Facial pain may not seem as bad as other more visible problems, so others may not be able to relate or comprehend why someone can't function normally or go to work just because of this kind of discomfort. As a result, many sufferers may be susceptible to ridicule. People around them might say, oh, you're just using this as an excuse to not work, so you can lay around and do nothing all day. We here at the Infographics Show would like to remind everyone that you never know what someone might be struggling with unless you've gone through it yourself, so it's best to resist jumping to judgment if you can. Still, many people may be critical of other circumstances, which can lead to the negative connotation of being labeled as lazy if you don't work, even if you have a valid reason for it. So not only are sufferers of trigeminal neuralgia undergoing severe pain, but they may also feel hopeless and useless with their situation, along with the additional effects of the negative social stigma surrounding them. If you know anyone with this condition, be kind. Perhaps understanding the extent of their pain will help you become more sympathetic of what they're going through. Warning, this episode includes audio recordings of sounds you may find extremely uncomfortable. Continue watching at your own risk. Sound can hurt, not just emotionally but also physically. The sound of a specific commercial jingle can create a memory which is painful to contemplate, while the sound of an acoustic weapon will bring you excruciating physical pain. Some of these effects have to do with the mind-body connection, but the sounds we're looking at today are all about physical hurt, so get ready for some of the most painful sounds you'll ever hear. Nails on chalkboard Probably one of the most widely recognized and awful sounds in the world is that of nails on a chalkboard. This is almost universally one of the most uncomfortable sounds in the world. Though research has shown that if you're not already inclined to find the sound painful or uncomfortable, then it likely won't be. This shows that pain can sometimes be subjective when there's no physical effect directly on our bodies. However, for most people, nails on a chalkboard is a terribly uncomfortable sound. Researchers aren't exactly sure why this sound is so painful to people, though suspect it has to do with its very high frequency. Our ears are naturally created to amplify frequencies around the 2000 to 4000 Hz range, the same range a baby's shrill cry falls in. This is likely an evolutionary adaptation as children shrieking typically do so for very good reasons. As we are programmed to reproduce and procreate our numbers, ensuring the safety and survival of our offspring is hardwired into even our physiology. Unluckily for modern students, nails on a chalkboard falls right into this extra sensitive range of hearing. Though this discomfort is typically accompanied by concern for physical harm to one's nails as well, one can't help but think of their own nails scratching on a blackboard and being torn loose and the accompanying pain. Thus, this specific sound might be triggering not just physical discomfort, but a prediction of pain, adding to the unbearable nature of it. Our next sound is basically nails on a chalkboard cranked up to 11. Fork on a plate If you thought nails on a blackboard was rough, then this next one is really going to set your teeth on edge. Who hasn't accidentally scratched their porcelain plate with a fork only to instantly wince at the horrible sound of a fork scratching the plate? Well, the reason for this extreme discomfort is once again tied to the frequency range of the sound. Just like with nails on a blackboard, this frequency falls into a range the ear canal naturally amplifies, making it even worse to listen to. The next entry is a lurking danger, waiting for you the moment you open your long-awaited Amazon order. Styrofoam rubbing together. We call this next sound the third member of the sound annoyance axis of evil, and it is truly unbearable to listen to for long. The reasons why are unsurprisingly once more related to the frequencies of the sound, and if you can withstand a 10 hour challenge of this sound, then you clearly either have hearing damage or are a sadist. This next sound is typically caused by very annoying kids with a sadist streak. Metal ruler on a glass bottle. Yet another sound sure to set your teeth on edge, the sound of a metal ruler running along a bottle can be painful to some.
Unlike fingernails on a chalkboard, or the sound of styrofoam being rubbed together though, a metal ruler running along a glass bottle isn't quite as universally annoying or painful. This is likely because it doesn't quite emit the same high frequencies as those two previous sounds. Our next dinnertime sound though can set your teeth on edge just hearing us describe it. Fork on glass. Back to dining implements, this time though it's a fork on glass. Emitting the same high frequencies as a fork on a dinner plate, this sound is all but unbearable to most people. Though luckily, you're a lot less likely to encounter it during dinner than you are in accidentally scraping your plate. Unless for some reason you're eating your drink with a fork, in which case you have an entirely different set of problems to worry about. Now it's time for some sounds so loud they can feel like a punch in the stomach. Train horn. Alright, it's time to take things up a notch, or a lot of notches really. Train horns are notoriously loud, clocking in at a legally set limit of 110 decibels. That's actually 10 decibels lower than the average rock and roll concert. But it's the specific high frequencies that are part of the train horn which make this a very painful sound. Another factor adding to the psychological discomfort of a train horn is its discordant nature. When you listen carefully, you can identify that there's not just one tone, but multiple jangled together to create a very uncomfortable mix of painful sounds. And that's on purpose, as train horns are meant to warn people to get out of the way of the proverbial immovable object bearing down on them. The discordant sounds help get people's attention and elicit a small amount of healthy fear. Our next sound can get the adrenaline pumping, but if you're standing too close to the source, you won't be hearing anything for long. Stock car sounds. There's an undeniable draw to the sound of a beefy muscle car revving up that sends shivers of joy down the spine of any race aficionado. But if you're one of the people that has to work next to a superpowered stock car every day without the benefit of hearing protection, you're going to be blasted by yet another of the most painful sounds in the world. From the comfort of your home with your electronic speakers, you aren't getting the full experience of this mighty sound. That would require you to be part of a pit crew so you can experience the massive 130 plus decibel level of a stock car firsthand. Well past the point of hearing damage, prolonged exposure to this volume will be very detrimental to your health. Although the sound of stock cars flying by is a pretty neat sound, and to us it sounds like laser beams being fired. <laughs> A soldier's life can be rough, but on the battlefield just firing his or her weapon can cause permanent hearing loss. Gunfire Movies do a really bad job of portraying just how loud guns really are. Clocking in at 140 decibels, a gun battle is one of the loudest, most chaotic experiences any human can ever experience. Once more, your speakers simply aren't conveying the raw power of 140 decibel gunshots, which are so deafening that hearing protection is mandatory on military shooting ranges for the long-term health of shooters. Consider that modern assault rifles are semi-automatic and typically accompanied by fully automatic squad weapons, and you have a recipe for permanent hearing damage, something Hollywood does a really bad job of showing. Yet another Hollywood myth pretending that anything less than a screamed conversation is possible in the midst of a modern gun battle. Now we switch things up from high frequency or loud sounds to the opposite end of the scale for some startling results. Infrasound A lot of the sounds we covered today are very high frequencies or just stupidly loud. Infrasound, however, is very low frequency sound and its effects on humans is startling. For most people, you likely barely heard anything at all, and that's what you would expect from a sound with such low frequency. However, the other problem is that most consumer speakers simply aren't capable of playing infrasound. However, if you're one of the lucky few who have music studio quality speakers, then you probably felt a sense of dread and discomfort after listening to the sound for a while. Though inconclusive, some research has found that exposures to 6 to 15 Hz can severely impact sleep quality. 
and should be of concern for people with faulty heating or air conditioning equipment, as misaligned fans can produce this frequency range. Infrasound between 5 and 10 Hz might cause feelings of fatigue, apathy, depression, loss of concentration, drowsiness, and even vibration of the internal organs. It might even directly affect the nervous, cardiovascular, and respiratory systems. In our increasingly mechanized world, concerns over infrasound's health effects are becoming greater and greater. Though the research is relatively new, it's believed that many common woes of mental and even some physical health may be directly related to long-term infrasound exposure from vehicles or machinery. Coincidentally, most large predatory animals have roars that dip well into the infrasound range, and it's not uncommon for people to be exposed to lion, cougar, and other big cat roars to report immediate feelings of fear and even physical discomfort. Our next sound might have been used to attack American diplomats in Cuba. Acoustic weapons Man has weaponized everything from hunting tools to birds, so it was inevitable that sound too would become a thing to kill each other with. Today, acoustic weapons are mostly used defensively, such as the use of acoustic weapons during various protests in the US in 2019. However, in 2016, acoustic weapons may have been used against US personnel for the first time. Workers at the recently reopened embassy in Cuba began reporting strange symptoms. A high-frequency noise they could barely hear seemed to be present in their homes and in the embassy itself. One worker said that the noise could only be blocked out by closing all doors and windows and turning the TV on high. Eventually, physical and mental symptoms began to develop amongst the embassy staff, ranging from headaches to depression and extreme fatigue. Believing the embassy was under attack, most of the staff was pulled out as the Department of Defense and the FBI began to investigate. The sound was recorded several times, with one of those recordings leaked to the press. Initially, it was believed that an acoustic weapon was to blame, but as the investigation wore on, it was thought that a specific type of cricket, plentiful in Cuba, may actually be the culprit. This cricket can emit frequencies that are outside the normal range of human hearing and may have adverse health effects after long-term exposure. However, acoustic weapons are definitely a thing and already deployed by police forces and anti-piracy patrols on the high seas. These weapons elicit a great deal of pain and discomfort and can even lead to permanent hearing loss. Now go watch Most Painful Things a Human Can Experience number 3 or click this other video instead.